Hello and welcome to this video, section 1.1, Getting Started. In this section, we're going to learn the vocabulary of statistics, the basic vocabulary at least. We're going to distinguish between a population and a sample, and we're going to distinguish between the two types of populations, the target population and the sampled population. So let's begin. The goal of the branch of mathematics, and these are the words from Hawks, the goal of the branch of mathematics called statistics is to provide information so that informed decisions can be made. I disagree 100% with this statement. Statistics is not a branch of mathematics. Sure, we use numbers, we use formulas, but then so does chemistry and physics, and they're not mathematics. Statistics is a science. It proceeds forward based on inductive reasoning tries to learn about the larger whole based on your smaller sample. Mathematics, on the other hand, draws from the larger to bring down to the narrower. Deductive reasoning. So statistics is actually a branch of science. The goal of this text is to enable you to filter through the statistics you encounter so that you may be better prepared for the decisions that you make in daily life. As befitting most things in statistics, the word itself has a couple definitions. The first definition is that statistics is the science of gathering, describing, and analyzing data. So it's the science of gathering, describing, and analyzing data. Hawks admits that it's a science. We can also use the term statistics as the actual numerical descriptions of sample data. In other words, statistics are a function of your data, a mathematical function of your data. Target population is a particular group of interest. A sampled population is a group from which the sample is taken. Hopefully those two populations are the same. They don't have to be. If I would like to draw a conclusion about the population of Galesburg, that's my target population. If I contact people based on the numbers in the phone book. The people in the phone book are the sampled population. Target population and sampled population in that case are not the same. Hopefully, however, the sampled population is representative of the target population. A sampling frame is a physical list of all members of the sampled population. This may or may not actually exist. In the example I just gave, the phone book will be the sampling frame. A sample is a subset of the population from which data are collected. A subset of the target population, no, not from the target population, from the sampled population from which the data are collected. It's this sample that we're actually going to apply our statistics to so that we can learn about the target population. Now, hopefully, our sample is representative of the target population. If the sample is not representative of the target population, all the work that we're going to do is worth nothing. The sample must be representative. And we're going to see some ways of obtaining what are called, quote, representative samples in the future. A census is a study from which the data are obtained from every member of the population every member of the population. The United States is required to hold a census every 10 years. That is not the type of census that we're talking about because the US Census Bureau is not able to contact every single resident of the United States. It tries, it does a good job of it, but it never actually achieves their goal of a genuine census. So now, Let's turn to an intra-lecture question. These questions uh, are, you'll have to answer these questions in Moodle for section 1.1. It's just to check that you are moving forward through these at a, at a good pace. So the first intra-lecture question for this section, what is the difference between a population and a sample? What is the difference between a population in a sample. Remember you can pause this. You've got that little double bar thing that you can push on, pause it so you can do the answers in Moodle right now. 
I recommend that you actually write the question and the answer in your notes on the left hand side. But regardless, you can pause and I can go back to the lecture. A variable is a value, like 4, or a characteristic, like blue, that changes among members of the target population. It's got to change among members of that population, because if it is constant among the, all members, that is, if all members of the population have the same value, such as blue, there's really nothing to study. It's just blue. Data are the counts, measurements, or observations gathered about a specific variable in a population in order to study it. So data is what you actually mark down from your sample. Do not confuse a parameter with a sample statistic. A parameter is a numerical description of a population characteristic, whereas a sample statistic is a description of a sample characteristic. So parameters are about the population, Statistics are about the sample. P for population, P for parameter, S for sample, S for statistic. We want our sample statistics to be good estimates of the population parameters. And that goal will actually dictate some of the formulas that we'll see in the future. Here's our second question. What is the difference between a parameter and a statistic? Remember, these go into your Moodle quiz. But again, I recommend on the left-hand side of your notes, write out the question and the answer, and then later put it into Moodle. And again, remember, you can pause if I go too fast. It is essential that you are mindful of the relationship between a population and a sample. The next figure is a picture to help you visualize this relationship. So that big blue oval is the target population. That is the group we want to draw conclusions about. The yellow oval is the sampled population. Notice the sampled population does not have to be a subset of the target population. It hopefully is. In fact, it hopefully is the target population itself, but it doesn't have to be. But note that the sample does have to be a subset of the sampled population. Sample doesn't have to be a subset of the target population. Again, we hope it does. In fact, we hope that the sample is representative of the target population. But from the way that the data are collected, it's not required. Strongly suggested hoped for, that's the goal, but it doesn't have to be. So let's summarize the differences between a population and a sample. Population is about the whole group. It's a group we want to know about. Characteristics of a population are called parameters. These parameters in reality are unknown. We're trying to estimate those parameters. Those parameters are fixed. They are about the entire population. Contrast that with the sample, where the sample is part of the group. It's a group we know everything about because we've got it right in front of us. We can measure anything we want in that group. There is no mysteries whatsoever. Characteristics of the sample are called statistics. Those statistics are always known because we can just measure it on this sample that we have in front of us. And the statistics change with the sample. A little bit ahead of the place on that. Example 1 1. Identifying population and sample. So please identify the population and the sample. I will read through it. Both A and B. I will expect you to hit pause and then I'll give you the answers. Uh, we've got to identify the population and the sample. So in this survey, 359 college students at the University of Jackson were asked if they had tried the October flavor of the month at the campus coffee shop. 83 of the students surveyed said yes. I'm going to now give the answer to that. Go ahead and hit pause. 
the population is going to be the University of Jackson students or the college students at the University of Jackson because that's the group we're trying to draw a conclusion about. The sample is going to be those 359 college students we actually contacted. A survey B, a survey of 1125 households in the United States found that 24% subscribe to satellite radio. Identify the population and the sample. Hit pause. The population is going to be all households in the United States. All. And the sample is going to be that 1125 that we actually contacted. Those are the solutions. Move on to example 1.2. Identifying the population, the sample, the parameters, the statistics, etc. For each of the following reports, identify the population, the target population in each of these cases, the sample, and whether or not the highlight value is a parameter or a statistic. So population, sample, and whether it's a parameter or a statistics. Statistic. So here we go. Numero one. After an airline security scare on Christmas Day 2009, the Gallup organization interviewed 542 American air travelers about the increased security measures at airports. The report stated that 78%, that must be the highlighted part, of American air travelers are in favor of the United States airports using full body scan imaging on airline passengers. Population, the target population, the sample, and what does that pink purple, whatever color it is, highlighted number actually indicate. Go ahead and hit pause. The population here is all Americans because we are try all American air travelers, if you wish, because we're trying to draw conclusions about American air travelers in the United States. Two, what is the sample? It's those 542 people, American air travelers, that the Gallup organization contacted. And this 78% is going to be the statistic because it was measured off of that sample. Two, Rasmussen Reports also conducted a survey in response to the airport security scare on Christmas Day 2009. The National Telephone Survey of 1,000 adult Americans found that 59% of Americans surveyed favor racial profiling as a means of determining which passengers to search at airport security checkpoints. Remember, target population sample and what does that 59 percent represent go ahead and hit pause the population is going to be all americans because we're trying to draw conclusions about the americans two the sample is going to be those 1000 adult americans contacted and that 59 percent again is going to be a sample statistic it's 59 percent of those 1000 people Two branches of statistics. The branch of statistics called descriptive statistics is a science that gathers, sorts, summarizes, displays the data. It doesn't try to draw conclusions about the data, it just tries to better understand the data itself. And the first four, five, six, seven chapters of this book are going to cover descriptive statistics. Inferential statistics, as a science, involves using these descriptive statistics to estimate population parameters. And that'll be the last half of the course. So inferential statistics takes our sample and tries to draw conclusions about the population. Descriptive statistics, on the hand, just takes our sample and learns about our sample. Which brings us to our next question. What is the difference between descriptive and inferential statistics? Remember, you can hit pause. There are two types of analyses. One is called exploratory and one is called confirmatory. Exploratory analysis uses data to estimate parameters. This will be akin to the confidence intervals in the second half of the course. Confirmatory analysis uses statistics to test stated claims about reality. And these stated claims about reality we're going to call hypotheses. And this will relate to the hypothesis testing or the p-values of the second half of the course. 
So example 1.3, identifying descriptive and inferential statistics in a news report on the state of the media by Tom Rosenthal and Amy Mitchell, they write the following. AOL had 900 journalists, 500 of them at its local patch news operation. By the end of 2011, Bloomberg expects to have 150 journalists and analysts for its new Washington operation, Bloomberg government. So let's identify the descriptive and the infer inferential statistics used in this excerpt. Again, remember, hit the pause to answer that, and then just go ahead and listen to me talk, and talk, and talk, and talk. Uh, descriptive. So the first descriptive is AOL had 900 journalists, so we're describing how many journalists AOL had, and we're describing 500 of them at its local news operation. So those are descriptive. The future, by the end of 2011, Bloomberg expects to have, so expects to have tells us this is a future event, it's going to expect to have 150 journalists, so that will be the inferential statistic. So descriptive is about data that we have, inferential is about the population, which also translates into things that are happening in the future. Oops, we got that solution, and that's the end of the slideshow. And that's the end of section 1.1. One, one. So expect these videos to look very similar to this. The slideshow, me talking over it, giving you questions, me adding to the slideshows, maybe telling you a joke or two. Didn't tell any jokes today, I'm sorry. But expect them in the future. So I hope this was helpful. If not, as always, please make sure you email me with any questions. Or leave the questions in Moodle's discussion forum for questions for chapter uh, for learning module one. That's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hello and welcome to section 1.2 data classifications. In this section we're going to be looking at how to classify data. That is how to determine what types of variable it is. It can be either classified as qualitative or quantitative. Qualitative is also called categorical. Quantitative is called numeric. It can be classified as discrete, continuous, or neither, I guess. The book loves to talk about the neither. We're going to look at discrete or continuous. And it also has nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. So, so by the end of this slideshow, you should be able to know what all of those terms mean, and you should be able to classify a variable or data as in each of those three ways. So let's begin. Qualitative data, also known as categorical data, consists of labels or descriptions of traits. So qualitative variable example would be eye color, um, hair color, um, favorite music, things like that, where you, you can, if you want, put a number to it, but it's not a meaningful number. Say my eye color is one, doesn't tell you what my eye color is. Say my eye color is blue, does tell you. Those are qualitative, those are categorical data. Quantitative, on the other hand, also known as numeric, actually does have a number that does make fundamental sense to it. It's usually counts, measurements. I object to the book using the term measurement because counts are also measurements in their own way. Examples of quantitative data would be height, weight, age, gas mileage. We're talking about cars now. Those would be quantitative because there are numbers associated with them and those numbers are inherently meaningful. So here's a graphic. We got the qualitative side, we've got the quantitative side. Again, qualitative is categorical, quantitative is numeric. Qualitative data are descriptions and labels, whereas quantitative tends to be counts and measurements or measurements in general. Yeah. So here's an example. Um, Classifying data as qualitative or quantitative. Classify the following data as either qualitative or quantitative. What are you assuming about the described variables? So A, shades of red paint in a home improvement store. Is that qualitative or quantitative? Hit pause. That is qualitative, probably. It depends on how you're actually measuring the uh, shades of red paint. Um, if you're doing it in terms of the names, such as Fire Engine Red, Apple Red, Baby Red, I don't know what color is red, paint are, I just see red, then those would be 
uh, qualitative. But if you're doing it in terms of the percent of the paint that is red, that is, or how many squirts of red dye you have to put in the paint to get that, then it would be quantitative, because it's the number of squirts of red in the paint. Interesting. So the answer depends on what you're trying to actually measure. Hmm. B. Rankings of the most popular paint colors for the season. Again, think about whether this is qualitative or quantitative and what you're assuming. And go ahead and hit pause. The rankings are counts. There's numbers one through however many paint colors there are. So this is going to be quantitative. I don't think that there's much you're assuming about it unless you're thinking, hey, what if we're talking about rankings in terms of loved versus hated? Well, in that case, that's qualitative. But if you're looking at maybe number of stars, that would be quali uh, quantitative. If you're looking at number of people who purchased it, that would be quantitative. Again, it's how are you actually measuring this ranking? Huh. So these questions actually are kind of difficult. C. Amount of red primary dye necessary to make one gallon of each shade of red paint. Qualitative or quantitative, hit pause. This is quantitative because it's an amount of. I don't think I can think of any way of, of interpreting this to make it a qualitative because it's very clearly an, an amount of red primary dye. Okay, so that, that's going to be quantitative. Uh, D, number of paint choices available at several stores. Again, qualitative or quantitative, hit pause. You're right, I hope. That's quantitative because you're looking at the words number of paint choices. Um, I suppose you could make this qualitative by saying um, a lot of paint choices, not so many paint choices, almost no paint choices. That would be a qualitative way of measuring this, but it's pretty explicit with the numbers of, so that would be quantitative. Hmm. Okay, eh, that's not what I wanted to switch over to. That's what I wanted to switch over to. Intra lecture question number one. Again, this goes in your Moodle quiz. Is the variable number of toes a qualitative or a quantitative variable? And again, I recommend you write the question in your notes on the left-hand side, your answer below it, so that you can go to Moodle after this lecture and put the answers in. Is the variable number of toes a qualitative or a quantitative numeric variable? And back to the lecture. Now we're looking at continuous versus discrete data. Discrete data are quantitative data that can take on only particular values. And those values are usually counts, but they don't have to be counts. They could be ratios of two counts. I mean, hey, that would also give you discrete data. Continuous data are quantitative data that can, be taken, that can take on any value in a given interval and are usually called measurements. Again, I personally don't like the term measurement because any measurement for a statistician is something that you measure. So eye color would be a measurement for me because I have to measure eye color. But the way that the book wants to frame this, measurements would be things that you have on a scale, like a ruler scale. Continuous versus discrete. So discrete are counts or ratios of counts. Uh, continuous data is, is, takes on any value in a given interval. So again, we've got the qualitative and the quantitative ovals. Quantitative can be broken down to discrete, which is usually counts or ratios of counts, and then continuous, which are usually measurements. Notice discrete and continuous don't speak at all towards qualitative because qualitative data is neither discrete nor continuous. Here's another example to determine whether the following data are continuous or discrete. Temperatures in Fahrenheit of cities in South Carolina. Is this continuous or discrete? Hit the pause button now. Welcome back. Assuming you hit the pause button now, uh, temperatures in Fahrenheit are going to be continuous. Um, 
What's reported on TV will be discrete, but the actual temperatures will be continuous. B, number of houses in various neighborhoods in a city, continuous or discrete. Hit pause now. Welcome back. Numbers of houses tells me it's going to be discrete. The key word there is numbers. You're counting how many houses are in a various neighborhood. C, numbers of elliptical machines in every YMCA in your state. Numbers of elliptical machines in every YMCA in your state. Uh, is that continuous or discrete? Hit the pause button. You're absolutely correct. That also is discrete. It's got the word numbers of. D, heights of doors, continuous or discrete. Oh, hit the pause button. Welcome back. Whatever I'm supposed to say, that's continuous. Heights are continuous. In the words of the book, it's a measurement. Realize that the actual height of the door is going to be continuous. The variable called heights of doors is continuous. What you actually write down as the height of the door is going to be discrete. Because eventually you're going to have to stop writing down digits. And that gets back to something interesting, the difference between the variable and the data. The variable is what you're measuring. The data is essentially what you're writing down for those measurements. The variables are what you're measuring, such as temperature, such as height, such as age. And the data is what you're actually writing down, such as 97.8 degrees, such as six foot five, such as, I, I forget what the other example was, but those are things that are written down. Variables can be discrete or continuous. What you write down has to be discrete because you have to stop writing at some point. Which brings us to the next intra election question. Is the variable grade point average discrete or continuous? Again, I recommend you write the question over on the left side of your notes. Write down your answer right after it. Think about it. Go back over the last five, ten minutes of this lecture so that you're absolutely certain what the difference between continuous and discrete is. Hit pause. Fast forward. Rewind as you need. You've got total control over this lecture except for what I say. I mean, you could even slow this down. So I sound like this. Or speed it up. Sorry, I don't sound like this. Levels of measurement. Four levels of measurement. Nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. If you learned French, you can think of this in terms of N-O-I-R, black. N-O-I-R, nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. That may help you remember the four levels. Um, the level of measurement of a variable describes the amount of information that that variable contains. The four levels are nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Nominal, the values are just descriptions. Ordinal, which is short for ordered nominal, you've got the description plus you've got an inherent ordering to it. Interval level, the differences between levels are identical, so you can subtract. And ratio level, not only do you have differences between two levels being the same, but you've also got the value of zero, meaning an absence of. So data at the nominal level of measurement are qualitative, consisting of labels or names. So the variable eye color will be nominal level, because what are the eye colors? Blue, brown, green, hazel, and I'm sure I'm missing some colors. Blue, brown, green, hazel. Yeah, I could also order them as brown, blue, green, hazel. It would mean the same thing. They're just names attached. So it's nominal. The word nominal comes from the Latin nominus, meaning name. Suppose all students in a stats class were asked what pizza topping is their favorite. Explain why these data are at the nominal level of measurement. Piece of cake. Favorite Favorite pizza topping is, I don't know, pineapple, pepperoni, sausage, olives. I can't think of any more because I only use pepperoni and pineapple. 
those are just names. I mean, it doesn't matter that they're the individual person's favorite. I'm asking everybody for one pizza topping. I can call it pineapple. I can call it pineapple apple pine. It means the same thing. B. Suppose instead that you wish to know that the number of students whose favorite pizza topping is sausage, the number of students, explain why this data value is not nominal. Well, it's the number of, so you're measuring the number of students, counting the number of students. Nominal has to be categorical. If you're counting things, that's, that's numeric, so it can't be nominal. Data at the ordinal level of measurement are qualitative data, that can be arranged in a meaningful order, but calculations such as addition or division do not make sense. So we've got some examples of nominal data, eye color, hair color, but we can also look at some examples of ordinal data, such as, yeah, I'm having trouble coming up with one off the top of my head. Um, well, let's think through this. It's, it's gotta be categorical, and they've got to be in some sort of inherent meaningful order. Categorical, but some inherent meaningful order to it. Um, how about socioeconomic status? It's categorical, low, medium, high, but there is an inherent meaningful order to it. Low, medium, high. The fact that you could also do it high, medium, low is irrelevant. You've got an ordering to it. So socioeconomic status would be an ordinal level variable. Notice ordinal level variables have additional information to them that nominal level variables don't have. That is position. I can say high SES is larger or greater than low SES. I can't say blue eyes are larger or greater than brown eyes. Doesn't make sense. Example. Determine whether the data are nominal or ordinal. Seat numbers on your concert tickets such as A23 and A24. Go ahead and hit pause while you think about it. I believe the answer to this will be it's ordinal. Although I haven't been to a concert since the 80s, um, I believe the A would be the row and 23 would be the seat number. So seat number 23 is one seat closer to the aisle than seat number A24. Since it is closer to the aisle, since we do have some sort of ordering to it, we've got an ordinal variable. Genres of music performed at, performed at the 2013 Grammys, that would be nominal. Because it'd be, I assume, country and, and, and rock and jazz and doo-wop are all done at the Grammys, I assume. And there's no inherent ordering to that. I could do it alphabetical order and it would have just as much meaning as doing it in terms of the order that I just gave you. So A is ordinal, B is nominal. Data at the interval level of measurement are quantitative data that can be arranged in a meaningful order and such that differences between data entries are meaningful. Difference between levels are meaningful such as shoe sizes. The difference between a five and a six in shoe size is exactly the same as the difference between an eight and a nine in shoe size. They both differ by one shoe size, but also by 1.3 inches, I think. Um, temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is interval because going from 45 to 46 degrees is exactly the same as going from 95 to 96 degrees. It's an increase of one degree Fahrenheit. Probably should say it's measured in degrees Fahrenheit. Birth years of your classmates are collected. What level of measurement are these data? Well, clearly it's gonna be uh, interval. Birth years, 2000, I don't know what birth years you guys have, 2001. 2002, that differs by one year, just like 1997 and 1998 differ by one year. The key for interval level data is that subtraction, and by extension addition, actually makes sense. And then the last level of measurement, the one that has the most information in it, is called the ratio level. 
It's quantitative data. It can be ordered, it's interval, and the zero point indicates the lack of something. So compare, compare the year of your birth, which we decided was interval from the last, with your age, which is ratio. Year of the birth, well, a zero year of birth doesn't indicate a lack of anything, just indicates it was 2000 some odd years ago. But an age of zero would indicate you lack age. Now note that you don't have to be able to achieve a zero. All that it means is that a value of zero would indicate an absence or a lack of something. So the height of a person would also be ratio because a height of zero would indicate a lack of height. You can't achieve a height of zero, but if it were achievable, it would indicate you lack height. Weight would be another example of a ratio level variable. You can't achieve zero weight, but a zero weight would indicate a lack of weight. Now it's called ratio level because ratios actually do mean something. So comparing a person of age 10 to a person of age 20, that ratio actually does mean something. The second person is twice as old as the first. A four foot person versus an eight foot person, the ratio of two actually does mean that the eight foot person is twice as tall as the four foot per person. Compare that with your age of birth, no, just your year of birth, sorry. 1995 versus 2000, that doesn't indicate that your year of birth is 0.5% higher. It's just your five years later, which is interval. So the word ratio comes from the fact that ratios, divisions, actually make sense. So example, consider the ages in whole years of US presidents when they were inaugurated, what level of measurement are these data? Clearly they're going to be ratio because it's in this section, but why are they? Because it's ages in whole years. An age of zero would indicate a lack of age. It doesn't mean you can achieve an age of zero. It just means that if zero is in the age column in your spreadsheet, you lack age. So here are the uh, nice little stair step. You've got qualitative, quantitative. Qualitative includes nominal and ordinal. Nominal means names, ordinal means ordered nominal. Quantitative is interval and ratio. In interval, zero is just a placeholder, just such as zero degrees Fahrenheit. If zero degrees Fahrenheit doesn't indicate a lack of temperature, whereas in ratio, zero does mean the absence of something. So zero Kelvin, would be a ratio level variable. But zero, I'm sorry, degree, uh, measuring temperature in Kelvin would be ratio level, but measuring degrees in Fahrenheit would just be interval level. Because a zero Fahrenheit just means it's cold, not that it lacks temperature. Zero Kelvin means it actually lacks temperature. Here's the third one. Give an example of a ratio level variable not provided in the slides or the text. Again, I would write this off on the left, write the answer beneath it, so you can go into Moodle and answer the questions. And pause, of course, if you need to. So, final example, classifying data. Let's classify these as qualitative or quantitative, discrete or continuous, or neither, and the level of, uh, of uh, measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. Finishing times for runners in the Labor Day 10K. Colors contained in a box of crayons. Boiling points on Celsius scale for various caramel candies. And the top 10 spring break destinations is ranked by MTV. Go ahead and hit pause before I give you the answers. The answer for A, finishing times for runners will be a ratio level. It will be continuous and it will be quantitative. Colors contained in a box of crayons will be qualitative. It will be neither, because qualitative is neither discrete nor continuous. And it will be nominal. Note that number of colors would be different, but we're looking at just the colors themselves. Boiling points on Celsius, that's going to be quantitative. 
continuous and, re uh, and uh, interval, because zero Celsius does not indicate a lack of temperature. And finally, D, top 10 spring break destinations is ranked by MTV. Notice these are the destinations themselves, so it's going to be categorical or qualitative, and hence neither discrete nor continuous. Lever measurement is going to be ordinal. And that's it for section 1-2. Again, don't hesitate to send me comments, questions, and post them in Moodle for the discussion section. Thank you much. Hello, welcome to section 1.3, the process of a statistical study. The objectives for this section are to describe the process of a statistical study. That's probably rather clear. Identify the various types of studies, but most importantly, to understand the primary sampling schemes. And it's this understanding the primary sampling schemes that is key for this section. If all you take out of this section is those sampling schemes and an understanding of them, you're doing great. So here's the process of a statistical study. Notice that there are four steps. Step one is to determine the design of the study. There are classes taught in experimental design, by the way. But you need to state the question to be studied, determine the target population and the variables, and then determine the sampling method you're going to use. It's 1C. It's, 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 it's a subset of 1, but it's, it's probably the most important thing here. Because remember, your sample must be representative of your target population. Otherwise, all the statistical methods in the world are useless. Your sample must be representative. So we need to study how to draw a representative sample. Two, you're going to collect the data according to that sampling method. Three, you're going to organize the data. And four, you're going to analyze the data. Yeah, Four is going to be the second half of the class. Three is going to be most of the rest of the first half of the class. So, example 111. Neurologists want to study the effect of vitamin C on nerve disorders. The goal of the study is to see if taking an intravenous dose of vitamin C will reduce the amount of nerve pain uh, reported by patients. So identify the population of interest and the variables in the study. Again, pause and welcome back. The population of interest is all Notice all populations of interest have the word all in there somewhere. All patients, period. And the variables in the study will be, um, I'm sorry, all patients with nerve disorders. And the uh, variables in the study will be the uh, amount of vitamin C and amount of nerve pain. Those are the obvious ones. Perhaps others will need to be taken eventually to take care of some intervening uh, issues. Observational study versus an experiment. An observational study observes the data that already exist. So the statistician will sit there and just collect data, won't try to influence the outcome of anything, whereas an experiment generates data to help identify the cause and effect relationships. Um, yeah, the, the the book emphasizes that it's cause and effect. It's easier to do cause and effect analysis when you've got an experiment, but um, observational studies can hint at that as well. Um, now that these are the proper definitions as used by scientists, a statistician will refer to any, quote, theoretical data collection as an experiment. Um, this difference in terminology comes from the fact that statisticians experiment to better understand their field of study. Just like biologists uh, experiment to better understand biology, and physicists experiment to better understand physics, statisticians experiment to better understand statistics. So here's an example. Which type of study would you conduct, observational or experiment? A, you want to determine the average age of college students across the nation. B, researcher wishes to determine if flu shots actually help prevent severe cases of the flu. Um, go ahead and hit pause. Uh, the first one's an observational study, the second is an experiment. And notice in the second one, you're actually trying to determine if the flu shots do something. Whereas in the first one, you're just observing ages of students across the nation. A representative sample has the same relevant characteristics as the population and does not favor one group from the population over another. 
Note that a sample could be representative for one characteristic of the population, but not for another. Um, so here's an interesting question. Um, how do you know if a sample is representative of the population? That we're going to come back to time and time and time again, because um, it's such an important question. Remember, all of statistics is based on that sample you draw, and that sample has to be representative of the population. So how do you know if your sample actually is representative of the population? Um, we got a red star at the bottom, so let's move on to the first intro lecture question. Um, question one, my sample is all females in this class. Is it a representative sample? Remember, hit pause, uh, write the question over on the left side. You probably should listen to what I'm saying before you hit pause. Write the question on the left side of your notes, write the answer down below it so you can put it into your middle quiz, um, and then hit pause. I really do want to come back to this. How do we know if a sample is representative of the population? Maybe you should write that on the left-hand side as well and start coming up with answers to that question because we're going to be seeing it several times in this course. Um, here's five sampling techniques. Uh, simple random sampling. Notice the book also has something called random sampling. We're going to conflate that with simple random sampling. Um, second type is stratified, then clustered, then systematic, and then convenience. Never ever use convenient sampling except when I give you permission to in class, but we're not in class, so. Sample random sample. Every sample from the population has an equal chance of being selected. Keyword there is actually two keywords. It's sample and equal chance. So if I want to draw a sample of size 50 from everybody in the United States and I want to use simple random sampling, that means that every possible combination of 50 people in the United States has an equal chance of being selected. Every possible combination of 50 people has an equal chance of being selected. Or we can bring it down to the class level. Let's say our, our class is size 30. So our population is size 30. And I want a sample from this population, a sample of size 5. Simple random sampling would require that every possible combination of five people in this class would have an equal chance of being selected. Stratified sampling. Population is divided into subgroups called strata. The grouping variable is correlated with the measurement variable and a sample is drawn from each stratum. So in this example, if I want to estimate the average GPA at Knox, I probably would break it up into freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors, estimate the GPA in the freshmen, estimate the GPA in the sophomores, estimate the GPA in the juniors, estimate the GPA in the seniors, and combine them together to get the estimated average. And the reason I'd probably break it up into freshmen, sophomore, junior, senior is because GPA does seem to correlate with uh, class. Contrast that with cluster sampling. Population is divided into subgroups called clusters, not strata, clusters. The grouping variable is not correlated with the measurement variable, and a sample is drawn from at least one of the clusters. So if we're going to go back and I want to determine the typical hair color at Knox, Breaking it up into freshman, sophomore, junior, senior would not be useful in terms of stratified sampling, but it would be useful in terms of cluster sampling, because I highly doubt that level in school and hair color is correlated. In this example, we've got a humongous rice field. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's 21 subplots there. I randomly select four of those subplots and estimate the amount of rice in each of them. Each of those subplots is, is seems to be rather representative of the population as a whole. Systematic sampling. Every nth member of the population is selected. So if I want to select 25% of the population, I would select every fourth bottle in this example here. If I want to select every 10% uh, of the population, I'll select every 10th bottle. If I want to get uh, 1% of the population, I'll select every 100th bottle. 
but again, it's, it's systematic because it's selecting every nth member of the population as it comes down the conveyor belt or through the door. Convenient sampling. It's just convenient for the researchers to select. People will self-select into the poll, perhaps. Um, it's very unethical to use. Um, all of the web polls that you see on newspaper sites that say, hey, how would you vote in this case? Those are all convenient sampling, and they are highly unethical because it is trying to give information to the reader, and that information is about the population of interest, but you're drawing a sample from a very skewed population or at a very biased population itself. Um, so here's some examples. A pollster surveys 50 people in each of the senator's 12 voting precincts. So this sounds like stratified. Um, senator's 12 voting precincts, so the voting precinct is the stratum. There's 12 of them surveying 50 from each. I would assume that voting precincts um, are internally more consistent than the population as a whole because like-minded people tend to live near each other. The quality control department at a serial manufacturer marries the weight of every tenth box, so this will be systematic. A female student walks down the halls in her dorm asking students how much money they'd spend from the food court. This is convenience. An educator chooses five of the school districts in the Chicago area and asks each household in those districts how many school-aged children are in the district. This would be cluster. Probably. The book says this is cluster. Um, this may actually be stratified because a school district, the distribution of, of school-aged children may not be the same across the school districts. Um, one school district may have a higher proportion of, of children in each household than another school district. If that's the case, then this would be stratified. To determine who will win a $100,000 shopping spree at a mall, manager draws the name out of a box of entries. This will be simple random sampling. Um, technically, this will be random sampling, but we're conflating the two, remember, so it's simple random sampling. There's the red box. Let's move on to question two. This is a key one, very, very important. What is the primary difference between cluster sampling and stratified sampling? Remember, hit pause if you need to. Again, write the question on the left-hand side of your notebook and your answer underneath of it. Two types of observational studies is the cross-sectional study and the longitudinal study cross-sectional study data collected at a single point in time on a lot of members whereas in a longitudinal study it's over time on a few members a group of 220 patients is followed for 15 years in order to determine the okay right there I know this is gonna be logic longitudinal because it's over time for a small group of, of members B, a gastroenterologist surveys 130 of his patients six months after. Okay, this is going to be cross-sectional because it's done at a single point in time, six months after having the gastric bypass. If the gastroenterologist surveyed those 130 people, six months, one year, 18 months, two years, three years, four years, five years, and that would be a longitudinal study. Some more terminology. Treatment is some condition that is applied to a group of subjects in an experiment. The subjects or the participants are the people or things being studied in an experiment. The response variable is the variable in an experiment that responds to the treatment. We'll also refer to this as the dependent variable. Uh, the explanatory variable is the variable in an experiment that causes the change or it explains why that change took place. Uh, we're going to refer to this as an independent variable. There's another set of variables that are called independent. Oops, it's not the next slide, I guess. Uh, called control variables. Control variables are variables that we know affect the dependent variable, 
but we really don't care about them in terms of our research. So independent variables are broken up into explanatory variables or research variables, and then those control variables. So here are three principles of experimental design. One, you got to randomize the control and treatment groups because the goal is the only difference you want between the control and the treatment group is to be the treatment. So you got to randomly put people into, you don't have to, you should, randomly put people into the two groups, control and treatment, and then apply the treatment to the treatment group. Uh, control for outside effects and the response variable, those would be the control variables. Uh, replicate the experiment a significant number of times to see meaningful patterns, and I do want to emphasize here the word replicate. Remember back earlier we asked how do we know if our sample is actually representative? The answer is we don't. We have to replicate our studies over and over and over again. And then the hope is that we don't make the same mistakes and get an unrepresentative sample in each of those replications. Okay, control group versus treatment group. Control group is this is the group of subjects which no treatment's given, whereas the treatment group gets the treatment. And again, the structure of the experiment has to be such that the only meaningful difference between the control group and the treatment group is the treatment, and the, hence the importance of the randomization. Confounding variables are unmeasured factors other than the treatment variable that cause an effect on the subjects. Uh, to get rid of confounding variables, you measure them, add them to the model. And there's a red star, so let's go back and see. Question three, how do we know if there are confounding variables in a statistical study? Move those over, write that over on the left-hand side of your notes, put the answer there so that you can answer the quiz in Moodle. How do we know if there are confounding variables in Ooh, missing an S in a statistical study. A placebo is a substance that appears identical to the actual treatment but contains no intrinsic beneficial elements. Um, placebos are used to ensure that the only difference between the control and the treatment group is the treatment itself. Placebos will be given to the control group, so the control group doesn't know that they're in the control group. The placebo effect is a response to the power of suggestion rather than to treatment itself. That's why we have to give a placebo to the control group, because the very act of receiving medicine will affect you. Hence, we don't know if the treatment actually improves the, the people or just them thinking they receive treatment. So we've got to give placebos to the control group and the actual treatment to the treatment group. So they all think, hey, I received something. So the placebo effect is going to be constant for the entire group. And again, remember, the emphasis here, the only allowable difference, meaningful difference, between the control group and the treatment group is that the treatment group receives the treatment. In a single blind experiment, the experimenter pokes out one person's eyes Oh wait, no, that's not what it is. Uh, subjects do not know that they are in the control group or the treatment group. Whereas in a double-blind experiment, both the subject and the measurer doesn't know. Um, the measurer is the person who measures the temperature of the patient, measures whether or not the patient improved, um, measures if the patient's foot fell off, whatever, whatever the treatment is supposed to fix. Um, the researcher a good researcher will remove him or herself completely from this once the experiment is set up and is in motion. A researcher will just take the data that is collected and analyze it because the researcher needs to know everything. But in a double-blind experiment, it's the subject and the person doing the measuring who don't know. So subject, person doing the measuring, and researcher, three different people in the experiment. Three different roles in the experiment. Sometimes the subject and the, the measurer are the same person. So here's a lengthy example. Consider the study from example 111, in which a neurologist wanted to determine if taking the IV dose of vitamin C will reduce the amount of nerve pain reported by patients. 
Suppose that the study was narrowed to focus only on patients with the nerve disorder multiple sclerosis. After study approval, the neurologists solicit volunteers who are patients with MS and who are reporting nerve pain. So target population one, I guess, is all patients. Smaller target population is patients with multiple sclerosis. Sampled population, patients with multiple sclerosis who have nerve pain. Sampled population is the people in our uh, after study approval, the people in the study that I can pull from. This doesn't specify what the sampled population is. The sample is the actual 40 participants, 20 in the control group, and 20 in the treatment group. Uh, group A is the treatment group. They're given the IV doses of vitamin C. So the subjects are getting the doses. Somebody is measuring the nerve pain. Participants in group B are the um, control group. They're given an IV dose of saline, which is the placebo, and somebody's measuring it. The participants don't know which group they're in, and the people measuring should not know which group they're in. Oh, should not. However, the nurses administering the IVs are aware of the group assignments. That's not necessarily a bad thing as long as the nurses are not measuring the uh, nerve pain. Um, after a predetermined length of time, the amounts of pain reported by the separate groups are compared to determine if the IV dose reduces the amount of nerve pain. Hmm, interesting. Explanatory and response variables. Treatment. Which group is the treatment? Which is the control group? What's the purpose of administering saline to group B? Is it a single, line, single blind or double blind? Hit pause. Welcome back. Explanatory and response. Response variable is going to be the amount of nerve pain. The explanatory is the vitamin C saline, I'm sorry, the vitamin C IV drip. The treatment is the IV uh, of vitamin C. Which group is the treatment group and which is the control group? The treatment group is the one that receives the vitamin C. The control group is the one that receives the saline. What is the purpose of administrating saline to group B? It's to control for the placebo effect. Remember, group A and group B have to be exactly the same, except that group A receives the treatment. So giving the IV also makes the groups more similar. Is this a single blind or a double blind study? It depends. If the nurses are measuring the pain, it's single blind. If somebody else is measuring the pain that doesn't know who is, when, who is in which group, then it's double blind. Last page. IRB is a group of people who review the design of a study to make sure that it is appropriate and that no unnecessary harm will come to the subjects involved. Uh, Knox College has an institutional review board. Um, it meets infrequently to handle student and faculty research plans or research designs. Informed consent involves completely disclosing to the participants the goals and procedures involved in a study and obtaining their agreement to participate. There is a lot of question out there whether informed consent is ethical, um, whether it's even possible in some cases. Um, in all cases where it's reasonable, informed consent should be obtained. Now the question comes down to when is it not reasonable? And it's not reasonable when um, when the purpose of the experiment is is given away by the by telling the participants the goals and procedures, because um, remember um, the the 
the placebo and the placebo effect if you know the outcome of an experiment or if you know what the researcher is looking for in the experiment there's a much higher probability the researcher is going to find it. Um, so unfortunately informed consent in those cases could actually destroy the experiment which means well is informed consent ethical in those cases? I don't know it's a big question. Things to think about. But that brings us to the end of this section. Um, that's the end of this chapter, however. Um, I encourage you to go through section 1-4, but I won't be lecturing through it. Um, it's important stuff. We just have more important things to cover. So thank you much. Hello and welcome to section 2.1. We're going to be creating frequency distributions today. Um, it's unclear at this point why you're creating frequency distributions. Tomorrow, or in the next lecture, you're going to see how we use these frequency distributions to help create graphics that tell the story of the data. Um, we're going to look at how to create ungrouped frequency distribution and create a grouped frequency distribution. The ungrouped is going to lead to charts such as a pie chart and a bar chart, whereas the grouped is going to lead to such things as a histogram or a stem and leaf plot. Um, so today is the foundations, and the next lecture will be for what we're actually going to be using this for. Throughout this lecture, I'm going to point out some things such as, wow, this is a lot of work for not that much. And I want you to take that seriously and think, okay, a lot of work, we're not getting too much out of it. Is there a way of making this easier? And of course, the answer is yes. So, frequency distributions. A distribution is a way to describe the structure of a particular data set or population. We're going to look at sample distributions now. When we get to chapter 5 and 6, we'll be looking at population distributions. Um, so keep this in mind. In fact, on the left-hand side of your notes, put a little star, write C, chapter 5 and 6 and another star, just to draw your attention to it that this is the start of looking at distributions. Here for the sample, later for the population. A frequency distribution is a display, or a table, of the values that occur in a data set and how often each value, or range of values, occurs. So it's how often, that's where the frequency comes in. Uh, frequencies, which is a little f, are the number of data values in that category, if we're talking about categorical data, or range of values if we're talking about numeric data. In a class, we're going to call that as a category of data in a frequency distribution. For categorical variables, that class most often is going to be one of the levels in the variable. For numeric data, it's going to be some range of possible values for the data. An ordered array is an ordered list of the data from largest to smallest or smallest to largest. Uh, probability distribution is a theoretical distribution used to predict the probabilities of particular data values occurring in a population. Probability distribution, if all we're going to talk about is probability distribution, is going to be about the population. If we're talking about the distribution of our sample, we'll call it a sample distribution. An ungrouped frequency distribution is a frequency distribution where each category or class represents a single value or level in the variable. These are used for categorical variables. Whereas a grouped frequency distribution is a frequency distribution where the classes are ranges of possible values. These will most likely be used in numeric data. The ungrouped frequency distribution will lead to bar charts and pie charts in the future, whereas a grouped frequency distribution will lead to histograms in the future. So here's the steps in constructing a frequency distribution for ungrouped, for categorical data. So to create an ungrouped frequency distribution to determine the levels of the categorical variable, and I do want to emphasize that you would use this only for categorical variables, and count the number of observed values in each level. Okay. Remember, a level is a possible outcome of a categorical variable. Example, the egg color of my research students in this term are as follows. Blue, brown, brown, blue, brown, 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 green. 
So the blue, brown, brown, blue, brown, 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 green is the raw data, the observations, the measurements I make of my students' eye colors. Blue is the eye color of my first research student. Brown is the eye color of my second research student, etc. The frequency distribution just looks at all the possible levels that we observe, blue, brown, and green, and then counts the number of, uh, number of observed values in each of those levels. I got one blue, two blue, only two. Brown, I got one, two, three, four, five. Green, I got just one. So the frequency distribution is 251 for blue, brown, green. Ooh, red star. Um, I think that's what I want to do. So question one. Can I encourage you to write these questions and your answers in your notes on the left-hand side. What is the difference between a grouped and an ungrouped frequency distribution? Pause. And we're back. So that was all about the ungrouped, or for the categorical variables, now we're going to look at grouped, which is almost always applied to numeric variables. Remember the main difference between the ungrouped and the grouped is that the ungrouped, each row in the table corresponds to one level in the variable, whereas for the grouped, each row is going to correspond to a range of values of that variable. So the first step in creating this grouped frequency distribution is decide how many classes should be in the distribution. Now we've got rules of thumb. None of them are good because they're rules of thumb. Um, the reality is you should choose many different numbers of classes. So the first time through you should choose five and then maybe ten and see what the information given by these distributions, how that changes. Uh, maybe twenty. But you're going to realize that if we do 5, 10, 20, 12, and 18, we, do the, we got to do these steps five times. And that takes a lot of effort to do just one. So you're going to fall in love with the computer because the computer can do it just like that. I don't know if you could hear me snapping my fingers, but I'm snapping my fingers. So the first step is to decide how many classes should be in the distribution. Once you've decided that, two, choose an appropriate class width. Class width is usually going to be the highest value minus the lowest value divided by the number of groups. Um, sometimes you'll round down to something logical for the lowest value, round up to something logical for the upper value, and then divide by the, the number of classes. Sometimes you'll skip one, go directly to two, and, and physically determine that class width, um, that what the classes should be based on the, the problem itself, and we'll see that later. Um, in those cases, easy lends itself to natural divisions, um, such as decades or years or hundreds of dollars. Three, find the class limits. The lower class limit, and this is for each of the classes, by the way, the lower class limit is the smallest number that can belong to that class. And the upper class limit is the largest number that can belong to that class. So all the values in that class are greater than the lower class limit and lower than the upper class limit. And now you just count the frequency of each class. 4 is the easy part, by the way. You just determine the frequency. You count how many are in each of those classes. So here's some terminology. Class width is the difference between the lower limit and the upper limit of two consecutive classes. Lower is the smallest number that can belong to that class. Upper class limit is the largest that can belong to that class. Here's the example. Here are 20 television prices, 3D TVs. The first 3D TV price is $1,595. The second one was $1,599 and $1,685, etc., all the way up to $1,999. Great song, but that has nothing to do with class limits. First step is to determine the number of classes. If we follow these three steps, 
determine the number of classes. There's 20 data points. How many classes should we do? Or we could use the problem itself to hint what the classes themselves should be. Um, these are TV prices. We got the lowest TV price here of uh, $15.95, the highest of $19.99. Um, these are in, looks like class width should be probably be $100. That would make sense here. So we do maybe $1,400 to $1,500, 1500 to 1600 1600 to 1700 That would make sense. Remember, the purpose of the graphics for you is so that you understand the distribution of the data. For your reader, or your client, it's so that they understand the story that the data is telling. So to determine the class width, we were told five, by the way, use five classes. So maybe my idea doesn't quite work, at least for this problem. I think it would work for reality. Five classes. Um, so 19, this is the highest value, the lowest value, divided by 150. So about 81 would give us a class width. OK, $81 class width. I guess if we're going to follow this without thinking, that would be a good thing to do. But if we actually want to think, $81 doesn't, doesn't really seem reasonable in telling the story of the data. $100 would make sense because there's something magical about round numbers. In fact, doubly round numbers. There's two roundnesses here, and there's none here. Oh, I guess the eight, if you turn it on its side, it's got two circles, but oh, this, never mind. So $100 would make sense. Then we gotta choose $100 width, so we gotta say how low to how high. Um, beginning at 1500 makes sense. Um, if we want to just follow the directions without thinking at all, 1595 would make sense as the first class starting point. 1500, if you actually want to present this to a client, would make much more sense. So 1600 will be the class limit of the second. 1700, 1800, 1900, 2000 will be all the classes or the class boundaries, otherwise known as the breaks. should not be overlap in the class boundaries really although in all reality it doesn't matter so here are the three d they can abut but they can't actually overlap um, so now we've got our classes 1500 1599 1600 1699 and now we just calculate the Notice that if you add up 2, 5, 4, 5, and 4, you should get 20, which is our sample size. Now we're going to define something called a class boundary. It is the value that lies halfway between the upper limit of one class and the lower limit of the next class. So the class boundary here would be 1599.50, 1699.50, 1799.50, 1800.50, 1800.50. or 1599.5 if you want. And the purpose of the class boundaries is to make very clear that there is no overlap and that everything, no overlap, and that every possible value fits into one and only one of the classes. The midpoint is the upper limit plus the lower limit divided by two. These midpoints are used um, for estimating the average value in each class. We'll see it in the next chapter in dealing with grouped data. Lower, upper, divided by 2 gives us a class midpoint of 1549.5. Although I don't know a statistician alive that wouldn't say 1550 would be the midpoint. Fifteen hundred plus fifteen ninety nine divided by two gives us this as the midpoint. Sixteen hundred 
plus 1699 divided by 2 gives us this as the midpoint. Those are for frequencies. If we want to do relative frequencies, we just divide the frequency by the sample size. So 2 divided by 20, 5 divided by 20, 4 divided by 20, 5 divided by 20, 4 divided by 20. Notice that adding up all the frequencies gives us the sample size, which we're always going to symbolize as a lowercase n. Lowercase f is the frequency. The subscript of the i is for class i. So f sub i is the frequency in the ith class. So this calculates the relative frequency. We first add up all the frequencies to determine the sample size. Now we just divide each of the class frequencies, the f sub i's, by 20. So the first relative frequency is going to be f sub 1 divided by 20. Second will be f sub 2 divided by 20. Then f sub 3 divided by 20, etc. Cumulative frequency. It's just the sum of the frequencies of a given class added to all lower classes. So if you are able to order your data, then you can do a cumulative frequency. If your data cannot be ordered, that is, if it's nominal, then you cannot do a, fre a cumulative frequency. It doesn't make sense to talk about less than or equal to if there's no ordering. So here we got the frequencies, and this last column is the cumulative frequency. So the cumulative frequency for the first one is always the frequency. The cumulative frequency for the second is going to be 5 plus 2, because it's whatever's here plus what's above. 4 plus 5 plus 2. 5 plus 4 plus 5 plus 2. 4 plus 5 plus 4 plus 5 plus 2. And notice the cumulative frequency always ends with our sample size, little n. Here's an example. Data collected on the numbers of miles that professors drive to work daily are listed below. Clearly not below, it's on the next side. Use these data to create a frequency distribution that includes the class boundaries, midpoint, relative frequency, and cumulative frequency of each class. We're told we have to use six classes. So here's the data. Um, the low is one. The high is 11.9, we're told 6. So if we just follow the directions of that thinking, we're going to come up with 1.8 as our class width. So we'll do class boundaries as being 1, 2 .8, 4 .6, 6 .4, 8.2, 11, 12.9, whatever they are. I lost count already. I'm just adding 1.8. Where are we? I'm just adding 1.8 to each of those. Notice that it may make sense to do it class width of 2 instead of 1.8. 1, it's a lot easier to do in your head. 2, it makes a lot more sense in terms of presenting the data. So instead of 1.8, let's round this up to 2. So the boundaries will be 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. See? Much easier. And now the lower class limit is the limit of our first class. 1 is the lowest, so if we just want to follow this, we can start with a 1. I would say let's start with 0. That would kind of make sense. Um, so it would be 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. That would include all the data. Instead of 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, which would also include all the data. But maybe 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. looks better to the client. However, we're going with 1. So 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. We're backing it off by 0.1. Now we do the frequencies. There's our midpoints. Uh, 
And again, don't know any statistician that would say the midpoint is 1.95. Every statistician I know would say the midpoint is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. And the class boundaries and the class would be 1 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, uh, 3 to 5, 5 to 7, 7 to 9. But notice in each case you include the lower but not the upper. Uh, frequency is 334242. We get that just by going back to the data itself and counting. Relative frequency is our frequency, so f sub 1 divided by our sample size of 18, f sub 2 divided by 18, f sub 3 divided by 18. Cumulative frequency is the frequency in this group plus all those lower. So it'll be 3, 6, 10, 12, 16, 18. And of course we could have a cumulative relative frequency which would be just each of these divided by 18. So here's the overview again. Notice there's a lot of work to this if we do it by hand, and if we have a, a, a realistic data set. And a lot of decisions we have to make, and the, the distribution itself depends on those decisions. So we're going to want to do several of these, hopefully not by hand. Uh, so we've got to decide on the number of classes, I choose an appropriate class width, find the class limits, determine the frequency in each of the classes. That's a lot of work for one frequency distribution. And again, remember this is for grouped frequency distributions. Um, being able to automate this would, would make life so much easier. It would allow us to look at different uh, the effect of different choices we make. So instead of five, it we'd be able to figure out well, what does the frequency distribution look like if we chose 10 classes? What if we chose 50 classes? What if we chose two classes? What would it, what would it look like? And what stories do each of those frequency distributions tell us about the data? Here are the other characteristics. We've got the classes, boundaries, midpoints, relative frequencies, and cumulative frequencies. And we got a red star good because that's the last page. We've got two questions. Um, question number two, again, put this over in your notebook. On the left hand side, write the question and your answer below it so you can transfer that into Moodle's quiz. Um, what are the steps in constructing an ungrouped frequency distribution? And then question number three, what are the steps in constructing a grouped frequency distribution? Um, and a hint, um, one of those two is going to be a lot easier than the other. Um, and what I'm getting at in these two questions, uh, don't hit pause yet, what I'm getting at in these two questions is you'll see that the grouped frequency distribution steps are exactly the same as the ungrouped, except for you have to add a few things in taking your numeric variable and making it categorical taking your numeric variable and making it categorical. And that's what these classes are doing. You're taking your numeric variable and you're classifying them. You're making them categorical. And that's it. Um, section 2.2 two takes what we did today and makes pictures out of it. Okay, makes graphics out of it. Plus we get to see a lot of different types of graphics. And we'll see how to do all of this really fast in R. So. Hope this was helpful. Talk to you later. Hello and welcome to section 2.2, .2, Graphical Displays of Data. Recall in the last lecture that we looked at how to create frequency distributions, both ungrouped and grouped. Today, or in this lecture, we're going to look at turning those frequency distributions into graphics that tell the story of the data. And I do want to emphasize the purpose of graphics is to tell the story of the data. The graphics that we see today are going to tell the story of the data to you, mainly because they look pretty ugly. But we're going to see in some of the SCAs, the statistical computing activities, how to pretty up those graphics so that they tell the story in a pleasing way to your audience. Remember, the graphics serve two purposes that are really the same purpose. 
the basic graphics tell you the story of the data and then the 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 publication quality graphics tell your audience the story of the data that you learned so we're going to look at those utilitarian ugly graphics today and in SCA, I believe it's SCA2, we're going to see how to create nice looking graphics that can help convey that story to your reader. Um, we're going to look at how to create some bar charts, uh, pie chart before that, yeah. but bar charts, uh, both uh, univariate bar chart that is for one categorical variable, but also some bivariate stacked and side by side bar charts. We'll look at histogram and its neighbor uh, stem and leaf plot and then line graph. Um, we're going to look at different shapes of the distributions. Remember these these graphics are going to tell us about the data. Here's some rules on what graphs or graphics should have. They should stand alone without the original data. That is in your paper you provide a graphic instead of providing all of the data. Um, the graphics have to have labels and values for both axes. Um, when appropriate, a legend, a source, and date should be included. The source and the date are usually in the caption, however. And in a paper, the graphic must contain a number and a caption. So the first figure that you include is going to be called figure one, and then you're going to give it a caption, a brief description of what that graphic says. Um, the graphic must also be des described in the prose, in your, in your writing, in the paper itself. Ooh, red star. So let's go to our first question. What do all graphics need? And remember, you should write this over on the left-hand side of your notes, the question and your answer, and you should hit pause to remember uh, to, to gain some time here. Because I'm going to hop back to the lecture. So we'll start with pie charts, probably the worst creation of statisticians. A pie chart shows how large each category is in relation to the whole. The whole is represented by the entire circle. The parts are slices of that pie. It's used to describe qualitative categorical data. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You create your, your frequency distribution for it. You calculate the relative frequencies, and then you multiply each of those relative frequencies by 360 degrees, or 2 pi if, if you prefer. Here's the example. Um, calculate the uh, housing types for students in this in a statistics class. Four types of housing. These this is the frequency distribution. We learned about how to calculate that in the last lecture. 20, 15, 9, and 5. 49 is our sample size. So now we create relative frequencies. So the first relative frequency it's 20 divided by 49, second will be 15 over 49, third will be 9 over 49, the last one will be 5 over 49. And then we create the central angle measures by multiplying those relative frequencies by 360 degrees. So we know that the apartment has to cover 147 degrees of that 360 degree circle. The dorm has to cover 31%, which is 110 degrees, etc. And then we just create the histogram, uh, the uh, pie chart, drawing a circle, a dot in the center, and then measure that this 41% is 147 degrees, and this 31% corresponds to 110 degrees, and this 18% is 66 degrees, etc. Rather difficult to create in all reality. Uh, it also suffers from the fact that the slices have to be different colors and brighter colors tend to draw our attention more. So the 10% slice, the gold, yellowish gold slice, tends to look bigger than the 10% that is allotted to it. Furthermore, it's kind of difficult without the 10 and the 18 actually stated there to compare the size of this slice to the size of that slice, our eyes, our brains have trouble distinguishing central angles and the relative sizes of those. So for all intents and purposes, unless someone tells you you must make a pie chart, avoid pie charts. A much easier chart to create and better all around chart to create is a bar chart. 
which we'll see next. But we got the R, so let's go ahead and start R. If I can figure out how to do that. That didn't do it. That kind of did it. Um, so I'm going to uh, just start R. I've got R, a link to R in several places. This is one of them. You will probably have two links on your desktop or one or two links on your desktop. Um, but it'll be here. I've got several versions of R. This is an old version of R, but it works for me. Just started. First thing, always, new script. Notice there's overlap between the two in PCs. There's going to be that overlap in Macs. There may not be. So I'm going to tile vertically. Notice I clicked on the console window first. So the console window is over here. The script window is over there. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is load data. Uh, these pound signs or hashtags um, indicate a comment. Uh, once R comes across one of them, it ignores everything else in that line. So I use three to indent more. Notice I move things around. I'm going to make this side bigger so you can see it. I'm going to load data from the internet. I'm going to read a CSV file from the internet. The function I'm going to use is read.csv. It requires that you specify the path to that location. What we're going to look at is the crime data set. Uh, remember, you've got the pause button, so you can pause this and type it in. Um, notice that if I just run this, and by quote run this, that's control R on a PC or command enter on a Mac, it's going to go to the internet, it's going to go to this particular URL, and it's going to read it, and it's going to spit it back out on over here on the console window. So this is that data set. It just printed it off. It didn't save it. R doesn't know this data set now. Since we are going to be using this data set, we need to save it into a variable. Um, by bad habit, I call this variable dt, dt for data. A good habit, and computer scientists would want to do this, is to name it something descriptive. So crime will be the crime data set, or they may want to do crime data set if they like their camel case or capital C crime data set I'm bad enough at typing that I just leave it as DT I run that notice what happens over on the left it just spits out DT equals read.csv of this URL no errors because I typed everything correctly and all this data set is now stored in the variable DT if I want to see it I'm going to type DT over on the console side. To run a line on the console side, you just have to enter, and boom, it spits out the entire data set. Um, we got a variable repub. If I want to look at that variable repub, I can type repub here. On the, on the script side, if I'm going to save it and use it later, uh, or I can just explore over on this side, type repub, type it in, hit the enter key, and get an error. Error, object repub not found. Um, there's going to be two reasons for that error. Uh, one, misspelling. Two, you didn't attach the data set. R only sees one variable at the moment. That one variable is DT, the entire data set. Um, there are ways of peeking into the data set for R name of the data set, dollar sign says peek into, and then the variable name. And that will give us all the Republican values. Or if we're going to be doing this a lot and we don't want to type DT frequently, we can just attach the data. Run the attach, and then repub now gives us the data values. So if I don't attach, just typing the name of the variable gives me an error. I have to do the data set name, dollar sign repub, to get those values. Or if I just attach the entire data set, I can type repub or any of these variables to access them. 
Actually, if all I want is the names of the variables, I can use the names function. Similarly, if I want a summary of each of the variables, I can type summary. This is very useful because it tells us how R sees the variables themselves. If it gives a frequency distribution, R sees this variable as being a categorical variable. If it gives us the six number summary, R sees this as being a numeric variable. Um, so back to repub, the minimum value is a negative 0.25, the maximum is 0.24, there's three missing values, the median is 0.01, the mean is 0.005. But that isn't, that doesn't matter because we want to look at how to do a pie chart. Um, pie chart, let's do a pie chart of census 4. There's our census 4 variable. First thing we need to do is tabulate the var values, that is get a frequency distribution for it. We do that with the table function, and then to create the pie chart, we just use the pie function on that frequency distribution. And now as you can see, it's kind of difficult for me to tell which of these two is bigger, Midwest or West. If I look at it long enough, I can tell that it's West, but it took me a long time to figure that out. I had to stop and think about it. Those aren't pretty colors, but this is just for you to understand the data itself. So the pie function, when it's applied to a frequency distribution, gives us a pie chart. And to create that frequency distribution, it's the table function. Let's see if I can get back to this. Okay. Moving on from a pie chart, we go to the bar graphs, or the bar charts. A bar graph is just like a pie chart, except instead of pieces of a circle, it's bars of a certain height. The height of those bars represents the frequency of the data, of the values in the data set. It's for qualitative data. Uh, Pareto charts are for nominal data. Um, it orders the uh, bar heights from lowest to highest, or highest to lowest your choice. Stacked bar graph is for two, uh, looking at two different categorical variables um, where the bars are stacked and then we've got the side by side it's where the bars are side by side clearly. Um, of all of these if I've got the, the bottom two or for, for two categorical variables Pareto is only for nominal the bar is for nominal and ordinal. Between the stacked and the side-by-side, -side, I personally prefer the side-by-side. -side. It's a personal preference. I don't know that there's any science behind it other than it's my personal preference. So here we are creating a bar graph from our data that we've already found the frequency distribution for. The apartment bar is going to be 20 high. The dorm bar is going to be 15 high. The house bar is going to be 9 high. The sorority fraternity bar is going to be 5 high because those are the frequencies. That's all there is to this. And now I don't have to squint and try to estimate which of these is bigger and which is smaller. And by the way, this happens to be a Pareto chart because it's going from largest to smallest or smallest to largest. We got the R, so let's see how we can do a bar graph or a bar chart in R. The function is bar plot. Again, it's applied to a frequency distribution. And there's our bar, po bar plot. The height of Midwest corresponds to the frequency of Midwest states. The height of Northeast to the frequency of Northeast states, etc. If I want to turn this into a Pareto, I just have to sort. Now we see that the south has the most frequent, uh, northeast is the least frequent. Pretty straightforward. Um, by the way, this space that I left here and here are optional. Those spaces are for me as the reader to better understand what I'm typing and to make sure I don't make mistakes. If I don't include those spaces, there's a good chance that I will forget the closing parenthesis. I'll run that line and I'll get a plus mark down here. The plus mark indicates that R is waiting for some more input. It's waiting for something from me. Usually it's a closing parenthesis or a closing brace. 
In this case, I know it's a closing parenthesis. Um, two ways of dealing with it. If I know it's a closing parenthesis, I can just highlight that parenthesis and run it. It runs the line, prints out the, the bar chart, and we get back to a less than sign. If I wasn't sure what the problem was, I click over on the console side and I'll hit the escape button and then enter and I get back to the less than sign or maybe that's a greater than sign. But The key is use spaces for you so that you can tell what you're typing. Here's how to do the Pareto chart by hand. You just order it and you get that. Notice this is a horizontal bar chart. Here's how to do horizontal in R. H-O-R-I-Z equals true. There's a comma here. Horiz stands for horizontal. There's true. Now we've got ourselves a horizontal Pareto chart. Here's stacked. Stacked bar charts are for looking at uh, comparing two categorical variables. Um, in this case, one variable is the sample letter and the other is housing type. So in this in the apartment housing type, uh, sample A came up with about 20 of students who were in the apartment and sample B came up with 33. I'm sorry, 13 because this the height from here to here is 13. Here's how to do the uh, the stacked side by side looks exactly the same except the heights these aren't stacked on top of each other they're side by side hence the name side by side. Let's see how to do side by side in R. First we got to figure out that frequency distribution we'll use the table command Tables used for frequency distributions of categorical variables. Uh, we'll do census for, that's a comma. Uh, let's do it by, uh, what names do we have available? Here we go. Looking through these, there's lots and lots of variables. I'm going to do Dom Paul Culture as my second. So this is our two-dimensional frequency distribution. Um, this five here says that in our sample, five states are in the Midwest and are individualistic. This seven is seven states are in the Midwest and are moralistic. This zero is zero states in the Midwest are traditionalistic. Uh, seven Western states are moralistic. Fifteen Southern states are traditionalistic. So that's our frequency distribution. Now we just apply our bar plot to this. Copy and paste is fantastic, isn't it? So here we are with this, uh, a stacked individualistic. Altogether, there's 17. Moralistic, altogether, there's 17. Traditionalistic, altogether, there's 17. Um, these colors correspond to the census four region. Let's see if this works. Specify legend equals true. So the lightest is the west. So this would be the western states that are individualistic. This would be the southern that are individualistic. This is the northeast that are individualistic. This is the midwest that are individualistic. This would be the south that are traditionalistic and the west that are traditionalistic. That's one way of looking at it the data. We could switch the order. And now the base is going to be the region of the country and the bar heights are going to be based on the um, dominant political culture. So in the Midwest, individualistic is about five, moralistic is about seven. Northeast, south, West. Which of those two is better? 
this or this? The answer is, it depends on what story you're trying to tell or to learn about the data. If you're trying to learn about the data, both are important to do. If you have trouble with the colors, you can specify different colors. I'm going to have to specify four colors here with call. C-O-L stands for colors. Uh, and pretty easy, we can just do one through four. That's a colon, it indicates through, so this one colon four is the numbers one through four. One, two, three, four. And now we run this, and we can see much more clearly what the colors are. The west is the blue, the south is the green, the northeast is the red, the midwest is the black. For this second, there's only three. I'm going to do colors four through seven. Uh, 4 through 6. 4, 5, and 6 will be the colors we use. Ew. Probably should have guessed what the colors were. Uh, blue, cyan, and magenta. I guess it could be worse. So those are side by side. I'm so, Yeah, those are stacked. Um, to do side by side, we just specify We spell correctly beside equals true. So to get side by side, we just have to specify beside equals true. And now we have side by side. This may be helpful to look in the north uh, Midwest and see that the moralistic outnumbers the individualistic. In the Northeast, the individualistic is about double the moralistic. In the South, strongly traditionalistic with just a couple individualistic, and the West is much more spread out. And again, we could change the order. But we'd have, we now have four colors we need to deal with. So the individualistics are kind of spread out over the four groups. The moralistic is totally missing in the South, and traditionalistic is Midwest and Northwest totally missing. So again, which of these two is better? They both tell us a story about the data, therefore they are both important. Frequency histogram, or just a histogram, is a bar graph of a frequency distribution of quantitative data. The frequency histogram is based on your grouped distribution from last lecture. A relative frequency histogram is also based on your grouped frequency distribution, but it's the relative frequency distribution. Characteristics of histograms, it's a bar graph of a frequency distribution. Horizontal axis is a real number line. It's the values of your variable. The vertical axis is going to be the frequency within each of those classes. The width of the bars represents the class width. The bars in the histogram should touch. Tell that to Excel because Excel doesn't let them touch unless you know how to yeah, unless you know the tricks. The height of each bar represents the frequency. So here's the example. Remember this example from last time? It took a long time to come up with this table of frequencies. Getting the graph is pretty straightforward though. There's two in the first class, five in the second class, four in the third class, five, then four again. This was the hard part. Creating bar charts off of it, the easy part. This is for the frequency histogram. And doing it for the relative frequency, you get exactly the same shape. Exactly the same shape. You just got to call the vertical axis the relative frequency. Here's how to do a histogram in R. We'll do it on the violent crime rate. In 1990, the function is hist, hist for histogram. There's our basic histogram. That was pretty fast. By default, in this case, particularly, R is going to have class widths of 500. There's going to be one, two, three, four, five classes. There's, a, there's an algorithm that goes through to figure out the, quote, optimal, but there's nothing optimal about these. you need to actually specify, or I'm sorry, you need to do multiple histograms so you get a better feel for what the data are. So here's how you specify. 
that's with the brakes uh, option. This will give us about 11 brakes. Um, brakes are very are going to be close to the uh, class boundaries. Going to be similar to the class boundaries. You want more than 11 brakes? How about 21 brakes? Again, the key is 51 brakes. The key is what story are these telling us, and what's the best story to, for it to tell? There's a thousand and one breaks. There's five breaks. There's two breaks. Notice that we could also, or realize that we can also, instead of just say the number of breaks, we can specify the actual class boundaries themselves. Also with the breaks slot, we're going to use the sequence function, SEQ for sequence. The lowest is 0, the highest I think was 2500, and then the third slot here belongs to the number of classes you want. I'm sorry, ignore that. It doesn't belong to the classes you want, uh, number of classes, it belongs to the class width. So if I want my class width to be 100, that's what it's going to look like. I want the class width to be 200. Ooh, I got an error down here. Some x not counted. Oh, that's because this function will set up values. I'm going to run that just that part. At 0, 200, 400, 600, I'm adding 200 each time until I get to 2400 because adding another 200 will put us beyond. And the Washington DC is actually sitting out there above 2400. It needs to be counted. So. 2600 and now it runs. Um, 250, uh, 10. Notice how quickly we're able to create these histograms. We don't have to focus on the particular calculations. We can choose our class widths and allow that to tell us the story of the data much more quickly. In all of these, the story of the data says, hey, look at this outlier. It's far from all the others. This happens to be the District of Columbia. Everything else seems to be clumped. Nice little bell shape-ish to it. And that was true when it was 100 for the class width. Again, bell shape, not quite so smooth, but a bell shape nonetheless. Uh, when we use 2,500. When we use 200. I mean, this actually looks like the best of them, but it looks like the best to me because I still got that outlier and I've got a nice curve over on the left. So notice how quickly we did 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 histograms. If we were stuck doing these by hand, you'd still be doing the first one. Stem and leaf plot is an old time histogram. It's also for quantitative data. Um, there's a lot of steps to it. Again, it takes a long time to do it. You're going to want to do one of these at least once, but the reality is once you can do a histogram, there's no reason to do a stem and leaf plot. So here we've got the ACT scores. The stem is going to be the tens place. So this stem will be a 1, the leaf will be 8. The stem is 2, the leaf is 3. The stem is 2, the leaf is 4. And then we just collect on the stems and write out the leaves. So we got 18, 19, 18, 18, 17 are ACT scores, 23, 24, 27, 26, 22, 27, 29, etc. are the ACT scores. It's better to do these in order, by the way. So the data values are 17, 18, 18, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 24, 25, etc. If you want, in R, the function is stem and here's your stem and leaf plot. Here's the key decimal point is 2 to the right of it, so this is going to be 0 
two decimal two to the right of this is a decimal place, so that'll be seventy. That'll be one thirty, one thirty, one forty, one sixty, one sixty, one seventy, because these are by twos. Two sixty, two eighty, two eighty, two eighty, three hundred, three hundred, three ten, three thirty, three forty, three fifty, three ninety, four thirty, four thirty, etc. This is 2460, this is 1240, this is 1050, 1080. Line graphs, the last graph for today is using the data or measurements over time. It's just a scatter plot connected the dots where the horizontal axis is time. The vertical axis is our variable of interest. So here's the example with the consumer price index. CPI is a measure of the average change in the value over time for a, quote, basket of goods and services for a typical American. It's an index calculated by the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. The table below shows the actual values of the CPI from several years, from 1920 to 2010, actually every decade. So in 1920, the CPI was 20, so it cost 20 bucks for that basket of goods. In the year 2000, it cost $172.20 for that same basket of goods. Technically not the same basket. Some thing, items were switched out and put in over time, but they were equivalent when they were switched out and, and replaced. Here's, here's the line graph. Notice the horizontal axis is the year. Vertical axis is the CPI. And you can look, it was pretty consistent until 1970 and then the price increased dramatically over the next 40 years. Let's see how to do this in R. Um, first we've got to specify the variable values. This was the years. happened to be a sequence from 1920 to 2010 every 10 years. Then the CPI itself is equal to C C is a function that collects several values into one vector. You're going to be switching back and forth a lot. 20, 16, 14, 24.1, 29.6, 82.4, 130.7, 172.2.2, finally 218.1. So those are the variables we got. Run them. Notice there's no errors over here. And then we just do a plot. X variable comes first, that would be the year in this case. The, CPI, the Y variable comes next, which is the CPI. And then this has to be a line and dot. Got lines and dots. One way of doing that is to specify type is equal to lowercase b. And there's our line graph. X axis or x variable, y variable, and to get both lines and dots, you would do type equals b. You want lines, that will be a lowercase l. That is a lowercase l. Notice the dots go away. But you can add them back with the points command. And now the dots are back. You're going to learn how to make this graph look much more appealing, but that is for a different slideshow. So here's the summary. For qualitative data, that is for categorical data, we got pie charts and bar graphs. We got the Pareto chart if the data are nominal. Side by side bar and stacked bar when you've got two categorical variables that you're looking at. For quantitative data, you've got the histogram, you've got the stem and leaf plot, which if you turn your head sideways looks an awful lot like that histogram. And then we've got the line graph if the horizontal axis or the x variable is time. Um, 
And now we got our red star. It's pretty good because that's the last page here. Let's see how bad I've messed it up. Aha! We got it back. So question number two, and again, I would recommend writing the question and your answer on the left-hand side of your notes. So question two, which graphics can only be used for a single categorical variable? Key is the word single and the word categorical. Go ahead and hit pause. Question number three, which graphics can only be used for a single numeric variable? Single numeric. And both question two and question three have multiple answers. Don't forget to submit these into Moodle. Um, and that's it. I hope this was helpful. Take care. Hello and welcome to section 2.3, an additional section on analyzing graphs. This is not computational in st structure. This is more of an interpretation section and a better understanding of what makes a good graph and in many ways, more importantly, what makes a bad graph. Um, so the objective is to identify misleading characteristics of a graph with the hope that you will avoid them yourself. Um, there we go. So title, axis, source, this is how to properly label a graph. The middle part really is the only thing done in your statistical program. The title and the source and the caption and the numbering is done in your word processing or typesetting program. So the bar part, this middle part, is all that's done in your statistical program. The title and the source stuff is done in your word processor. Um, a time series graph is a line graph that is used to display a variable whose values change over time. We've seen this already. We called it a line graph in the last section. Um, this should ring a bell as something like panel uh, data from chapter one. It should kind of should be able to go back over your notes, press pause, go back over your notes and see what panel data was. Um, this is a way of describing panel data for one or a very small number of people. Uh, Cross-sectional graph uh, is a way of displaying information collected at only one point in time. Again, that should remind us of something we talked about in chapter one about cross-sectional data. A pictograph is a bar graph that uses pictures of objects instead of bars. Um, they look really spiffy, but they're really dangerous. So let's go ahead and we got a red star, so let's go to our first question. Um, how do pictographs differ from bar charts? So again, over on your left side of your notes, right? How do pictographs differ from bar charts? Answer that. Uh, hit pause right now. And you're back. So let's move on. So here's an example of how pictographs can be deceiving. The one that you're going to see in the newspapers are the one on the right, and the one on the left is the quote correct monthly housing. There are three, at least three things wrong with the, uh, the incorrect pictograph. Uh, for one, I'm going to draw your attention to the axis values and compare here. Uh, two, I'm going to say, uh, what is the area of the 94 versus the area of the 2006 house on the left? Well, the 94, uh, I'm sorry, the 2006 is double the 94, which corresponds to it actually increasing by double. Hint, it's a ratio level variable, so we can meaningfully talk about doubling and halving. Uh, whereas in the incorrect, going from 94 to 2006, it doesn't double in size, it quadruples in size. Because not only are you doubling the height, but you're doubling the width to keep the right form. So our eyes are saying, oh my goodness, it increased by a factor of four. Even though we try to focus on the scale on the left, and it only increases by a factor of two, our mind, our, our, our gut reaction to this is it increases by a factor of four. So that's another way that this particular pictograph is deceiving. I've given you two. Question number two, what are three things misleading about this particular pictograph? And I would recommend that, again, you 
right over on the left this question your answer also pause and go back and look at the that particular pictograph see if you can figure out another thing that's misleading about it scaling of graphs another important feature to look out for is that the graph is scaled properly if you stretch or shrink, shrink the scale on the y-axis the shape of the graph may change dramatically a line that rises gently on one scale may look very steep with a different scale. Make sure that you choose the correct scale, and by correct I mean the scale that forces the graphic to show you <coughs> this, the story of the data. In other words, make sure that it represents the data well. You don't want you to force the data to tell a story, your graphic should allow the data to tell its story. It takes practice. So here's an example. Looking at this quickly really doesn't, doesn't seem like there's anything wrong here. Consider the graph below the US federal minimum wage hour rates. Unadjusted for inflation, what errors can you find in the graph? How should be, they be fixed? So the dates along the x-axis, so this is a time series plot, also known from last time as a line graph. Vertical axis is the minimum hourly wage in dollars. So as you, over time, things increase in terms of dollars, and it looks pretty awesome because your minimum hourly wage is increasing over time. So what's wrong with this? Well, the fact that in 1956 the dollar doesn't quite doesn't buy quite as much as the dollar did in 19 in 2008. So perhaps we should instead of unadjusting it, we should adjust for inflation. Notice the x-axis does not have a consistent scale. The years are as few as one apart. I didn't even notice that. My goodness. There's one apart here, there's six apart here, there's five apart, six, five, two, four, etc. So you should stretch this, shrink this so that each inch along the horizontal axis corresponds to a single uh, time limit. So maybe each of these marks should be three years instead of something. Um, so change the x-axis. Correct graph can be found in exercise 12 in the chapter 2 exercises. But that's not the only thing. Maybe you should um, adjust this for inflation. Now we're going to talk about some shapes of graphs. Basic, four basic shapes are uniform, symmetric, right skewed, and left skewed. Um, the right skewed I will frequently call positively skewed and skewed to the left I will frequently call negatively skewed simply because I have trouble with left and right. Um, the, uh, the, the name outlier is a data value that falls outside the quote normal shape of the graph or the typical shape of the graph. We've already seen outliers back in section 2.2. The District of Columbia was an outlier in terms of the, of the violent crime rate in 1990. Its little bar in the histogram was far away from the rest of them. So here's what a uniform distribution looks like. The frequency of each class is relatively the same. If you're dealing with sample data, it's unlikely that you'll get bars all the exact same height, even if the population has a uniform distribution to it. Symmetrical. Data lie evenly on both sides of the distribution, whatever that means. I want to talk about the skewed, two skews, and then come back to the symmetrical. That might make this a little bit more meaningful. Skewed to the right or positively skewed. The key for skew is to locate the tail. Um, the tail is the side where the data just keeps lingering on and on, as opposed to the, in this case, as opposed to the left side where it just kind of stops quickly. The right side it just keeps going on and on. So there's a right tail here. So this is skewed to the right or skewed positively. Skewed right because the tail's on the right. Skewed positively because the tail's on the positive side of the middle. 
contrast that with skewed to the left. Again, the data just keeps going on and on and on. It stops rather quickly here. So this is left skewed because the tail is on the left, or it's negatively skewed because it's on the negative side of the middle. With that said, symmetric data have neither a right skewed nor a left skewed. Notice here it kind of stops at about the same distance. It, it's not perfectly symmetrical in the mathematical sense. The key, and here's the key that I tell people, it's in order to, if you want to conclude that the <clears throat> data seems symmetrical, it's try to determine which side gives you the tail. If you have to stop and think a little bit about it, like at least a second, then it's symmetrical enough. We're actually going to, in the next chapter, come up with a definition of symmetrical and a way of determining if the data are, quote, symmetrical enough. But for now, just look and see, okay, are the data obviously skewed right or obviously skewed left? And if the answer to both of those is no, then it's symmetrical enough. So let's describe the overall shape of this distribution. The middle seems to be somewhere around here. It doesn't seem to have a tail on either side. I mean, if I squinted hard, I could probably figure out a tail, but because I'm not seeing any obvious tail, I'm going to say this is symmetric. Um, the average is somewhere around 80. I don't see any outliers. If there is one bar way, way over here, I'd say, yeah, there's an outlier. If there's a bar way, way over here, I'd say, yeah, there's an outlier. Um, so there's the smooth curve that they're talking about. The average seems to be about 80. Yeah, symmetric, no outliers. Red star. So the third one, how does one determine the tail of a distribution of, of a graphic? Um, go ahead and hit pause. Hopefully your answer is written in your notes so that you can later transfer them to the uh, Moodle quiz. And that's the end of this rather short chapter, or short section. It actually is the end of this chapter. Um, so make sure you keep sending me those questions, post those questions to the discussion board, and I will talk to you later. Um, take care. Hello and welcome to section 3.1 in your Hawks book. This is going to talk about measures of center. A measure of center is a single statistic that tries to summarize your entire data set. So it takes your data set, boils it down to one single value. Um, next lecture we're going to talk about how to determine the quality of that single value as a representation of your entire data set. But today we're just going to look at how to summarize your data set with one single value. And as you can imagine, that's going to depend upon what your data actually are, what level your data are. Um, so topics today, calculate the mean, median, and mode, determine the most appropriate measure of center. So we're moving on to the mean, then clearly the median, then eventually the mode. Definition of the mean is the arithmetic mean of a variable is one of the most important statistics calculated and provided because it is one of the most important statistics calculated and provided. In other words, there's nothing special about the mean above and beyond the median and the mode except for four things that I could come up with. I mean, I, I racked my brain and these are the four reasons that we should be looking at the mean. Um, Carl Friedrich Gauss thought it was important. Um, the sample mean is easily calculated. At least it's more easily calculated than the other two measures of center. Um, the sample mean can be used to calculate missing data values. That is, if you have 10 data values, you're missing one of those 10, but you have the mean, you can figure out what that missing value is. I think that might be helpful. Probably not. And the sample mean has a nice distribution, which we're going to learn in Chapter 7 when we talk about the central limit theorem. I think this last one is the best reason of all other than the fact that it's important because we've determined it's important. 
Um, you'll hear this talk again when we get to what's called the normal distribution. We'll discover that the normal distribution is entirely the most important distribution in all of statistics because it's the most important distribution in all of statistics. <clears throat> anyway, moving on, here's how you'd calculate it. Is the sample mean, um, x is just going to be a generic variable, the bar is what tells us it's the sample mean, so x bar is going to be the sum of all the x values divided by the number of x values. So this could be the first x value plus the second x value plus the third x value dot 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 plus the nth or the last x value divided by n. In other words, you add up all the data divided by the number of data values. This capital sigma, and it's actually a stylized sigma, indicates the summation. You're adding up everything to the right with a subscript of i. So you're adding up all the i, uh, x values and dividing by the sample size. Contrast this with the population mean. Okay, there's not much to contrast. The sample mean deals with the sample. The population mean deals with the population. Um, the sample mean, you've got an x bar. Population mean, you've got a mu. It's what a Greek cow says, mu. You're adding up all the values of the, va uh, of the variable in the population. You're dividing by the population size. For the sample mean, you divide by the sample size. For the population mean, you divide by the population size. Again, we're adding up all the x values divided by the population size. Nothing special. So we got an example. Uh, students from a previous stat toner class were surveyed to find out the average number of hours they sleep per night during the term. Here's a sample of their self-reported responses, 5, 6, 8, 10, 4, 6, 9. I want to calculate the mean. All we do is add them up and divide by 7. Why 7? Because there's 7 data points. So we're going to add them all up and divide by 7. By the way, 5 is x sub 1, 6 is x sub 2, 8 is x sub 3, 10 is x sub 4, 4 is x sub 5, 6 is x sub 6, 9 is x sub 7. So x sub, we're adding up all the x's where i ranges from 1 through 7 and divided by n. 48 over 7 is about 6.9, so the sample mean for the number of hours that the students reported sleeping per night during the semester is 6.9 hours. Wow, that's pretty lazy. Embed 6.9 hours every day on average? Come on. I'm kidding, by the way. Um, so here's how we do it in R. We define a variable sleep. We could call this A if we wanted to, or X if we wanted to. I'm calling it sleep because sleep has some meaning. There's the C function. It combines everything to the right into a single vector of values. And then to calculate the mean of sleep, we just calculate mean of parentheses sleep. That's it. For a small data set like this, whether or not it's easier to calculate it by hand or using R, that's up to you. But the reality is most data sets that we care about are going to be of, se of size 2, 3, 4 thousand, maybe 2, 3, 4 million. And we'll want the computer to do those calculations for us. Example 3.2. I alluded to this earlier. Let's go ahead and do it. We're going to use the mean to find a missing data value. Rutherford, who is a famous physicist, downloaded five new songs from the internet. He knows that on average, the songs cost a buck twenty-three. If four of the songs cost a buck twenty-nine each, what's the price of the fifth song he downloaded? In other words, we're missing that f the v the price of the fifth song, but we got the mean, and we got the value of all the others. Let's see if we can determine or bring back that last price. So here's the solution. We're just going to substitute in the values we know. Here's the function for the population mean. I'm substitute in the values we know. Buck 23 was the average of those five values. Four of those values were buck 29. We don't know the fifth. Doing some algebra. 
we come up with that missing song was priced at 99 cents. So the cost of Rutherford's fifth song was just 99 cents. Now this is one of the strengths and one of the weaknesses to the sample mean, or to the mean in general. It's the same thing. It equally depends on every single data point. It's an observation, that's a f feature of the formula, which could be a strength or a weakness. Here it's a strength because we're able to uh, recover a missing value. However, if that missing value were a, an outlier, it, the mean may not be representative of the data set as a whole. Sometimes we don't have the actual data, but we have summarized data. This would lead to us maybe perhaps wanting to calculate a weighted mean, or the mean of the summarized data. Um, the weighted mean, again, this will be for the sample. There's a bar on top of the variable, so this, this will be an X bar or a sample mean. These are summations. The W's represent the weights, and the X's represent the observed values. So the weighted mean is just going to be the sum of the values times the weights, added up, divided by the sum of the weights. Where might this be most important for you? A lot of your classes are going to use weighted means for determining your final grade. Here's an example. The syllabus in my discrete mathematics class states that the final grade is determined by the midterm, the homeworks, the discussions, and the final grade. Uh, sorry, final exam. Midterm counts 40% towards the final, homework 20%, discussions 10%, and final exam 30% towards the final grade. So we're weighting the midterm grade by midterm exam grade by 40%. We're weighting the homework grade by 20%, discussions by 10, final exam by 30%. So those two students in the class, Bob and Virginia, want to calculate their final grades, or in this specific instance, estimate their final grades. Below are their average grades in each of the categories for the midterm homework and discussions, and they've also guessed at what they might score in the final exam. So midterm homework and discussions, they know their grades, the final they're going to estimate. Here it is for Bob. He got an 83 in the midterm and 98 on the homework discussions. He got 90%. Fantastic. He thinks he's going to get an 87 on the final. We'll see. But he thinks he will. If these numbers are correct, then what is his final grade for the course? This is Virginia's. We'll come back to that later. Notice that Virginia did much worse on the homework and discussions. She thinks she's going to do much better on the tests. So here it is for Bob. First thing we need to do, do is determine which numbers are the values and which are the weights. Um, the grade earned in each category is weighted by the percentage for that category. So for instance, Bob's test of 83 gets a weight of 40%. So that 40% is going to be the weights, and the 83 is going to be the values. Here's a nice little table. So these are the scores that Bob got. According to the syllabus, these are the weights for each of those categories. And technically, the 87 he hasn't received yet, he thinks he's going to get it. He got an 83 on the midterm, so a good chance he'll get an 87 at least on the final. So to calculate the final grade down here, we're just going to multiply the score by the weight. We call that the contribution to the final score. Score times weight, score times weight, score times weight. Add up this last column to get his final grade. 83 times 40% is 33.2. Is 98 times 20 is 19.6. And that should add up to 87.9. So if Bob is correct and he gets an 87 on the final, he'll get an 87.9% 80 for the course, which is a B plus. If we look at this in terms of mathematics, we're adding up all the X's times the W's, dividing by the W's. Notice that the W's all add up to 1, 0.4 plus 0.2 plus 0.1 plus 0.3. This top is just each of those values in the last column, adding them up, 
gives us an 87.9. There it is for Bob. Let's look at Virginia. The X's are Virginia's grade in each category. We got the, the weights. Let's do this using R. So the weights are 40, 20, 10, 30. Virginia's actual grades are four, uh, 95, 45, 66, and she thinks she's getting a 90 on the final. She got a 95 on the midterm. There's a good chance she'll get a 90 on the final. This formula in R corresponds to the actual definition of the weighted mean. It's the sum of the values times the weights divided by the sum of the weights. The sum of the values times the weights divided by the sum of the weights. From this, we decide that we find out she'll end up with an 80.6 for her final grade. That is, after we run it, this line gives us 80.6, which is a B minus. Not bad considering she did so poorly on everything but the tests. Now, as an aside from a teaching standpoint, let's take a moment and consider the effect on her grade if her test score was low, but her homework and quiz scores were high. Would she come out with the same grade? In other words, what lessons can you draw from this with respect to your own activity in the course? Hint, hint, hint. And now an extension. Here are some additional questions that we can answer for Virginia. What's the highest grade she can earn? What's the lowest grade she can earn? And what does she need on her final to earn a 70% in the course, which is the lowest passing grade? Well, for the highest grade she can earn, it occurs when she gets 100% on the final. So you put 100% in here, you do these calculations, and the highest that she can get is a B a low B, but a B nonetheless. The lowest grade she can earn happens when you put a zero in for the final grade and discover that the lowest grade is a 53.6%, which is an F. Now the likelihood she gets a zero on the final is, is pretty low, considering she got a 95 on the midterm. So the next question is, what does she need to earn on the final in order to pass the class? 54.7% is the correct answer. How did I determine that? Well, I just kept changing this last number and rerunning this code until I got this last quantity to be 70%. We got a red star, which means we need to go to our intro lecture question. Question one. What is the largest number of means that a variable can have? Again, write the question on the left-hand side of your notes, answer it below so you can put it, put it into Moodle later. And pause, and we're back. Moving on to the median. Here's the definition of the median, the gut definition first. The median is the, quote, middle value in the sense that about half of the data is above it and about half is below it. Yeah, that's a nice gut definition. It doesn't work mathematically because of the word about. Um, so mathematically, here's the actual definition of median. Uh, the median of a set of data is a value. Notice it's a value, not the value. So it could be more than one median in a data set. A value such that at least half of the data is at least this value, greater than or equal to, and at least half the data is at most this value, less than or equal to. Kind of complicated definition. So we go back to the gut definition of, okay, it's, it's the middle value, about half's above and about half's below. If we need to calculate it, this is the mathematical definition. If we want to understand what it actually means, we use the gut definition. So here's how you actually calculate the median of a data set by hand. You list the data in ascending order, from lowest to highest. In other words, you're making an ordered array. 
If the sample size is odd, the median is the middle value in that ordered array. If it's even, then it's the mean of the two middle values in that ordered array. Note that this implies at least two things. One, the median, like the mean, may not be a value in the data set. And two, the median may only be applied to ordinal data if n is odd or if there's if the middle two values are the same uh, level. So let's calculate the median. Given the number of absences uh, for samples of students in two different classes, find the median for each sample. First step is order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven data points here, so it's going to be the middle data point after we order the data. And for B, there's eight values, so it's going to be the middle of the, the arithmetic mean of the two. So we put it in order, and it's going to be six. Six is the median. We put it in order, seven and eight are the two middle values. The mean of seven and eight is 7.5. That's the median. Again, the median, like the mean, does not have to be a possible value in the variable. Here's how we do it in R. The function is median, and all you have to do is give it the data. Not too hard. Ooh, red star. So let's move on to intro lecture question number two. What is the largest number of medians that a variable can have? Again, write it to the left in your notes, answer below, so that later you can tra uh, transpose it into Moodle. Pause, and back we are. Third one is mode. The mode is the most observed value. If you're dealing with data, it's the most observed value. If you're dealing with the population, it's the most observed value. Here's how we calculate it by hand. You just do a frequency distribution. Hmm, remember that from chapter two? A frequency distribution of the data and find the, the value that occurs most frequently. Some terminology, if there is only one value that occurs most often, it's called unimodal data, or the variable is termed unimodal. If exactly two values occur equally option, it's bimodal data, or the variable is bimodal. If it's more than two values that occur equally often, it's multimodal. However, if the data values only occur once or an equal number of times each, we say there is no mode. So here's some examples. Finding the mode for the first one, I see two sixes, but I see three sevens. So seven is the mode of A. And it, A is unimodal, because there's only one mode. For B, I don't see anything occurring more than once, so there is no mode. C, I see 7 and 2 both occurring twice, so the modes are 7 and 2, and it is bimodal. And for D, everything occurs twice, so there is no mode which is what these solutions say. Doing this in R, note that the mode is not really a helpful measure of center for most data that we deal with. Therefore, most statistical programs don't have a function for the mode. Um, I've created one for you. Um, it's called modal. That's the function, modal, and it just takes the data. However, you need to source this file before modal is an appropriate function. So run these two lines and you'll get the mode of this data set, which should be seven. Will be seven, not should be. In fact, I would recommend that this line would be one of the first that you run in every script for this course. And you'll see it more and more frequently. Example 37, let's bring it all together. Look at the mean, the median, and the mode for the data. Here's the data, eight data points. Here we calculated in R. Again, we load in this data. I'm sorry, we load in this functionality. 
here's the data, the mean, the median, and the modal of that, va uh, of that variable. Um, remember that the, the pound sign or the hashtag or the octothorpe or whatever you want to call this indicates a comment. R ignores everything to the right of it. So this is just a comment to remind me what the mean age is, what the median age is, and what the modal age is. Notice the mean is far away from the median and the mode. It's probably due to this outlier. Everything else seems to be really close to 80, except for this 42-year-old who retired. And we can see this on a graph horizontal graph. This is actually a dot plot. We got our outlier at 42 and it's an outlier because all the rest of the data is so far away from it. The mode happens here at 80 only because two people uh, retired at age 80. The median is going to be pretty stable. It's going to be really close to the middle of the data set and the mean is going to be really influenced by this outlier. Which brings us to a question of, we've got three measures of center, which one should we use? For nominal data, the mode should be used. For ordinal data, the mode should be used if it has to be. The median should be used if it can be. When can it be? It's when the either the sample size is odd or the sample size is even and the two middle values are the same. In other words, we can use the, me the median for ordinal data when there's no need to actually take an average. Because average requires at least interval level data. For numeric data, the median should be used. However, if the numeric data is sufficiently symmetric, the mean can be used. And we like to use the mean because mathematically it behaves much more nicely than the median. And really, that is the only reason we want to use the mean. Now, how do we determine if some data set is sufficiently symmetric? We use what's called the Hildebrand rule. Um, the Hildebrand ratio is defined as the difference between the mean, sample mean and the sample median divided by the sample standard deviation. And you'll talk about the standard deviation next lecture. If the size of the ratio is less than 20, less than point 20, um, the data are sufficiently, sy sufficiently symmetric. If H itself is greater than point 0.2, then it is positively skewed. If H is less than negative point 0.2, then it is negatively skewed. Um, the variable age is not sufficiently symmetric. The ratio is negative 0.312. We know that from running these three lines. And actually, if we have already run the first two lines in our R session, we just need to run the third. Since the data are not sufficiently symmetric, we should not use the mean. We should use the median as it is closer to most values, aka it's more typical of the data, than is the mean. At least that's what I'm supposed to tell you teaching introductory statistics. The reality is you should give both values and interpret both values correctly. Sample 3.8 not giving you data on these and just describing the variables. Uh, which measure of center is appropriate? T-shirt sizes, small, medium, large, extra large. Well, that's ordinal. So at least mode, if there's no, uh, no uh, need to, to take an average, then the median would be appropriate. Salaries for a professional team of baseball players, that would be median, most likely. Um, the star will be an outlier. The rest of the players will tend to be a little clump, as it was back here. The star will be 
not at the low end, it'll be at the high end, and everyone else will be clumped towards the middle. So this will be a median. C, price of homes in a subdivision of similar homes. Since the homes are similar, then everything's going to be clumped together, so the mean would most likely be correct. And professor rankings from student evaluations of best, average, and worst. That's ordinal, so it's at least a mode. Hopefully we'd be able to use a median, and we'd be able to use a median if we don't need to take a average of the middle two values. Oops. So now we're looking at graphs. A, B, and C. A is the mode. It is the most likely value. B is going to be the median because about half of the shaded area is to the left and about half is to the right. And C is going to be the mean. Notice that the mean is to the right of B because the data are right skewed. If the data were left skewed, then C would be to the left of B. So here's a summary properties of the mean, the median, and the mode. These are kind of important. They just summarize what I've talked about for the last 20 minutes. The mean is affected by outliers. The median is not affected by outliers. The mean, there is a single value. The median, there is usually a single value, the way we calculate it. Um, but by the strict definition of the median, it's a single value if n is odd and an infinite number of values if n is even. The functions are mean, median, and modal. Remember, you have to source in that extra file in order to use modal. So I guess that brings us to question three. What is the largest number of modes that a variable can have? Again, write this question on the left of your notes. Write your answer underneath of it so you can transfer that to the Moodle quiz. And pause, and we're back, and we're done. The key is not to be able to calculate these by hand. You can get the computer to do that for you. The key is much more difficult. It's to be able to interpret these values. What does it mean if the mean is 14 and the mode is 47? What does it mean if the mean is 14 and the median is 47? What does it mean if the mean, the median, and the mode are the same value? What does it mean if the mean and the median are the same value and the mode, well, there are two modes. The key here is to be able to interpret the values. And you'll hear me say this over and over again as we move forward in this course. The key is interpretation. The computer can do the calculation for you. You need to be able to interpret what the computer does. And in many ways, that's harder to do. But it makes the calculations much more useful. And so, thank you, and I will talk to you later. Hello, and welcome to section 3.2, Measures of Dispersion. The purpose of this section is clearly to determine ways of measuring the dispersion of a data set. Um, what do we mean by dispersion? We mean how spread out the data are. Hence, these are also called measures of spread. Um, we're going to look at four measures of spread in this lecture postponing the fifth one, the interquartile range, until the next. Um, so here's the gut definition of a measure of spread. It's a measure of how much we can expect a value of the data to differ from the appropriate measure of center. So because of that, that means that we've got measures of spread for the mode, we've got measures of spread for the median, we've got measures of spread for the mean, We've got lots of measures of spread, all of them trying to define this, uh, trying to measure the same thing, the spread of the data. Or we can also think of spread and dispersion as being the uncertainty in your data value. That is, if I've got a data, data set with a very small level of dispersion, you're much more certain about where that individual value is going to be 
than if you've got a very, very large disperse, largely dispersed data set where you got a value and you have no idea if it's to the left tail, to the right tail, close to the middle, a million miles away. Note that there are many, many, many measures of dispersion. How one defines spread or dispersion and what properties one wants in such a measure determine the formula that is being used. So be aware of that. I see a red star, so let's pop over to the intro lecture question number one. What is the main purpose of a measure of dispersion? aka a measure of spread. Again, I recommend writing on the left-hand side of your notebook the question, your answer underneath of that, so that when you do go into Moodle to finish this quiz, you'll have the answers right there. And of course, hit pause, and we're back. The first measure of spread, and the weakest one that we've got, is just the range. The range of your data is just the largest value minus the smallest value. So the range is a single number. It's not two numbers, it's a single number. So if we're looking at heights of students in this STAT 200 class, the range is going to be 13 inches. 13.2 inches, actually. Um, so a single number. The difference between the highest value and the lowest value. That's it. Um, since it's based on two specific values, the range is going to be very unstable. That is, if I send three people out to draw a sample from the same population, you're going to get different samples, by the way, then the ranges have a very strong chance of varying quite drastically between the two samples. That's what I mean by unstable, or it's not robust. A much better measure of dispersion is called the variance. Um, yeah. This one is for the population variance. Uh, the population variance is the average squared distance of the population values from the mean. So I've got my cursor, so xi is a data value or a value in the population. Mu, recall, is the population mean. Capital N, recall, is the population size. And we're going to call sigma squared the population variance. That will be the symbol for the population variance. And what we're doing is just adding up every value in the population minus the mean. We're going to square that, add them all up, and divide by the uh, population size. Similar to the population variance is the sample variance. This is the one that's actually going to be useful for us. Notice that the formula looks exactly the same except for to three parts. Let's call it three parts. Part one is the symbol for sample variance is an S squared. For the population variance, it was sigma squared. Recall that population parameters tend to be Greek letters and sample parameters tend to be Latin letters. So it's sig uh, S squared for the sample variance, sigma squared for the population variance. That's one difference. Second difference is you're subtracting off X bar, which is the sample mean. For the population variance, you're subtracting off mu, the population mean. Here we're subtracting off x bar, the sample mean. And two, instead of dividing by n, we're dividing by n minus 1. And we'll explain why a little bit later. Um, so again, it's each data value minus the mean of the data squared, added up, divided by n minus 1. And that will give you the sample variance. So let's calculate some variances. Very small, simple toy data set here. So let's assume the data represent the actual weight changes for a sample of fitness club members. So for A, we're going to calculate the sample variance. And for B, assume that the data represent the actual weight changes of every member. So for B, we're going to calculate the population variance of these five values. So again, notice the numbers are meaningless unless you add context to them. Does 3, 2, 5, 6, 4, is that the sample or is that the population? You need to know. By the way, in this class, unless stated otherwise, that's going to be a sample. So let's do the calculations. Here's the, function, uh, here's the formula for the sample variance. We've got the values x sub i, which are just the 3, 2, 5, 6, 4. X bar is going to be 4 because the sample mean of 3, 2, 5, 6, 4 is 4. N is 5. 
which means that n minus 1 is going to be 4. So all we have to do is take each of those x values, subtract off 4, square it, add them all together, and then divide by 4. And that's what we're doing here. Data values, the deviations, which is the data value minus the sample mean. Notice if we add up the deviations, we get 0, which is a good thing. The squared deviations, the xi minus the x bar, yeah, the bar is there somewhere, squared. Notice if we add these up, we don't get 0. And now if we add these up, 1, 4, 1, 4, 0 gives us 10. And now all we have to do is divide by little n minus 1. 10 divided by 5 minus 1 is 2.5, so the sample variance is 2.5. We can do this in R. For a sample of size 5, you may not need to, because it's very straightforward putting this table together and doing all the calculations. <clears throat> but once we get into sample sizes of 50, 100, 10,000, you're going to want to be able to do this on a computer. The function to calculate the sample variance is var, V-A-R, V-A-R for variance. First line, we define a, a variable called weight. We're going to put inside of weight five values, a 3, a 2, a 5, a 6, and a 4. Notice you've got the little c to combine all of these values into one variable. And then we calculate the variance of weight. That's it. So now b, remember, was for a population variance. We can do this the long way we would essentially just end up dividing by n, 5, instead of n minus 1. Or we can do this on a computer. For a sample of size 5, and eh, not a big deal. For a sample of size 5,000, that is a big deal. So again, here's our data. To calculate the population variance, you could do the sample variance times 4 over 5. n minus 1 over n. Why n minus 1 over n? Well, let's go back to the formulas. There we go. We want to calculate this number. We've got this number. Notice the difference is the denominator. So we're going to multiply this number, the sample variance, by n minus 1 here. It'll cancel out the n minus 1's. n minus 1 over capital N. So what you'll be left with is just the sum of the xi minus the mean squared over capital N. So 4 over 5. If you're going to calculate population variance a lot, you may want to create a function for it. This is the first place that we see the extensibility of R. We'll create a function called varpop, the variance of the population, I guess. Uh, we're going to set it equal to this keyword called function. We're going to give it just one variable, x, that'll be the data. That's a brace, an open brace, and that's a closed brace down here. And then the actual calculation is just x minus the mean of the x's squared, and the average of those. It's the average because you're dividing by the number, capital N. And you would use it as var pop of weights you would have to create this function in every script that you need the population variance in. The thing is, we rarely have the entire population. We tend to deal with just the sample populations, hence the var is the sample variance. So here's the big question, where does the formula actually come from? What does it tell us? What does it do for us? So we can think of variance as an average distance that the values in a set lie from the mean. Maybe they lay from the mean. I think they lie from the mean. So it's, while it's not an actual average, when we're thinking of the sample uh, variance here, um, the variance is usually very close to the average. And conceptually, it's a good way to think about what this variance is actually calculating. Um, so on your notes, I'm sure you got the, the variance formula there. So to derive this formula for variance, we're going to use a method similar to finding average distances or squared deviations from the mean. So first we must know the actual deviation from the mean. Well, that's just xi minus x bar. That's a deviation. That's how far that individual value is from the mean. And then we're going to square those to get a distance. 
or technically a squared distance. And then we're going to find the average of all of those. How do you find an average? Well, you add them up, divide by the uh, sample size. Well, we're not entirely dividing by the sample size, we're dividing by the sample size minus 1. But essentially, this is just the deviances squared, so it's a squared distance. And this part will just be an average squared distance from the data point to the mean. So y n minus 1, and this is pretty important, the fundamental purpose of sample statistics is to estimate a population parameter. So the n minus 1 is there so that s squared is a good estimator of sigma squared. Now, that's the reason for n minus 1. And then mathematics is the other reason for that. Um, laboratory activity d, d as in dog, looks at estimators and what makes a good estimator and what do we mean by good estimator. And at that point, you'll see, oh yeah, unbiased estimators are, all things equal, are good things. And dividing by n minus 1 gives us an unbiased estimator of sigma squared. The standard deviation is closely related to the variance. Standard deviation is also a measure of how much we might expect a typical member of the data to differ from the mean. Um, in words, the definition seems very, very similar. In fact, it's probably exactly the same. I like to copy and paste things. The only difference is the formula and what we mean by how much we might expect it to differ. Sigma squared is the variance. Sigma is the standard deviation. Those are for the population, by the way. So the population standard deviation is just the square root of the population variance. And the sample standard deviation is equal to the square root of the sample variance. So the big question comes up, if the sample standard deviation, the sample variance, or the, the population standard deviation and the population variance really tell us the same information, why are we, <coughs> pardon me, why are we introducing the standard deviation? And the reason is the units of the standard deviation are going to be exactly the same as the units of your data. So if your data are inches, your standard deviation units are going to be inches. If your data are years, your standard deviation data, uh, standard deviation units will be years. For the variance, it'll be the square of that unit, which is much more difficult to see on a histogram. I can see things that are in the same units of the data, because the histogram is in the units of the data. But seeing it in terms of the square, that's much more difficult to see. Thus, standard deviation is much more interpretable and should be used in all of your papers instead of the variance. Which brings up a related question. Why do we cover the variance first? The reason we cover the variance first is because it's much more intuitive as to what it's trying to measure. The square rooting of the variance just brings the, ver uh, the, the uh, units down into what we're used to. Also, mathematicians love to use a variance because variances add. Standard deviations do not add. So mathematicians like the variance. Everybody else on the face of this planet love the standard deviations. Ooh, we got a red star. So question two. Why should one report the standard deviation instead of the variance? Again, write the question on the left-hand side, answer it underneath. Go ahead and pause, and we're back. So let's calculate the standard deviation. So let's find the stand sample standard deviation with the data shown below. <laughs> I challenge you to do <coughs> to do this by hand. Here it is in R. Just take the data, wrap it in a C function, send it to the variable. Since there's no context to what these numbers actually mean, we'll just say x is equal to those values. And then the function to calculate the sample standard deviation is just SD. That's it. If you need to calculate the population standard deviation, we're going to have to go back to the function you created, varpop 
calculate the population variance and then take the square root of that. SQRT is the square root function. But again, statisticians rarely calculate population parameters. They estimate them, but they estimate them with the sample statistics. Hence, SD is the sample standard deviation and VAR, V-A-R, is the sample variance. Here's a use, or I guess we're going to say it's an application of the standard deviation. Um, financial people love to use variance and standard deviation because they indicate risk of an investment. So we're looking into investing a portion of recent bonus into the stock market. I guess Mark's doing it, we're not. While researching different companies, he discovers the following standard deviations of one year of daily stock closing prices. Pro facto, the standard deviation is $1.2. Yardsmith, it's $9.67. In other words, the standard deviation of Yardsmith is much larger than that of pro facto. So all things being equal, there is much more variability in Yardsmith than there is in pro facto. So if you want a nice, stable stock investment, you'll go with pro facto instead of Yardsmith, which is what the solution says. Hence, stable. Note that looking at standard deviations is just one component of evaluating market prices or, use, or plans or things like that. Another measure of spread is called the coefficient of variation. The coefficient of variation is just the standard deviation divided by the mean times 100%. If you're looking at the population coefficient of variation, it'll be sigma over mu. If you're looking at the sample coefficient of variation, it'll be s over x bar. Why do we introduce yet another coefficient of variation? It's because the coefficient of variation is used compared to dispersions for two variables. Hence, our previous example, which I don't want to say in front of anyone from Hawks, this is completely useless. Because if pro facto has a standard deviation of $1.2, but it trades at a dollar, well, that's an incredible change, or an incredible width of it. Whereas Yardsmith, it's 967, but if it's trading at $1,000 a share, that's really not much of a variation. So while we do like to look at the standard deviation as being a measure of risk, really it should be the coefficient of variation. Which this gets to, example 314, we got two graphs, and we're trying to figure out which has the greater standard deviation relative to its mean, in other words, which has a greater coefficient of variation. If we ignore the bottom numbers, which of these two graphics is more spread out? And it's very clear that the price of U.S. farmland is much more variable, if we ignore the bottom numbers, much more variable than is the annual average rainfall. And that's what the coefficient of variation really does. It ignores the bottom numbers and just looks at the shape of the graphs or quantifies how spread out the graph is. We can do the actual calculations, find out the coefficient of variation for data set A is 28.9% and for B it's 36.7%. That really doesn't surprise us because we just decided that B is much more spread out than A is. And that's what, again, that's what the coefficient of variation is measuring. It's how spread out is the data if we ignore the actual values at the bottom. And dividing by that x bar allows us to ignore those values at the bottom. So those are measures of, of, of spread or measures of dispersion. Um, the last two topics for this section really don't sit well with that, that idea of measures of center, measures of spread. They really probably should be on their own section, but this is where Hawks is putting it, and between the two of us, it's good as place as any to put them. We're going to look at the empirical rule and Chebyshev's theorem. Um, the empirical rule says that when the data follow a bell-shaped distribution, an interesting pattern emerges in the data values. About 68% of the data is within one standard deviation of the mean, that is, about 68% is between the values of mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. About 95% is within two standard deviations of the mean, that is, 
about 95% is between mu minus 2 sigma and mu plus 2 sigma. And almost all of it, 99.7%, is within three standard deviations of the mean. And that's all the empirical rule says. Notice it's when the data follow a bell-shaped distribution, these are good estimates. If the data do not follow a bell-shaped distribution, these are not necessarily good estimates. In fact, they tend to be pretty poor. So if the data follow a nice little bell shape here, then 6 to 8% is within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% is within two, 99.7% is within three, and almost all is within four. So here's an application of it. Distribution of weights of newborn babies is bell shaped with a mean of 3,000 grams. Wow, those are heavy babies. 3,000 grams, and a standard deviation of 500 grams. So we know that 68% of the babies are between 3,000 minus 500 and 3,000 plus 500. 95% is within 3,000 minus 2 times 500 and 3,000 plus 2 times 500. And 99.7% is within 3,000 minus 3 times 500 and 3,000 plus 3 times 500. So what the empirical rule says. A, what percentage of the newborn babies weigh between 2,000 and 4,000 grams? That's 95%, because 2,000 is two standard deviations below 3,000, and 4,000 is two standard deviations above it. So it's within two standard deviations of 3,000. What percentage of newborn babies weigh less than 3,500 grams? That one's not going to be so easy. We do know that 68% are between 2,500 and 500. I'm sorry, 2,500 and 3,500, which tells us that 34% is between 3,000 and 3,500. We also know that half is less than 3,000, so we can use that calculation to get the answer. And we can calculate the range of birth rates that would contain the middle 68%, so it's between 2,500 and 3,500. Now here it is written out. Since we know the distribution of the data is bell-shaped, we can apply the empirical rule. We need to know how many standard deviations 2,000 grams and 4,000 grams are from the mean. Here are the calculations. It's 2 below to 2 above. According to the empirical rule, approximately 95% of the values lie within 2 standard deviations of the mean, so it's 95%. B takes a little bit more work. How many standard deviations of weight of 3,500 is away from the mean? Well, that's one above. So it's one standard deviation above the mean. It says that 68% of the data values lie within one standard deviation of the mean. That means that 34% lie between the mean and one above. And half is below 3,000 because it's a bell-shaped curve, it's symmetric, so the mean and the median are the same. So if the mean is 3,000, then half will be less than or equal to 3,000. So the 34 and the 50 add together to give us 84% of the newborn babies weigh less than 3,500 grams. Here's a picture of it. 2,500 to 3,500 contains 68%. Since it's symmetric, that means between 3,000 and 3,500, we've got 34%. And it's a symmetric distribution, so half of the data is less than 3,000. So the part that's not yellow is just 50% plus 34%, which gave us the 84%. And then C, also an easy calculation. We know 6 to 8% of the data lie within one standard deviation of the mean. That's between 2,500 and 3,500. And the last topic is Chebyshev's theorem. Whereas the empirical rule is a nice rule of thumb if the data come from a bell-shaped distribution, it gets you really good estimates. Chebyshev's theorem is a mathematical theorem that is always correct. It's not always helpful, but it's always correct. And the theorem statement is the proportion of data that lie within k standard deviations of the mean is at least 1 minus 1 over k squared. And k's got to be greater than 1. 
So if k is 2, then within two standard deviations, the mean is at least 3 fourths. Could be more than that. Could be a lot more than that. But it's at least 3 fourths. And the proportion of the data within three standard deviations of the mean, set k equal to 3, is about 89%. So at least 89% of the data is within three standard deviations of the mean. Could be a lot more than that. Could be just 88.889%. So Chebyshev's always works, but it doesn't necessarily give us a good estimate. Empirical rule doesn't always work, but when it does is applied to bell-shaped data, it does give us a good estimate. So here we'll apply Chebyshev's theorem Suppose that in one small town, the average household income is $34,200, with a standard deviation of $2,200. What percentage of households earn between $27,600 and $40,800? Well, we just have to figure out how many standard devi deviations be below the mean are $27,600, and how many above the mean are $40,800. That will tell us what the value of k is. And then we use Chebyshev's theorem to determine the minimum or the at least as much. So 6,600 is the distance. We know that the standard deviation is 2,200, so that's a negative 3. So 27,600 is three standard deviations below the mean. Similarly, 40,800 is three standard deviations above the mean. Thus, k is three, and we know that at least 88.9% of the data is within those bounds. Could be a lot more. Can't be less. It absolutely cannot be less than 88.9%. So now let's compare the empirical rule and Chebyshev. Here the difference is Chebyshev's theorem always works, that is, it's always correct. An empirical rule requires that the distribution is bell-shaped. The empirical rule tends to give better estimates than does Chebyshev's theorem. Chebyshev just gives a lower bound. The empirical rule tries to estimate the actual proportion. It's going to be off if the data is not bell-shaped, but if the data are bell-shaped, it's going to be a really good estimate, especially compared to Chebyshev's theorem. And while Chebyshev's theorem always works, it only serves as a lower bound, hence the at leasts in the theorem statements. And we got a red star, so let's move on to question three. Which is more helpful, the empirical rule or Chebyshev's theorem? Again, left-hand side of your notes, answer it in your notes so that you can eventually put it into the Moodle quiz. Uh, go ahead and pause, and I'm back. And that's it for this chapter. I'm sorry, that's it for this section. Uh, measures of dispersion. As we move forward in this class, the measure of dispersion that's going to be most useful for statisticians, for some odd reason, is the variance or the standard deviation. Um, that's just how it is. The range, note, we just got one small page dedicated to it, then we kind of left it. You can go ahead and ignore the range. It's not helpful at all. Um, empirical rule we're going to see pop up again in chapters 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So you may want to spend a little bit of time learning the empirical rule. Uh, Chebyshev, we're not going to see it again after this chapter. So, well, except on, the, nah, we won't see it again on the chapter. So, now you know the most important things from this section. But again, I want you to focus on how to get the computer to calculate these and how to interpret them. I also want you to figure out why measures of spread are important, especially if we talked about measures of center last lecture. How do those two relate? How are they different? Why would one be more useful than the other? Those are important questions to answer in any class, but especially in statistics. So that's it. I wish you a good day.
Hello and welcome to section 3.3, Measures of Relative Position. In some ways this should be section 2.2 and the measures of spread would be section 3.3 because measures of relative position are measures of some point in your data or in your distribution. Very similar to section 3.1 where we talked about a point in your data or in your distribution but the point for section 3.1 was the mean, the median, or the mode. Here it's going to be some other point within your data. Um, and so if topics from a set of data you're going to be able to calculate percentiles. Sometimes these are called quantiles, Q-U-A-N-T-I-L-E-S. Two, you're going to be able to calculate the quartiles. Uh, then the five number summary, which is just all the quartiles together. Uh, calculate the interquartile range, the IQR, which is also a measure of spread. So that kind of ties into the last lecture. We're going to be able to create a box plot and calculate some z-scores. And that z-scores may not sound too interesting now, but those z-scores will pop up again in chapters 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Without z-scores, without understanding what z-scores do, we kind of lose a lot of this second half of the course. Okay, so we'll start with percentiles. Definition of percentile is those hundred divisions. In order to calculate a value's relative position, we can divide the data into equal parts and state in which part the value lies. That kind of underscores all of these measures of relative position. We may choose to divide the data up into any number of parts. For percentiles, we're dividing the data up into a hundred parts. Hundred cent. And those divisions, when you divide up into a hundred parts, is called a percentile. Here's how you calculate percentiles. You're going to locate the data value for the pth percentile, so you're going to be given the percentile, such as the 45th percentile, the 97th percentile, the 1.758th percentile. Those values are going to be the p. N will be the sample size, and this, believe it or not, is a lowercase l. L for location. And this is the formula to calculate the location. Notice it's the location, not the data value. So it's the location is just the sample size times the uh, percentile over 100. Well, that percentile over 100 is just the proportion of the way through the data. So it kind of makes sense that this would be a location spot. Um, did I miss something? Nope. So when using the formula to find the location for the percentile's value in the data set, you must make sure of the following two rules. Um, if the formula results in a decimal value for L, the location is the next larger whole number. If the formula results in a whole number, then the percentile's value is the arithmetic mean of the data value that is located at that location and at the next larger. Hmm, this kind of sounds vaguely like how we calculate the median, which shouldn't surprise us because the median we're going to find out is the 50th percentile. So here's an example to see how to do this. Car manufacturers studying the highway MPG for a wide range of makes and models of vehicles. Standard leaf plots given in the next slides. There's a lot of it. There's 135 data points. We need to find the 10th percentile and the 20th percentile. So here's the data. Here's the second page of the data. Um, so we got one vehicle gets 12.1 one mile per gallon, another vehicle gets 13.3, another is 14.1, then 15.5, and 15.6. So that's what the stem and leaf plot tells us. So here's the solution. First, we need to um, n notice that the data are in an ordered array. That is, the lowest is 12.1 mile per gallon, and the highest is 35.9 miles per gallon. There are 135 values, so n is 135. We want to calculate the 10th percentile, so p is 10. Substituting in the values, we get l is equal to 13.5. Notice 13.5 is not a whole number. Therefore, the next larger, we round that up to 14, and so the data point that is at position 14 will be the 10th percentile. And that data value is 17.3. So let's go back to the data to see that one more time. The 14th data value, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 17.3 is the 14th value. 
Therefore, 17.3 is the 10th percentile. In other words, approximately 10% of the values in the data set are less than or equal to 17.3. More importantly, if we gathered an infinite amount of data, 10% of the data values would be less than or equal to about 17.3. For B, we're looking at the 20th percentile. We still have n is equal to 135. Now we're given p is equal to 20 because it's the 20th percentile. We got 27 as value for L. This is a whole number. Therefore, we average the 27th and the 28th data values. Let's go back to the data. 27th and 28th data values. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27th is 19.2, 28th is 19.3, therefore the 20th percentile would be the arithmetic mean of those two, or 19.25. So approximately 20% of the values in the data set are less than or equal to 19.25. And now we need to figure out a way of calculating the percentile of a given data value. So now we're given the data value, and we need to determine its percentile. So for instance, we're given 18.9 miles per gallon. We need to determine which percentile that corresponds to. It just inverts the previous, uh, uh, previous equation. L is the location of that data value n is the sample size, so L over n is actually the proportion of the way through the data that holds that value. Multiply by 100, that's the percent of the way through the data that holds the value, and by gosh, that's the percentile, p. So if the data from the previous example, the Nissan Xterra averaged 21.1 miles per gallon, what is its percentile? Well, here we go. We've got to figure out what position 21.1 miles per gallon is in the data set. So let's scroll back. 21.1 is way down here, or way up here. I'm not going to count that, but I'll let you count it. Happens to be the 49th value. So the value of 21.1 miles per gallon is 49 out of 135 of the way through the data. 49 out of 135 is 0.36, multiply that by 100. So that 21.1 is about 36, is about the 20, ah, 30, is about the 36th percentile. Approximately 36% of the data values are less than or equal to. That is, the value 21.1 miles per gallon is in the 36th percentile of the data set. Ooh, we got a red star. Here we go. This will be the intra lecture question, the first one of this lecture. Question one, what is the percentile? Again, write the question on your notebook, answer it so that you can transfer the, that question and answer or just that answer to Moodle for the lecture quiz. Pause, and we're back. Now we're going to look at quartiles. Recall that the percentiles divide the data up into a hundred, whereas the quartiles are going to divide it up into fourths. Four for quart. The first quartile is about 25% of the data is less than or equal to it. Second is 50% is less than or equal. Third quartile is three quarters, or 75% of the data is less than or equal to. In other words, the first quartile is the 25th percentile. The second quartile is the 50th percentile and the third quartile is the 75th percentile. Also recall that the second quartile, which is also the 50th percentile, is also the median. Here's a couple ways of calculating, or shall I say estimating, the quartiles. We're going to use a percentile method, which we just got through doing a couple examples on the percentile. We're going to use the approximation method, in this way. Approximation method is you find the median, drop the median, you find the median of the lower half to get Q1, median of the upper half to get Q3. And look at how these values compare. For a large data set, 
the values are going to be very close. We already know the data are in order from smallest to largest, and we already know that n is 135. Here's the data set. So using the percentile method, we want to find the 25th percentile. So p is 25. We do these calculations to find that the location is 33.75. Because that is not a whole number, we just look at the 34th value, which is 19.8 miles per gallon. That will be the first quartile, which is identical to the 25th percentile. Second quartile is the median or the 50th percentile, thus n is equal to 135, p is equal to 50. That brings us to 67.5, round that up to 68. The median will be the 68th value, which is 23.6. The third quartile is to the 75th percentile, so p is 75, crack, uh, put it into the formula. 101 rounded up to 102, so it'll be the 102nd value, which is 25.3. So the third quartile is 25.3. We can also do the approximation method, divide the data in half. We get the 68th position, which is the median, is 23.6. Calculated that many times. So the second quartile is 23.6. First quartile is going to be the median of the lower half, which comes out to be 19.8. And the third quartile is the median of the upper half, which is 25.3. They look, they're very, very close. And for large data sets, they are going to tend to be close. And remember all the times I've said it's approximately this, or about a certain percent of the data is less than or equal to. When you've got data, you, the best you can do is just approximates or about. If you've got the entire population, you can get exact. Next example, find the quartiles of a data set. So we got two data sets. We've got data set A and data set B. We can use the approximation method. There's the quartile. I, I'm sorry, there's the median, second quartile, 70.5. Q1 and Q3 can be estimated, 65 and 78. So 3 of the 5 number summary is going to be 65, 70.5, 70 and 78. Using this second set of data, can we start with the median, go through the exact same calculations to get estimated values? So three of the five numbers for the B data set are 67, 75, and 79. Of course, we can use R to do these rather quickly, give it the data, do summary of that data set, and this will give you the first and third quartiles. It'll give you the median. It also gives you the min and the max, which are the other two numbers in the five number summary, and it will also give you a mean. Know that these values are not the same as those received when the approximation method is used. So which is correct? They both are. Because remember, medians don't have to be unique. And that extends to all the quartiles and percentiles. They don't have to be unique. Oops, red star. Question two, again, write this over on the left-hand side, answer it beneath. How do percentiles and quartiles differ? Hit pause, and we're back. Five number summary and box plots. Five number summary consists of the five quartiles, the minimum value, which is Q0, first quartile, which is Q1, second quartile, which is Q2, third quartile, Q3, and the maximum, which is Q4. Five number summary is made up of these five numbers listed in order from smallest to largest. Why do we need the five number summary? Well, it gives us a good feel for the distribution of the data. So write the five number summary for the data in example 3.2. We've done, we've calculated the quartiles already. All we have to do is figure out what the minimum, 12.1, and the maximum, 35.9, values are. And there's our five number summary. Minimum, 
Q1, Q2, Q3, maximum. We are going to illustrate the five number summary using a box plot. Technically it's called a box and whiskers plot. A box and whiskers plot, in this case it's a horizontal box and whiskers plot, it looks like this. It specifies what the minimum value and the maximum values are. Those are the endpoints of the whiskers. And the box endpoints are Q1 and Q3. And the median is indicated by a thick line inside that box. The range between Q1 and Q3 is called the interquartile range. It's just Q3 minus Q1. It's a single number. About half the data occurs inside the box. About a quarter of the data occurs above the box, and about a quarter occurs below. And this is what I just said. Here's the actual formula for the interquartile range. It's Q3 minus Q1. Here's how we create the box plot. We're going to begin with the five number summary. We're going to determine a nice little scale horizontal axis that fits all those values nicely. We're now going to mark those five numbers on the, on the graphic the minimum, Q1, Q2, Q3, the maximum. We're going to draw the box in Q1 to Q3, a thick horizontal, a vertical line at the median, and then we show the whiskers going out for the box to the min and the max. We can do this in R with the box plot command, load in the data, and just apply box plot to the data. If you want something that looks like this graphic, um, you have to specify horizontal equals true. A vertical box plot is the default. And the color is orange. COL for color. And that will color the box. It's a lot faster and a lot more accurate than doing it by hand. We're going to interpret box plots now. We have four sub-basins. We got the Upper Mississippi, the Ohio Tennessee, the Missouri, and the Arkansas Red River subbasins. Notice this is not a typical box plot because the top whisker and the bottom whisker are at 90th percentile and the 10th percentile, which we see over here. We also see the mean as a dot that will help us see the skew of the data set. So for instance, Missouri seems to be skewed up because the mean is above the median. The Upper Mississippi and the Ohio Tennessee seem to be rather symmetric, and the Arkansas Red River seems to be skewed up as well. So here are the questions. What did the top and bottom bars represent in these box plots according to the key? They represent the 90th and the 10th percentiles. Which subbasin had the highest median average Highest median average, the median is the solid horizontal line, so it looks like it's the Missouri. Which subbasin had the lowest average spring? Lowest average. So it looks like the lowest average is going to be the Ohio, Tennessee. If we're looking at the average, it looks like that's going to be less than the lower than the Arkansas Red River. If we're looking at the medians, however, the Arkansas Red River is definitely below the Ohio Tennessee. And which subbasin had the largest interquartile range? In other words, which subbasin had the largest spread to the data? That's clearly the Missouri, because the box is the largest of all the other th three. Last topic today is our z-scores, or our standard scores. When We can compare two data values from two completely different populations by comparing their relative or their respective percentiles. We can also determine how the values relate to the respective means of their data sets. Z-scores do this latter. Um, it's called the standard score, or the z-score. Again, we are going to see the z-score pop up in chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 
A standard score tells us how far a value is from the mean, specifically how many standard deviations it is from the mean. The formula for the population standard score, that is if you are given the population mean and standard deviation, it's just the value you have minus the population mean divided by the population standard deviation. For the sample standard score, it's x minus x bar, the sample mean divided by s, which is the sample standard deviation. So it's always x minus a mean divided by a standard deviation. Example, mean score in the math section of the SAT test is 500 with a standard deviation of 150. What is the standard score for a student who scored 630? So 630 is x, 500 is mu, and 150 is sigma. So the z is just going to be 630 minus 500 divided by 150. So a person who scored 500 on the SAT, no, I'm sorry, a person who scored 630 on an SAT has a z-score of 0.87. In other words, this student's test score is about 0.87 standard deviations above the mean. Jody scored an 87 on her calculus test and was bragging to her best friend about how well she'd done. Poor Jody. She said that her class had a mean of 80 and a standard deviation of 5. Therefore, she had done better than the class average, which is true. Jody got an 87, though the average was 80, so definitely above. Her best friend Ashley was disappointed. She'd scored only an 82 on her calculus test. However, the mean for her class was 73, with a standard deviation of 6. So, who really did better on her test? Jody or Ashley? And we're going to do this compared to the rest of the class. So Jody's z-score is 87 minus 80 divided by 5, and Ashley's will be 82 minus 73 divided by 6. So for Jody it's 1.4, for Ashley it's 1.5, Thus, compared to everyone else in the class, Ashley actually did better. Compared to everybody else in the class, Ashley actually did better. Ashley's score was actually 1.5 standard deviations above average, whereas Jody's score was only 1.4 standard deviations above average. And here we are calculating z-scores using r. Let's go back to the a. Let's calculate the z-score corresponding to our first value. Now there is no z-score function native to R, but sourcing this file will give us one. We just give it the data and we specify z-score of the data and then in brackets which data value do you want to get the z-score for. If we want to get the first z-score we put a 1 in brackets. If we leave the brackets off completely and just have z-score of A, then we get all the z-scores. The output for this tells us that the first value has a z-score of negative 1.47196. Thus, it is about 1.47 standard deviations below average. About one and a half standard deviations below average. Below because the z-score is negative. Below, below average because all z-scores are done with respect to average. If the z-score is zero, then that person scored average. Yeah, there's one more question. Question three. I must have missed the red star. Again, write the question in your notes on the left, answer it below. When should one use a box plot instead of a histogram? This one's going to take you some, some thought. Think about what the histogram tells you. Think about what the box plot tells you. Think about the examples that we gave in this, in this lecture for box plots. Spend some time, this is the last part of this lecture by the way, spend some time thinking about the strengths of histograms, the strengths of box plots. And now, when should a box plot be used instead of a histogram? Go ahead and hit pause, but we are done. And so that's the end of chapter 3.
Colin chapter 3, we're now summarizing our data using numbers. In chapter 2, we summarized our data using graphics. Chapter 3, it's using numbers. And we had some several we had several important numbers that we looked at. The mean, the median, the mode, standard deviation, the interquartile range. We also looked at measures of position, the z-score. Don't forget the empirical rule and Chebyshev's theorem although you could forget Chebyshev's theorem and life would go on. The empirical rule is actually very important, as is the z-score. Understanding both of those will help us when we get to chapter 7. And that's it. Hopefully this was helpful. If not, drop me a line. Hello and welcome to section 4.1. This will be the first section of the chapter 4. purpose of chapter 4 is to introduce you to probability theory. The vast majority of chapter 4 is going to be review. Um, it's going to be a review of stuff that you learned back in middle school and high school. Um, there are no intra-lecture questions posted. However, there are quizzes in Moodle. Um, so the answers for the Moodle quizzes for each of these chapter four sections will be not in the lecture. Got it? You write not in the lecture for each of those, you get full credit. If you don't write it, you don't get full credit. So the objectives for section 4.1, identify the sample space of a probability event, calculate basic probabilities, determine if two events are mutually exclusive, and determine if two events are independent. Um, mutually exclusive and independent are two things that you're going to be, need to be very careful of. It, there's a lot of confusion between the two. If two events are mutually exclusive, then both cannot happen at the same time. If two events are independent, then having one happen doesn't affect the other. So here's some terminology. A probability experiment or a trial is a process with a result determined by chance, such as flipping a coin. Each individual result that is possible for a probability experiment is an outcome. Um, so there are two outcomes for the coin flipping. Outcome one is a head, outcome two is a tail. The sample space is the set of all possible outcomes for any given probability experiment. Therefore, the sample space is heads and tails, or heads, comma, tails. An event is a subset of outcomes from a sample space. So an event could be just head. An event could be just tail. An event could be head or tail. Or an event here could be none of the above. Examples of probability experiments include flipping a coin, tossing a pair of die, drawing a raffle ticket. Those are the basics. In each of these examples, there is more than one possible result, and the result is determined at random. Example 4.1. Consider an experiment in which a coin is tossed, and then a six-sided die is rolled. So A, we need to list the outcomes of the sample space for the experiment. See, coin toss, then six-sided die is rolled, okay? Uh, list the outcomes in the event, tossing a tail, then rolling an odd number. Okay, so here are the solutions. A, each outcome consists of a coin toss and a die roll. For example, you can get a head and then a three. We're going to denote a head followed by a three as H3. Using this notation, we've got 12 outcomes, 12 possible outcomes. And the set of those 12 possible outcomes is going to be the sample space. You can get a head and then a 1, a head and then a 2, a head then a 3, dot dot dot, a tail then a 5, then a tail and a 6. It's 2 times 6 possible outcomes. Um, so the sample space is just those 12 possible outcomes. So B, we're going to choose the members of the sample space that fit the event, quote, tossing a tail, then rolling an odd number. Tossing a tail and then rolling an odd number. There's only three odd numbers, one, three, and five. So the three possible outcomes of this sample space are T1, T3, T5. Next example, let's consider the experiment in which a red six-sided die and a blue six-sided die are rolled together. Use a pattern to help list the outcomes in the sample space. 
calculates the outcomes of the event. The sum of the numbers rolled on the two dice equals 6. Okay, many patterns that we could use. This is one that they're looking at. Why would we use a quote pattern here instead of listing all of them out? There's 36 possible outcomes. 6 for the first, 6 for the second, 6 times 6 gives us 36. Then we'd have to list out 36 outcomes for the entire sample space. Here, we can just give a pattern for what they're going to be. Or we can list them all out if we look if we'd like to have these drawings. Notice the sample space is one and one, two and one, three and one, four and one, five and one, six and one, etc. If all we care about is the sum of the uh, numbers that come up, then the sample space would be two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Because two through twelve is the sums. Now keep the sample space in mind. Note that rolling a one on the red die and a two on the blue die is different than rolling a two and a one if we care about the actual outcomes. However, if we care about just the sum, then those two are going to be identical outcomes. Part B, we're going to list the outcomes of the event, quote, the sum of the numbers rolled on the two dice equals six. So we're going to go back and look to see there's one here, five, one, four, two, three, three, two, four, one, five. Those all give us a sum of six. So we could actually say the probability of getting a six when rolling two dice is six, one, two, three, four, five, sorry, it's five, one, two, three, four, five, five out of 36. A tree diagram can be used to represent the outcomes of an experiment, especially in the early phases when you're just trying to learn why it's six times six instead of six plus six. Um, the tree begins with the possible outcomes of the first stage and then branches for each additional pro possibility. We're going to see t tree diagrams in the future, so it would be good to be able to write these out eventually. The number of possibilities in the bottom row of the tree is equal to the number of outcomes in the sample space. So let's consider a family with three children. Use a tree diagram to find the sample space for the gender of each child in regard to birth order. So again, ordering here does matter. We're doing it oldest, middle, youngest. So here it is. The first child can either be a girl or a boy. Second can be girl, boy, or girl and boy. And then girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy. So the bottom here, GGG, would indicate that all three children were girls. GGB would be a girl, girl, followed by a boy. GBG would be a girl, then a boy, then a girl. Notice that this looks like a tree, especially if you turn it upside down. And so using this tree diagram as a guide, we can see that there's going to be eight outcomes. Two times two times two three children, so two to the power of three. And now let's look at three methods for calculating the probability of an outcome. Um, this is also usually thought of in terms of three ways of understanding probability. Um, they're subjective, the experimental, and there's classical. What we've used so far is classical. What the course is going to be using in the future will be mostly experimental. Sometimes it's called frequency probability, or sometimes relative frequency probability. Um, in a future course, subjective probability will be renamed Bayesian probability, and we'll see that subjective probability is actually the most useful of the three. But uh, that's for a, a future course way down the line. Subjective probability, according to Hawks, is simply an educated guess regarding the chance that an event will occur. This is Hawks. This is not reality, but you won't understand the reality until you get into a future stat course. And again, subjective probability or Bayesian probability will be the most useful. But we're not there yet. Experimental probability or relative frequency probability uh, talks about using data to estimate a probability in an event. Um, so if E is an event, then P of E, 
probability that E occurs is given by F over N, where F is the frequency and N is the total number of times the experiment is performed. So if I want to estimate or find the probability of randomly selecting a sophomore um, from campus, I could ask 500 people on campus if they're a sophomore. And of those 500, 295 said they are a sophomore. N would be 500, the number of people I asked. And therefore, I would estimate the probability of a sophomore being 295 over 500. And that's going to be the cornerstone, this experimental probability, or this relative frequency probability, will be the cornerstone of the second half of the course. Mainly because uh, I'm gonna go, the classical probability uh, very quickly indicate uh, very quick, aha, the classical probability very quickly will become useless. We don't know the actual probability of selecting a student who is a sophomore, so we just have to estimate it. And that estimation and the using of the estimated probabilities is this experimental probability. Um, the benefit or the, the theoretical background that we can use the experimental probability is called the law of large numbers. As the sample size increases, the proportion or the means of your sample approaches the means or the, the po uh, proportions of the population. And then classical probability. If all outcomes are equally likely, and this is actually a very important requirement that the outcomes are equally likely, then the probability of E is equal to the number of elements in the E divided by the number of elements in the sample space. Hence, when we're talking about what's the probability of getting a six when rolling two die, and by getting a six, I mean adding up the dice together, of getting it was just five, the number of ways of the dice adding up to six, divide by 36, the possible number of outcomes. Example four is identifying the types of probability. Determine whether each probability is subjective, experimental, or classical. Again, experimental is also, also referred to as relative frequency or just as frequentist. Classical is also referred to as axiomatic, A-X-I-O-M-A-T-I-C. Probability of selecting the Queen of Spades out of a well-shuffled standard deck of cards is 1 over 52. That's clearly classical. There's only one Queen of Spades out of the 52 cards in the deck. We know this. We don't have to estimate it. We're not guessing at it. An economist predicts a 20% chance that technology stocks will decrease in value over the next year. From the information given, that will be subjective. Although... This economist may have used data to come up with that, in which case it would be experimental. Police officer wishes to know the probability that a driver chosen at random will be driving under the influence on a Friday night. So he records the number of drivers at a roadblock, the number of drivers drinking with BA uh, blood alcohol levels over the legal limit, yet determines the probability is 3%. That is very clearly a relative frequency or an experimental probability because it's based on the experiment that he performed. We just discussed that. Uh, Beck is allergic to peanuts for the next example. Poor Beck. At a large dinner party one evening, he notices that the cheesecake options on the dessert table contain the following flavors. 10 slices of chocolate, 12 slices of caramel, 12 slices of peanut butter chocolate, and 8 slices of strawberry. Assuming that the desserts are served to a guest at random, what's the probability that Beck's cheesecake contains peanuts? It's 12 divided by 10 plus 12 plus 12 plus 8. And what's the probability that Beck's dessert does not contain chocolate? That's going to be 12 plus 8 divided by 10 plus 12 plus 12 plus 8. In the first case, it's because 12 of those, the numerator 12, uh, contain peanut butter. And in the second case, it's a uh, numerator of 12 plus 8 does not contain chocolate. However, were I Beck, I wouldn't eat cheesecake at all because 
even a 28% chance it's not worth it. Consider a beginning archer who only manages to hit the target half the time. What's the probability that in three shots the archer will hit the target all three times? That's going to be 1 over 8, or 12.5%. Here's why. Each time she has a 50% chance of hitting the target. So 50% chance to hit the first time, 50 the second, 50 the third. To hit it all three times, it's got to hit it the first, and the second, and the third time. Here's the, tar here's the tree diagram. Notice in only one of these eight cases does she hit the target all three times. So it's 1 over 8th, or 12.5%. Consider a family with six boys. What's the probability that the seventh child will also be a boy? Okay. Um, families do to have a girl, but reality states just the opposite. If you've got six boys, it's most more likely that you'll have a seventh boy. However, we're supposed to pretend that each time it's a 50% chance of getting a boy or a girl. Um, so it's, you got six boys followed by a girl, or six boys followed by a boy. Of the, these, one out of the two um, is a boy, so a 50% chance. Again, this assumes that the outcomes are equally likely. The reality is that if you've had six boys, it's more likely that you'll have a seventh boy. Um, it's not 50% chance. And also, even on your first child, it's not a 50% chance that you'll have a boy. It's actually a less than 50% chance that you'll have a boy. It's a 49 point something percent chance. Um, but we're simplifying things here so that we, because we can multiply in, uh, by half very easily. Um, in biology, we learn that many diseases are genetic. One example of such is Huntington's disease, which causes a neurological disorder as person ages. Each person has two Huntington genes, um, one inherited from each parent. If the individual inherits a mutated Huntington gene from, from either of his or her parents, that person will develop the disease. Notice it's from either of the parents. Uh, TV show House, the character who Dr. House calls 13, um, inherited the disease from her mother. So if 13 has a child with a person who has two healthy Huntington disease, um, what's the probability your child will develop Huntington's? Quite simply, the answer is going to be one half. Because going to get a good gene from the parent, uh, from the father, and a bad gene from her, 50%. And that's it for section 4.1. Remember, go to Moodle, take the quiz, and for each of your answers, write something like, this was not asked in the lecture. And that's it. Hope you all have a good day. Hello and welcome to section 4.5 where we're learning about the addition rules of probability. In other words, we're looking at probability of the union of two events. Um, so we're going to use addition rules to calculate probability. That's the objective for today. Um, there are three properties of probability. Um, for any event, E is going to be our generic event. Um, the probability of E is going to be between 0 and 1 inclusive. Um, for any sample space, the generic sample spaces can be in a cursive S. Um, the probability of being an element of that sample space is 1, because remember the sample space is a set of all possible outcomes. And 3, for an empty set, the probability of empty set is 0. So the probability of nothing happening is 0. Um, the complement is a very important concept that you're going to be using in Chapter 5. Um, chapter 4 really only has two concepts that are extremely important. One is complement. Um, the other is going to be the uh, concept of independence. 
independence we're going to be using in chapter 11, but complement we're going to be using quite a bit in chapters 5 and 6. Um, the complement of an event E has denoted, is denoted as E to the power of C. It's not really a to a power of, it's just superscripted C. Um, in some sources this will be a prime, in some sources it'll be bar over the E. Um, I like the C, it's pretty nice. Um, it's uh, the complement of E is the set of all outcomes that are not in E. Um, so describe the complement of each of the following events. A red card out of a standard deck of cards. The event is choose a red card, so the complement will be choose a not red card, uh, which means the complement is going to be choose a black card out of a standard deck of cards. <coughs> Pardon me. Out of 31 students in your stat class, 15 are out sick with the flu. So the event E is being out sick with the flu. The complement of E is going to be not being out sick with the flu. So in this case, E complement will be able to attend class or not being sick. In your area, 91% of phone customers use phone south. Um, so the event is customer using phone south. The complement will be customer not using phone south. So be the complement E complement will be customer using some something other than phone south. That's what all of the solutions tell us. Um, the complement rule for probability, and this is the most important part, is that the probability of an event plus the probability of its complement is one. Um, this is kind of like put a star next to it in your notes, circle it, happy face around it, um, because this we're going to be using a lot in chapter 5. Um, for some problems, and this is actually why we're going to use it a lot in chapter 5, for some problems the probability of complement is much easier to calculate than the probability of the event itself. This is especially true when you're dealing with infinite sets or infinite sample spaces. For these problems you can calculate the probability of the complement and subtract that value from 1. Here's an example. You're worried that there are there is a 35% chance that you'll fail your upcoming test. What's the probability that you will pass the test? It's going to be the complement of failing, so it's going to be 1 minus 35%. There is a 5% chance that none of the items on a scratch-off will be a winner. What's the probability that at least one will win? Well, at least one means the probability of a 1 or a 0. I'm sorry. At least one, that's the probability of a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, or a 5, all the way up there. So that's going to be 1 minus the probability of a 0. So here's the solution for the first. 65%, pretty straightforward. The second is much more complicated. Probability of at least one winner is 1 minus the probability of no winners. And we're told the probability of no winners is 5% which means that the probability of at least one is going to be 95 percent. I do want to emphasize here, make sure you understand that no winners and at least one winners are complementary events. So pause until you understand that. Roll a pair of standard six-sided dice. What is the probability that neither die is a three? That's going to be pretty straightforward to calculate if you use complements. If you do it brute force, then you're going to have to list out all 36 possibilities and determine how many of those um, neither has a 3. Or we can just use complements. So these are the outcomes that have a 3. Remember, E is not having a 3. So E complement will be having a 3. So there are 11 elements in E complement, so the probability of being in E complement is 11 over 36. Therefore, the probability of being in E is 25 over 36. Which is about 70%. So you have about a 70% chance of rolling two dice and not getting a three on either one. The addition rules for probability. 
this is the addition rule for probability. There is a simplification to it that may be useful or may be allowed, but this is the rule. And the probability of, uh, given two events, the probability of being in event E or in event F, or both, is just the probability of being in E plus the probability of being in F minus the probability of being in both. Cerise is looking for a new condo to rent. Her realtor provided with the following list of amenities for 17 available properties. There's the list. Close to the subway was six. Seven were low maintenance fee. Five had green space. Two were newly renovated. Close to the subway and low maintenance were two. So one and two, there were two in that, which meant that there were, yeah, um, green space and newly renovated was just one. If Cerise's realtor selects the first condo they visit at random, what's the probability the property is either close to a subway or has a low maintenance fee? Close to a subway we'll call E, low maintenance fee we'll call F. So let's verify that the realtor has accurately counted the total number of properties. Remember there were 17 properties. Six were of type one, seven were of type two, five were of type three, two were of type four, which gave us 20, but we know that there is a overlap of three. And we were told what this overlap was. Two are both low maintenance and close to a subway, and one is both newly renovated and green spaced. So 17 individual properties. We're going to use the or that tells us we'll be using the addition rule, E or F. That's equal to probability of E plus a probability of F minus the probability of both. There are 16 that are close to a subway, seven that are low fee, and we're also told that two are both. So six plus seven minus two is 11, so about a 64% chance. Suppose that after a vote in the U.S. Senate on a proposed health care bill, the following table shows the breakdown of the votes by party. 23 versus 21, 43 versus 7, 2 versus 4. If a lobbyist stops a random senator after the vote, what's the probability the senator will be either a Republican or voted against the bill? So either a Republican or voted against the bill. That's just going to equal the probability of it being a Republican, 50, plus the probability of voting against the bill, 32, minus the seven that were counted twice, divided by 100 or whatever. Republican voted against the bill, counted twice, gives us a 75% chance the lobbyist will have dinner with the senator he wants. Roll a pair of dice. What's the probability of rolling either a total less than 4 or a total equal to 10? Total less than 4 will be E. Total equal to 10 will be F. We want the probability of E or F. That's just the probability of E plus the probability of F minus the probability of E and F. Less than 4 plus the probability of 10 minus the probability of less than 4 and 10. Well, what's the probability of it being both less than 4 and equal to 10? Well, that's 0 because this is the empty set. And from our uh, uh, three requirements for probability, that means that this probability is equal to 0. And we just pay attention to the first two. In other words, less than 4 and 10 are mutually exclusive events. One can happen, the other could happen, but both cannot happen. So there's 3 that are less than 4, there's 3 that are 10, so it's going to be 6 out of 
36. Again, the key, these two events are mutually exclusive, and that leads to a 0% chance of both occurring. If events E and F are mutually exclusive, then the addition rule is much easier. And apparently, Hawks didn't give us the formula. It's just the probability of E plus the probability of F. There's no need to subtract off anything because what you're subtracting off is just zero. Caleb is very excited that it's finally time to purchase his first new car. After much thought, he's narrowed his choices down to four. Because it's taken him so long to make up his mind, his friends have started to bet on which car he will choose. They've given each car a probability based on how likely they think Caleb is to choose that car. Devin's betting that Caleb will choose either a Toyota or a Jeep. Find the probability that Devin's right. And here's the probabilities that they've assigned. Probability of a Toyota or a Jeep. It's just going to be the probability of a Toyota plus the probability of a Jeep. Minus the probability of a Toyota and a Jeep. But that probability of both is zero because he's purchasing his first new car. Only one car. So Devin has a 75% chance of correctly picking which car Caleb will buy. Sample 416, we're going to extend the addition rule to more than just two events. We've got these probabilities. We're asked what's the probability that the driver will refuel at Shell, Exxon, or Chevron. Shell, Exxon, or Chevron. These are mutually exclusive events, therefore the probability is just going to be the sum of the individual probabilities. The probability of the union is the sum of the probabilities, if the events are mutually exclusive. And that's the end for chapter, uh, section 4.2. Again, don't forget to complete the quiz in Moodle. And for each of the questions, write something like, this was not covered on the lecture. And that's it. Take care. Hello and welcome to section 4.3. This is the third section in chapter 4, Probability Theory. Here we're looking at the multiplication rules for probability, which eventually will lead to conditional probability and independence. Um, so we're going to use multiplication rules to calculate probability. Um, Multi-stage experiment is experiment with two or more steps or stages. We've seen examples of this. The roll the die and then flip a coin is a multi-stage experiment. The flipping the coin three times is a multi-stage experiment. That's a three-stage experiment. An experiment performed with replacement refers to placing an object back into consideration before performing the next stage of the experiment. Those examples I just gave you were, quote, with replacement because you could end up with Actually, the first one with roll the die and then flip a coin is not with experiment because once you roll the die, you can't get a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 for the second term. We did have an earlier example of the probability of getting a queen of spades. Um, if all we're doing is drawing one card, then we don't need to talk about with or without replacement. But if we're talking about drawing two cards, what's the probability that either one is a queen of spades? Well, now we've got to think about, am I putting the first card back after I draw the second, uh, first card, or do I keep that first card in my hand? If I put the card back, it's with replacement. And the calculations tend to be a little bit easier when you're doing things with replacement. Um, if I hold on to that first card, then it's without replacement. And the calculations get a little bit more difficult, not too much. Um, two events are independent if one event happening does not influence the probability of the other event happening. Um, so that's independent. Multiplication rule for probability of independent events, and I want to emphasize this is for independent events right now. Um, if E and F are independent, then the probability of E and F occurring is equal to the probability of E times the probability of F. That's it. Uh, suppose two cards from a standard deck. I choose two cards from a standard deck with replacement. That means I draw a card, look at it, put the card back, reshuffle, draw a second card. 
What's the probability of choosing a king and then a queen? Well, since I put the card back, the outcome of the first doesn't impact the outcome of the second draw. So these are going to be two independent events. So it's just going to be the probability of choosing a king times the probability of choosing a queen. So that's going to be 4 out of 52 times 4 out of 52, or 1 13th times 1 13th, which is about 0.6% chance. Assume that a study by Human Resources has found that the probabilities of an employee being written up for the following infractions are the value shown in the following table. So this is probability of being written up at work. <clears throat> and we're going to assume that each infraction is independent of the others. This is given information to us. We would have to know that they're independent. We can't just look at the problem and understand, hey, they're independent. We have to be told they're independent. What's the probability that a given employee will be written up for being late to work, taking unauthorized breaks, and leaving early? late to work, unauthorized breaks, leaving early. So we're looking at the probability of late to work and unauthorized breaks and leaving early. So it's just the product of those three probabilities because these are independent events. So about 1% chance. Said a different way, about 1% of the, of the people at that company get written up for being late to work, taking on authorized breaks, and leaving early. That seems rather seems rather high to me. Um, an experiment performed without replacement means that the objects are not placed back into consideration. Um, that means that the two draws are going to be dependent, most likely. Two events are dependent if one event happening affects the probability of the other event happening. So we're looking back at our king and queen example. We want to know the probability of drawing a king and then a queen if the cards are drawn without replacement. So this is going to be a good one. The situation is essentially the same as drawing two cards from a standard deck. So instead, instead of thinking of it as draw one card and then draw the other, you can think of this as just drawing two cards. And you're asking what's the probability of the first card I drew being a king and the second being a queen. Um, by determining the probability of drawing a king from a standard deck of cards. Begin by doing that. It's just 1 out of 13. Now, let's assume that when I drew the first card it was a king. So given the first card is a king, what's the probability that the second one is a queen? Well, it's There's four queens in the deck, but the deck only has 51 cards left in it. Because I didn't put that king back. There's only 51 cards left in the deck. Thus, the probability of a queen, given that the king was drawn first, without replacement, is 4 out of 51. So the probability of getting a king and then a queen is just going to be the product. of about 0.06. I'm sorry by about 0.6 percent. Now what we've actually done is we've started talking about conditional probability without telling you that we're talking about conditional probability. Here's the the key that this is conditional probability, it's the word given. Conditional probability denoted by probability of F given E, that vertical bar is read as quote given is a probability of event F occurring given that the event E occurs first. If event E and F are independent, then the probability of F given E is just probability of F, which leads to a, a, a nice definition of independence for us. One card's already been chosen from a standard deck without replacement. What's the probability of now choosing a second card and it being red, given the first card was a diamond? So we're asked, what's the probability of being the second being red given the first was a diamond? Red given diamond is just 25 over 51, because we didn't put the card back. There's only 25 cards that are red 
when the first card was a diamond, which is also red, by the way. So now here's the actual multiplication rule for probability. Given two events, E and F, the probability of E and F occurring is just the probability of E times the probability of F given E, which is identical to the probability of F times the probability of E given F. These two formulas are exactly the same. The one you use depends on the data that's given to you. So it's the probability of choosing two face cards in a row. We're going to assume the cards are chosen without replacement. Here we're dealing with dependent events, so we use the multiplication rule. When the first card is picked, all 12 face cards are available out of 52, so the probability of the first one is a face card is 12 out of 52. Now, given that the first one is a face card, then there's only 11 left that are face cards out of the 52, uh, out of the 51 cards remaining in the deck. So the total probability will be 12 over 52 times 11 over 51, which is about a 5% chance. Assume that there are 17 men, 24 women in the Rotary Club. Two members are chosen at random each year to serve on the scholarship committee. What's the probability of choosing two members at random, the first being a man and the second being a woman? We're choosing two members. The first choice will influence the probability of the second. There's 41 uh, people altogether. So the probability of a man and a woman is just the probability of man times the probability of a woman given the first was a man. The probability of man is 17 out of 41. So given the first one was a man, the probability of the second one being a woman is just 24 out of 40. It's 24 because there's 24 women in the Rotary Club. It's 40 because there are 40 that are remaining after the first one was chosen. So there's about a one-fourth chance. We can also write conditional probability, and this is sometimes referred to as the definition of conditional probability. The probability of F given E is the probability of E and F divided by the probability of E. If E and F are independent, and the probability of E and F is just the probability of E times the probability of F. The probability of E's cancel out, so we're given the probability of F given E is just equal to the probability of F. And that's a very nice definition of independence. Out of 300 applicants for a job, 212 are female and 110 are female and have a graduate degree. What's the probability that a randomly chosen applicant has a graduate degree given she's female? So now we're told the person we got is female. What's the probability that she has a graduate degree? 212 female, 110 female graduate degree. So this probability is just going to be 110 over 212. If 152 of the applicants have graduate degrees, what's the probability that a randomly chosen applicant is female given the applicant has a graduate degree? 152 is the denominator, 110 is the numerator, so the probability is just going to be 110 over 152. The key is female and graduate degree divided by female. female and graduate degree divided by graduate degree. And the emphasis here is that probability of F given E is not necessarily the same as probability of E given F. Order matters with conditional probability. The reason order matters is you're given different information. 
probability of f given e, you're given that e is true and you need to calculate the probability of f. Whereas in probability of e given f, you're given f is true and you need to calculate a completely different probability, probability of e. And now for the fundamental counting principle. For a multi-stage experiment with n stages, where the first stage has k1 outcomes, the second stage has k2 outcomes, the third stage has k3 outcomes, and so on, the total number of possible outcomes is k1 times k2 times k3 times dot 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 times kn. We've already seen this. Um, with the roll a die, then flip a coin, k1 was 6, k2 was 2, the total number of outcomes was 12. 6 times 2. Flipping the coin 3 times, k1 was 2, k2 was 2, k3 was 2, 2 times 2 times 2 was 8. There were 8 possible outcomes. Rolling 2 dice, k1 was 6, k2 was 6, 6 times 6 is 36, there were 36 possible outcomes. So we've already experienced this, we're just giving you a nice name for it. Kilby begins her first year in an online degree program in July. The first semester she'll randomly be assigned to one section for each of four different core courses. If there are eight English 1 sections, 12 college algebra sections, 11 American history sections, and five phys ed physical science sections, how many different options are there for Kilby's schedule for her first semester? Well, it's just 8 times 12 times 11 times 5 from the fundamental counting principle. The governing board at a local charity, Mission Stateville, is electing a new vice president and secretary to replace outgoing board members. If the board consists of 11 members who don't already hold an office, how many different ways can the two positions be filled if no one may hold more than one office? Go ahead and hit pause to figure this out. And you're back. Two slots to fill. It's going to be without replacement, because you can't hold both offices. There are 11 choices for the first position, 10 choices for the second. That leaves 110 possible ways to elect the new officers. Example, Robin is preparing an afternoon snack for her twins, Matthew and Lainey. She wants to give each child one item. She has the following snacks on hand, carrots, raisins, crackers, grapes, apples, yogurt, and granola bars. If she randomly chooses one snack for Matthew and one snack for Lainey, what's the po probability each child gets the same snack as yesterday? Here's the solution. You probably want to hit pause to come up with the solution yourself before you read the solution here. You need to count the number of ways in which Robin can randomly choose a snack for her twins. Again, we can think of this as two slots to fill, one for each twin seven possibilities for each child. There's no requirement that the twins have different snacks or conversely have the same snack. So the total number of ways she can prepare the snacks is seven times seven. Now we need to count the number of ways that she can choose the same afternoon snack as yesterday. There's only one thing they had yesterday. So the probability is just going to be 1 divided by the 49 total number of snacks, so about 2% chance. And that's it. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to section 4.4. .4. This is the fourth section of chapter 4. We're going to look at combinations and permutations. These are just functions that allow you to quickly calculate total number of possible outcomes. Um, so the objective calculate numbers of permutations and combinations. Um, before we get to that, we have to define what a factorial is. A uh, factorial of n, a positive integer, uh, denoted by n exclamation point, or called n factorial, is just the product of n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 1. So 1 factorial is equal to 1, 2 factorial is equal to 2 times 1, or 2, 
3 factorial is equal to 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6. By agreement, 0 factorial is equal to 1. You might want to be careful on that one. So let's calculate the following factorial expressions. Uh, a is 7 factorial. That's just going to be 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Um, B is 4 factorial over 0 factorial. That's numerator is going to be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Denominator is going to be just 1. Um, C, 95 factorial over 93 factorial. That's just going to be 95 times 94. Why? Because 95 factorial is equal to 95 times 94 times 93 factorial. And then you're dividing off by that 93 factorial, so you're left with just 95 times 94. D, the numerator is going to be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Denominator, well, 5 minus, 5 minus 3 is 2, so the denominator is just going to be 2 times 1, 2 factorial. E, numerator is going to be 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Denominator is going to be 2 times 1 times... 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, because 6 minus 2 is 4. So 7 factorial is 50, 40. 4 factorial over 0 factorial is 24. 95 factorial divided by 93 factorial is 95 times 94. Five factorial over two factorial is just sixty. And six factorial over two factorial times four factorial is fifteen. Now we're going to define the definite difference between a combination and a permutation. A uh, combination. Uh, let's do with permutation first. A permutation is a selection of objects from a group where the arrangement matters. Um, combination, the arrangement doesn't matter. So an example when you would use a permutation is you want to select a president, vice president, secretary from a group of people. The actual positions are named and they matter. A uh, combination would be I want to select a, a, uh, a group of three people from a larger class of 50. Um, I'm just selecting three people in this group. by not naming the positions, it's just three. So the arrangement matters, that leads to permutations. The arrangement is irrelevant, that leads to a combination. So the calculations are very similar-ish. Uh, when order is not important, the following formula is used to calculate the number of combinations. Um, it's ncr, or n choose r, is just n factorial, the larger number, divided by r factorial times n minus r factorial. So if I want to choose a group of three people out of our class of 30, n is 30, r is 3. So it will be 30 factorial divided by 3 factorial times 27 factorial. When the order is important, the following formula is used to calculate the number of permutations. So if I want to choose a president, vice president, and secretary from our class of 30, n is again going to be 30, r again is going to be 3, but the number of permutation is just n factorial over 27 factorial. Notice the number of combinations cannot be larger than the number of permutations, and the number of combinations will be equal only when r is equal to 1 or 0. In other words, when r is 1 or 0, order is not important versus order is important. That means the same thing, because there's only one or no position to fill. It's like choosing a president from our class of 30. Whether or not the order matters within that one position, it's not a question to ask because there's only that one position. Given a group of three friends, how many ways can you arrange the way that they stand in line for the movies? Standing in line matters, or the order matters that. So it'll be three factorial divided by 3 minus 3 factorial. 
How many ways can I choose two of them to write in a car together? I'm just choosing two. I'm not saying one gets shotgun, the other doesn't. I'm just choosing two. So A is going to be permutations. B will be combinations. That will be three choose two. So there are six ways that they can stand in line. Here's the actual listing of those six ways. As for the second part, we're just choosing two from a group of three, so it's called three choose two. Three factorial, two factorial, then three minus two factorial. So you can also think of this as the total number of way, uh, total number of, of people factorial divided by the number of people in the group you care about, factorial, times the number of people in the rest of the group. We start with three friends, we want two in the car, this is what's not in the car. And here are the possible options for who gets to ride. Class of 18 fifth graders is holding elections for class president, vice president, and secretary. How many different ways can the officers be elected? Since we've actually named these positions, this is going to be permutations. R is 3, N is 18. It's almost 5,000 ways. Consider that a cafeteria is serving the following vegetables, carrots, green beans, lima beans, celery, corn, broccoli, and spinach. Bill wa wishes to order a vegetable plate with three different vegetables. How many ways can it, this plate be prepared? Well, this is one where order doesn't matter. Um, so it's going to be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven will be N, three will be R, so this will be Seven, choose three. Thirty-five. Suppose that a little league baseball coach is randomly listing the nine starting baseball players in batting order for their second game. At this level, the batting order is randomly chosen to give all players an opportunity to experience different batting positions. What's the probability that the order chosen for the second game is exactly the same as that of the first game? Since we're focusing on the order itself, this will be permutations. N and R are both 9. And we're looking at the probability, so the denominator is going to be N permute 9. I'm sorry, 9 permute 9, and the numerator is going to be 1 because there was only one ordering that we had yesterday. Permute 9 is equal to 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 9 factorial. And 0 factorial is 1, so this is 9 factorial, or 9 permute 9. So there are that many possible batting orders. The probability of getting the exact one from yesterday is just 1 divided by that. So pretty low probability. Maya has a bag of 15 blocks, each of which is a different color, including red, blue, and yellow. Maya reaches into the bag and pulls out three blocks. What's the probability that the blocks she has chosen are red, blue, and yellow? Um, from the way this is stated, this looks like a combination, because it doesn't say that the blocks have to be in that order, that she first pulls out a red, then a blue, then a yellow, just that there are red, blue, and yellow. out of those 15, so it's going to be 15 choose 3, 455. How many combinations contain the red, blue, and yellow blocks? Order does not matter, so there's only one way to choose those colors. 
thus the probability that my chooses red, blue, and yellow is calculated such. Just one over that. Last topic will be special permutations. Um, special permutations involve objects that are identical. Number of distinguishable permutations of n objects of which k1 are alike, k2 are alike, and so forth is given by this. We've actually already dealt with this in terms of permutations. Um, we start out with n in our permutations and we divide by k that belong to the group we care about and n minus k belong to the group we didn't care about. If we only have two groups, then k2 is just going to be n minus k1, or n minus r. Make sure that your k1, k2 all the way adds up to n. Tennessee, good example. Mississippi is the other usual example. How many different ways can you arrange the letters of the word Tennessee? Notice that the n's, the e's, and the s's are all the same as each other. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine letters in Tennessee. There's one T, four E's, two N's, and two S's, which means the total number of ways is going to be nine factorial divided by one factorial times four factorial times two factorial times two factorial. And that's it. Again, Mississippi is the other usual example. Um, how many ways can you arrange the letters in Mississippi if the I's, the S's, and the P's all look the same as the other I's, S's, and P's? So getting something to think about. Um, so that's the end of this section. Um, I think there's one more in the course, I mean, uh, one more in the chapter. Um, enjoy. Hello and welcome to section 4.5. This will be the last section of uh, chapter 4 and probability theory. Um, in this section we're going to combine the probability techniques of the first two and the counting techniques of the last sections into one nice little ball of, of probability. Um, so we're going to use the basic counting rules to calculate probabilities. In this section, we'll look at counting problems that have more complicated solutions than just one over the total number of possibilities. A helpful trick for these problems is to look for, to look for certain key terms. The key terms are important because they define the method to be used to find the correct answer. Words to look for include at least, at most, greater than, less than, between, etc. So here we'll start out with a, a nice little example. A group of 12 tourists is visiting London. At one particular museum, a discounted admission is given to groups of at least 10. So A, how many combinations of tourists can be made for the museum visit so that the group receives the discounted rate? In other words, we want to find the number of ways of having 10 and 11 and 12 chosen out of that group of 12. And B, suppose that a group of tourists does get the discount. What's the probability it was made up of 11 tourists? In other words, in A, we got the total number of ways that you can get the discount. And now, we're given that they got the discount. What's the probability that it was made up of 11? So here's the solution. Keywords in this problem are at least. So if at least 10 are required in the group that gets the discount has to be 10, 11, or 12. Now we calculate the number of combinations to get 10, number of combinations to get 11, and number of combinations to get 12. Then add them to back, uh, add them together. And notice that these are combinations because we aren't putting the tourists in any line. We're just getting groups of those tourists. So here's how to get the group of 10 tourists. It's 12 choose 10, group of 11, 12 choose 11. Remember that 12, by the way. And 12 choose 12, which is just 1. 
as we know the question implies that the group will get a discount if 11, uh, 10, 11, or 12. So the number of ways is just the sum of those, 66 plus 12 plus 1. So there are 79 ways that this group can get that discount. Now B, we need to calculate this probability. So we're given the group received the discount. What's the probability that it's a group of 11? So the numerator is going to be the number of ways of getting groups of 11, and the denominator is going to be the number of ways of getting the discount. Well, we've already figured that ways of getting a discount is 79. And we figured out the ways of getting a group of 11 is 12, so the probability is going to be 12 over 79. Jack is setting a password on his computer. He's told that his password must contain at least three, but no more than five characters. He may use either letters or numbers. At least three, but no more than five characters. Wow. So A, how many different possibilities are there for his password if each character can only be used once? Notice that this is without replacement. Um, and then suppose that Jack's computer randomly sets his password using all the restrictions given above. What's the probability that his password is an arrangement of the letters in his name? Jack. So here's the solution for A. It's got to be at least and no more. Those are some key words there. At least three, no more than five. So it's the number, it's got to be three, four, or five. So we've got to count the number of ways that you can get three, the number of ways you can get four, and the number of ways you can get five. The order of characters is important, so this will be permutations. There's 36 characters to choose from, 26 letters, 10 digits. So here's the calculation for 3. It's 36 permute 3. For 4 characters, it's 36 permute 4. And for 5 characters, it's 36 permute 5. So the total number of possible passwords is just the sum of those which is about 46.7 million possibilities. To find the probability of a randomly chosen password would include only the four letters from Jack's name. Find the, uh, we, got, we use the number from part A as the denominator. That's the N of S, that's our sample space. Um, to find the numerator, the number of ways you can get the event, calculate the number of permutations of 4 from a set of 4. Four permute 4 is just 4 factorial, which is 24. So the actual probability is that 24 divided by the total number of possible passwords. So it's rather small. Now the way that they calculated this is, n never mind, um, it's n of e divided by n of s. We don't need to know what e and s are except into calculating what n of e and n of s are. Tina is packing her suitcase to go on a weekend trip. She wants to pack three shirts, two pairs of pants, and two pairs of shoes. She has nine shirts, five pants, and four pairs of shoes to choose from. How many ways can Tina pack her suitcase? Um, we do need to assume that everything matches, which means that we are in the independent realm. This will be nine choose three, times five choose two, times four choose two. Because in the nine shirts, she's choosing three of the five pairs of pants. She's choosing two. And of the pairs, four pairs of shoes, she's also choosing two. So there's the number of ways that she can select her shirts, number of ways that she can get her pants, and number of ways she can get her shoes. So the total number of ways from the fundamental counting principle is just that product, 84 times 10 times 6. I do want to emphasize the word and here implies multiply. It's and being you have to choose this and choose those pants and choose those shoes. In probability or indicates adding. 
and indicates multiplying. And here's an interesting little drawing that might help see this. Shirts, pants, shoes, they're independent of each other because we specified everything matches. There's 84 ways of getting her shirts, 10 of her pants, 6 of her shoes. So by the fundamental accounting principle, it's just the product of those. An elementary school principal is putting together a committee of six teachers, a committee of six teachers to head up the Springs Festival. There are eight first grade, nine second grade, and seven third grade teachers at the school. How many ways can the committee be formed? Notice we're not specifying that any that the committee has to contain a certain number of any of the grades. There's 8, 17, 24 teachers all together, so the number of ways the committee can be formed is just 24 choose 6. How many ways can the committee be formed if there must be two teachers chosen from each grade? It's going to be 8 choose 2 times 9 choose 2 times 7 choose 2 for the same reason of Tina's suitcase. And suppose the committee is chosen at random with no restrictions, so we're in the case of A. What's the probability that two teachers from each grade are represented? So the denominator, the bottom, is going to be A, and the top is going to be B. Because A is the number of possible outcomes, and B is going to be the number of possible outcomes in the event. Twenty-four choose six. Eight choose two. Times nine choose two. Times seven choose two. And then the probability will be just be this twenty-one one sixty-eight divided by the total number n of s of one thirty-four five ninety-six. So even if you're not focusing on making sure that the committee consists of two first grader teachers, two second grade teachers, two third grade teachers, there's still a 15.73% chance that it's going to happen naturally, just out of randomness. And that's it. Notice how this, this uh, section took all of our combinations and permutation stuff and used it to calculate probabilities of events. And it comes back to n of e divided by n of s. Of course, we are assuming independence and all of those outcomes are equally likely. But it's n of e over n of s. n of e over n of s. And that's it. The end of chapter 4. The next lecture will be on specific probability distributions and things that we can do with discrete distributions. So stay tuned. Hello and welcome to section 5.1. This is the chapter, or this section introduces the chapter that deals with discrete distributions. This chapter is going to cover some named and therefore important discrete distributions. Um, this section is just looking at uh, some basics of, of discrete distributions. So by the end of this lecture you should be able to understand the difference between discrete and continuous distributions, or discrete and continuous random variables. Um, chapter 6 will deal with the continuous ones. Uh, to know the purpose of the probability mass function, explain the three requirements for a function to be a probability mass function. That, that's, that's an important one. Uh, calculate probabilities using the probability mass function. Determine sample space. Sample space is also very important because it helps give you a better understanding of which distributions the data could actually come from. And then calculate the expected value and variance of a distribution. Uh, expected value and standard deviation will be the important ones, and standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. So let's start with the definition of what a random variable is. A random variable is a variable whose numeric value is determined by the outcome of a probability experiment. You can think of this as an outcome from the future. Um, some examples, statistician's favorite flavor of ice cream. Um, you don't know that until you actually measure it, um, ask the statistician. <clears throat> a student's level of approval of a congressional decision. You don't know that until you measure it, um, aka ask the student. 
um, the year Knox College professor is born. You don't know that until you ask, until you perform the experiment. So all of these are random variables. Uh, random variables have or they follow probability distributions. It's this fact that they follow probability distributions that allows us to understand the randomness of a random variable. Um, and I, I, I want to say that just because it's random doesn't mean we don't know anything about the possible outcomes. In fact, we know <coughs> a lot about those possible outcomes. We don't know what the exact outcome is going to be, but we know everything about it. We know the expected value. We know the uncertainty in that estimate. We know the medians. We know probabilities of, of specific outcomes. So we know everything about that future outcome except for what that future outcome is going to be. Um, these are the three requirements for a function to be a PMF. All the probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. This is true in general. Probabilities can't be greater than 1 can't be less than zero. Um, the sum of the probabilities over the sample space is one. Um, cursive S is called the sample space. It's the set of all values of x that can happen, that have a non-zero probability of happening. Um, so this notation, this is summation over all the values of x that are in the sample space of that probability of the value. The little x is going to be the value. The big x is just going to be big x's. These are random variables. Um, sometimes we'll have big y for a different random variable. So the sum over the entire sample space of the probabilities will be 1. And the probability of a union is no more than the sum of the individual probabilities. Um, this comes from chapter 4. So the probability of A union B is less than or equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B for events A and B. They are equal if the intersection of A and B is empty. It's less than if the intersection is not empty. So let's create a probability mass function for this experiment. Flip a coin three times. Count the number of heads flipped. So the outcome, or the random variable, is going to be the number of heads flipped in those three coins. From this, we know that the sample space is going to be 0, 1, 2, and 3. How do we know that it's 0, 1, 2, and 3? Well, we're flipping the coin three times. So the largest number of heads we can get is going to be three heads. And the smallest will be 0. And there are going to be counts. This is discrete, so we can expect it to be some sort of counts. So the sample space is the set 0, 1, 2, 3. Second step is to determine the probability of each of those four outcomes. We're going to rely on two assumptions. I mean, three, the coin has two sides, that'll be one. Um, two, the coin is fair and the flips are independent. Coin is fair indicates that the probability of a head is one half. Flips are independent means that the outcome of one flip is not going to influence the outcome of another. So if these are true, there are eight possible outcomes of the flips, not of the random variable, but of the flips. We can get three tails. We can get tail, tail, head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, tail. We can get head, head, tail, head, tail, head, head tail, head, head. Or you can get three heads. The random variable is the number of heads. So if you get tail, 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 you have zero. If you get head, 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 you get three. If you get tail, head, tail, you get one. Probability of getting three tails is one half times one half times one half, which is one eighth. So the probability of the outcome zero is one eighth. Similarly, the probability of the outcome three is one eighth, because the only way to get three is head, head, head. One half times one half times one half. These three outcomes from the flips give you the same random variable value of 1, because they all have one head. Probability of tail, tail, head is 1 eighth. Probability of tail, head, tail is 1 eighth. Probability of head, tail, tail is 1 eighth. So the probability of getting one head is 1 eighth plus 1 eighth plus 1 eighth. 
probability of getting two tails, I'm sorry, of getting two heads is just head, head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, tail, head, one eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth, three eighths. In other words, there's three ways of arranging these outcomes so you get two heads times one half times one half times one half. Here's another way that we can represent this. This will be graphically. Sample space is listed along the bottom. The height of the bar corresponds to the probability of that specific outcome. We could represent the probability mass function in this way as well. Probability of the random variable equaling some value, some specified value is 0.125 if this x is 0 or 3. It's 0.375 if this little x is 1 or 2. And it's 0 otherwise. Notice this formula is also not unique. We could also represent it as 3 choose x times 0.125. And keep this in mind when we get to the binomial distribution, which will be in the next section. Remember that population parameter is a function of the population. Contrast this with a statistic being a sample of the data. We want to use those statistics to estimate the population, usually, and we'll do that in the second half of the course. Here we're going to look at ways of calculating those population parameters when we know what the distribution is. Some population parameters that we care most about would be the mean, the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance, and the median. The definition of the expected value, or the mean, of a discrete random variable, so the expected value of x, where x is our random variable, is just the sum over all values of x in the sample space of the quantity x times its probability. Recall from chapter 3, mu, which is the population mean, when we're dealing with distributions, we can also use expected value of x, it's just equal to the sum of x times 1 over n, of x times, well, if each outcome in the population is equally likely to be observed, then the probability of observing that person is just 1 over n. And I suppose that should be a capital N. Expected value is just a long run average of those outcomes. Variance of a distribution is a measure of uncertainty in each outcome. It's the opposite of the word precision. I like the word uncertainty. The variance of a discrete random variable is given by that's a v of x. We could also use sigma squared. Just the sum over all the x's in the sample space of the quantity x minus mu squared times the probability of that outcome. Population variance, remember, was the same thing except 1 over n. And this is perfect if every outcome is equally likely. Here we're dealing with unequally likely outcomes. Here's the wonderful definition of the median. Notice that this explains why I hand waved, saying it's, uh, it's about half is below and about half is above. Because dealing with the actual definition of the median <clears throat> gives me a headache sometimes. Um, when the distribution is continuous, um, we can just deal with the probability of x being less than or equal to the median. That's a tilde on top. Tildes are located to the left of the 1, uh, is, is just equal to 0.5. Um, note that this implies that for a discrete distribution, the median is not necessarily unique. Whereas for continuous distributions, it will be. Here's an example. Three coins, uh, flipping through a coin three times, the probability mass function, remember, we came up with was this. Let's calculate the mean, the variance, and the median from definitions. 
expected value of x is just the sum over all x that are in the sample space of the value times its probability. There are four things in the sample space, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And so it's 0 times the probability of a 0, plus 1 times the probability of a 1, plus 2 times the probability of a 2, plus 3 times the probability of a 3, which gives us 1.5. So the expected number of heads on three flips of a fair coin is 1.5. Doesn't surprise us. Variance, same thing. Adding up over all x's in the sample space of the value minus the mean squared times the probability of the value. So 0 minus the mean squared times the probability of a 0 plus 1 minus the mean squared times the probability of a 1 plus 2 minus the mean squared times the probability of a 2 plus 3 minus the mean squared times the probability of a 3. Add them all up, you get 0.75. Standard deviation, therefore, is 0.866. That's the definition of the median. I think the best way of using it is using cumulative sums of the probabilities. So you order it from zero outcomes from lowest to highest. Start with the lowest outcome, probability, see if it's greater than or equal to 0.5. If it's not, go to the next one and add the probability onto it. So here, x equals 0, probability of that is 0.125. It's not greater than or equal to 0.5, so 0 is not a median. Probability of a 1 was 0.375. So the cumulative probability at 1 is 0.125 plus 0.375. And that is greater than or equal to 0.5. So 1 is a median. Note that since it comes out exactly equal to 0.5, the next value is also the median. 2 is also a median. And every number between 1 and 2. So 1.5 is a median. 1.6 is a median. Here's the R code. The x and p lines are going to be common to all the calculations. It's the last one that shows you how to perform the calculation to get the, the parameter. So we've seen things like this p line. So we're defining the variable p as equal to, and we're using the c function to combine all of these values into one vector. It's 0 0.125, 0 0.375, 0 0.375, 0 0.125. So writing that second line, p will now contain those four values. The first line, this is a new construct for us. We're saying x is equal to the values from 0 to 3. The co that's a colon, so this will be 0, 1, 2, and 3. Um, in some uh, computer languages, it'll, you'll have, instead of a colon, uh, three lower dots, kind of like this, to indicate 0 through 3. But for r, it's just a colon. And now that we've got the sample space and the probability of each of those outcomes, we can calculate the mean is just the sum of all those x's times their probabilities. 1.5. For the variance, it's just the sum of the value minus the mean squared. This is a caret. This is the thing on top of the 6. Uh, it's read as, quote, to the power of. So this caret 2 will mean to the power of 2, or squared, times p, add it up. And the standard deviation is just the square root of that. The function to take the square root in r is sqrt. For the median, we use the function cumulative sum, or cum sum. And we look for the first place where it gets to be 0.5 or greater. And that first place, remember, the sample space is 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1. So 1 is a median. Remember, since this is exactly 0.5, then not only is 1 a median, but so is 2, and every number between 1 and 2.
example two, ice hockey, my STAT 225 course. We did a project where the students predicted the outcome of a future ice hockey game between the Portland Winterhawks and the Prince George Cougars, Go Hawks. Um, I took all of their probabilities and averaged them for the entire class <coughs> for the number of points scored by the Winterhawks. Uh, so the class as a whole said the probability of them scoring zero points was 0.1, one point was 0.1, uh, two points is 0.2, three points is 0.4, and then four points and five points are 0.1 each. So let's uh, calculate the expected number of goals, the uncertainty of that, aka the variance, and the median. So here's a graph of that. using the formula for the expected value. We're adding up over all the x's in the sample space. Sample space 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 of the value times its probability. And we get 2.6. So the expected number of goals to be made by the winter hawks is 2.6. You do not round that to the nearest integer. The expected value is a long run average. Averages don't have to be in the sample space. So the expected value is 2.6. It's not 2, it's not 3, it's 2.6. Variance, going to use the formula again. Plug and chug, get 1.84. Standard deviation, therefore, is 1.356. We could use the standard deviation with the empirical rule, say that the probability of the Winterhawk scoring between 1.2 and 3.9 is about 68%. Um, we can actually calculate it exactly. It's 60%. The median, start with zero. Probability is 0.1, that's not at least 0.5. Add the probability of a 1, so we're at 0.2 now, that's not at least 0.5. Add the probability of 2 goals, that's 0.4, that's not at least 0.5. Add the probability of 3 goals, A, if that comes up to be 0.8, that is greater than or equal to 0.5, so 3 is a median. In fact, since the probability of 3 or less is greater than 0.5, we know that 3 is only, is, I'm sorry, that 3 is the only median. If these had added up to exactly 0.5, then we'd know that 3 and 4 were both medians, as well as everything between 3 and 4. But since it came out to be something greater than 0.5, we know that 3 is the only median. We can do it in R quickly. X line, this is the value 0 through 5. Again, there's that colon notation. So run that first line. X is now the vector 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. P, this combined function, the C function of 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0 0.4. And the mean is just the sum of the X's times their probabilities, 2.6. The variance is just the sum of the x minus mu squared times p's. And the standard deviation is just the square of that variance. And the cum sum function r, that's q sum, cum, cum sum for x equals 0, cum sum for x equals 1, for x equals 2, for x equals 3, boom. x equals 3 is the median. Again, cum sum is the cumulative sum of those probabilities. So these values are probability of x being less than or equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So here's a summary of what we did today in this introduction to discrete distributions. 
we looked at probability mass functions and saw how they described the probabilities of each outcome in the sample space. We saw that probabilities can be calculated by adding the individual probabilities. This reflects chapter 4 very clearly. The expected value is a weighted sum of the outcomes, weighted by the probabilities. Expected value and mean are synonymous. The variance is a weighted sum of the distances between the outcomes and the mean, again weighted by that probability. And the median is the value, again, not necessarily in the sample space, such that at least half is less than or equal to it and at least half is greater than or equal to it. In the future, we're going to look at some named discrete distributions. Bernoulli binomial on the next, Poisson later, hypergeometric later. I misspelled hypergeometric, I guess. And we're going to use R to calculate those probabilities, expected values, if we wish it to. We find many uses for these probability distributions in modeling the real world events around us. And then when we get to chapter 6, we'll repeat this for some continuous distributions. And we're going to continue understanding how the data generating process helps us to better estimate the parameters. The readings will be section 5.1 in Hawks, appendix A1 in R for starters. Here are the intra lecture questions, not entirely intra lecture, but we'll pretend. Uh, question one What is a random variable? Again, I would suggest in your notes write the question on the left hand side and answer it so that you can transfer that into Moodle's quizzes. What is a random variable? Question two is what is a sample space? And question three is what is the difference between an expected value and a mean? And that's it. Hello and welcome to section 5.2 the binomial distribution. In this uh, lecture, we're going to learn about two named distributions, the Bernoulli distribution and the binomial. You'll see that the Bernoulli distribution is just a special case of the binomial, but the Bernoulli distribution does make a nice entrance into the binomial. So here are today's objectives. We're going to calculate expected value, variance, median, probabilities associated with a Bernoulli random variable. We're going to determine what random variable follows a Bernoulli a binomial distribution using its definition, and you do want to memorize the definition of a binomial random variable. Calculate the mean and the variance of a binomial, determine if Bernoulli and binomial distributions are skewed, and calculate probabilities from a binomial distribution. And we're going to do a lot of that in R just to show you how easy it is to do. Um, so definition of a Bernoulli experiment. A random variable with only two possible outcomes follows a Bernoulli distribution, and we're going to define the success probability P. So any random variable that has two possible outcomes is going to be a Bernoulli random variable. Um, some examples, heads on a single flip of the coin, a correct choice on a true false question, uh, me stopping at Starbucks in the morning in a given single morning. Um, each of those two possible outcomes, a success or a failure, either I get ahead I get a correct choice on a true false, I do stop at Starbucks, or a failure. Um, the probability mass function for the Bernoulli, note that the sample space is 0, 1. Uh, so, and P is defined as the success probability. So probability of x equaling 1, in other words having a success, is P. And we know from our rules of probability that if there's only two possible outcomes and the probability of one event is p, the probability of the other is going to be 1 minus p, the complement of it. Um, so the probability of a failure is 1 minus p. Um, for reasons that will become clear when we get to the binomial distribution, this can also be written as p to the power of x and 1 minus p to the power of 1 minus x. Uh, let's calculate expected value and variance for Bernoulli's in general. Remember the definition of the expected value is just the sum over all the x values in the sample space. The quantity x times the probability of that x. 
Sample space is just 0, 1, recall. So this is 0 times the probability of a 0 plus 1 times the probability of a 1. Probability of a failure is 1 minus p. Probability of a success is p. The expected value is p. Remember, expected value is just the long run average. If my Bernoulli event is flipping a coin getting heads, as a fair coin, then we would expect that I flip that coin 10 billion times, half of them will be ahead. I'll get successes on half of them. And that's what this expected value of x equaling p tells you. Similarly, we can calculate the variance. Again, it's the sum over all the x's in the sample space of x minus mean squared times the probability of that x. 0 minus p squared times the probability of a 0, plus 1 minus p squared times the probability of a p. Algebra shows us that this is just p times 1 minus p. You may see this is p times q in some sources. q would be the failure probability, but let's keep it as 1 minus p. So here's the PMF. Uh, let's look at the median. Uh, the CDF function is what we're going to use for the calculate the median. Recall the CDF function is defined as probability of the random variable being less than or equal to some value. The cumulative part is the less than or equal to. Contrast that with the equals part. Cumulative will be for the less than or equal to. CDF of a Bernoulli is 0 when x is less than or equal to 0. Once you get to 0, however, once you get to that failure, it hops up to 1 minus p, stays at 1 minus p until you get to 1, and then it's 1 minus p plus p from then on. Here's a, um, that helps us calculate the median. Here's the CDF, and we need to determine when that CDF is at least, uh, at least 0.5 for the first time. So the median is 0. If the success probability is less than a half, it's 1. If it's greater than a half, and it's every number between 0 and 1 inclusive if p is equal to 1 half. Now the next two slides will show that this actually makes sense. So here's the CDF for the Bernoulli when the success probability p is larger than 1 half. This is a CDF because the vertical axis is the cumulative probability. It's 0, 0, 0 until you get to, one, uh, until you get to 0, and then it pops up to 1 minus p. Stays at 1 minus p until you get to 1, then it hops up to 1. So where is the first time that the cumulative probability is at least 0 0.5? Still below, still oh, right there, 1. So the median when p is greater than 0.5 is 1. Now when the success probability is small, when it's less than a half, CDF 0, 0, 0, 0, pop up to 1 minus p. Ooh, we just popped up beyond 0.5, so 0 is going to be our median. So in other words, when the success probability is large, the median is 1. When it's small, median zero. Make sure that that makes sense to you. That should be very clear. Going from the Bernoulli to the binomial, a binomial random variable is defined, statistically defined as the sum of n independent and identically distributed Bernoulli random variables. That's the definition of the binomial that actually comes down to this definition of five requirements. And this you'll want to memorize. Binomial random variable meets the following five requirements. The number of trials is known. So we know what n is. Each trial has two possible outcomes. That is, each trial is a Bernoulli random variable itself. The success probability p is constant from trial to trial, identically distributed. Note that we don't have to know what p is, we just have to know that it's constant. Uh, four, the trials are independent. I was up here. Trials are independent, and the random variable, or what we're measuring, is the number of successes. 
Notice that 1 and 5 together tells us the sample space is 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n. Here are some examples. Notice these reflect the examples we had with the Bernoulli. Example, uh, <clears throat> so it's the times getting heads on n flips of a coin. For Bernoulli, it was just one flip of a coin. Times getting a 6 on n rolls of a dice. For Bernoulli, it was one roll of a die. Time stopping at Starbucks in N mornings for the Bernoulli, it was just one morning. So again, notice the, that the binomial random variable is just a generalization of the Bernoulli. Or you can think of the Bernoulli just as being a simplification or a special case of the binomial. Here's the probability mass function for the binomial. I like this version of it. It's in three parts. This p to the power of x is the probability of getting x successes. The 1 minus p to the power of n minus x is the probability of getting those n minus x failures. And then the combinations part is just the number of ways that you can arrange those x successes in n trials. If we think back to section 5.1 with the uh, flipping the coin three times, it was this combinations part that gave us the 1, the 3, the 3, and the 1. Whereas the 1 8th part was just these two together. Binomial parameters. Uh, the expected value of binomial is easily calculated from its statistical definition. So this is the statistical definition of the binomial. Um, let x sub i be a Bernoulli random variable. Define y as the sum of those x's. This leads us to y being a binomial. With parameters n, the number of Bernoullis added together, and p, the success probability for each of those Bernoullis. Notice there's no subscript on the p, so this p is constant for all of those Bernoullis. Here's the expected value. Expected value of y, well, we just substitute in what y is. This is y, so we substitute it in. We know that the expected value of a sum is just the sum of the expected values. So we can switch the expected value and the summation. We know the expected value of x sub i. Expected value of a Bernoulli is just p. And so we're n adding up the value p n times, which is just n times p. So the expected value of a binomial is just n times p. As always, stop and make sure that this works, makes sense. Think of this in terms of flipping coins. Variance, we can do the same thing. Variance of y, just substitute in what y is. The variance in the summation chain can switch positions because the x's are independent. The variance of a Bernoulli is just p times 1 minus p. We're adding up p times 1 minus p n times, so there's our variance. And a mathematical note, this step requires independence of the Bernoulli uh, experiments which is a requirement of the binomial, so it works. We'll do an example. Um, I'll let you do the other four examples on your own. And I really do suggest you do those, work through them, make sure they all make sense, do them by hand, and do them in R. Um, so example one, fair coins. Let x be the number of heads flipped in 10 flips of a coin. If the coin is fair, then it's clear that x follows a binomial distribution with 10 trials and success probability of 1 half. x is distributed as a binomial, or x follows a binomial. Uh, let's calculate these three things, the probability of getting three heads, the probability of getting three tails, the probability of getting at most three heads, or at least seven heads otherwise known as at least, uh, sorry, at most three heads or at most s three tails. 
probability of getting three heads, we want to calculate the probability that x is 3. This is a simple application of the probability mass function. Here's the PMF. We're given little x is 3, n is 10, p is 1 half. Plug in, chug, get 0.1171875. 10 choose 3, recall from chapter 4, is just 10 factorial divided by 3 factorial divided by 7 factorial, which gives you 120. In R, that's this one line. Notice th three, four things about it, I guess. Um, we're talking about a binomial distribution, so the stem is binom. We're asked to calculate the probability that x is equal to a value, so that's the prefix will be a d. We're asked to calculate the probability that x is equal to 3, so the first number is 3. Then everything else defines that particular binomial distribution. There are 10 trials, so size is equal to 10. And each trial has a probability of success of 0.5, so prob is 0.5. Probability of getting exactly three tails. If you get three tr tails, we've got two options. Notice that this x is the number of heads flipped. So we could redefine a new random variable for the distribution of tails. Or we can just note that if it's not a head, it's a tail. So the probability of three tails is just the probability of heads being seven. Again, this simple application, the probability mass function, plug and chug. Little x is 7, n is 10, p is 1 half. Probability is 0.1171875. Before I go to the next slide, what would this be in R? Binom, because it's the binomial. D, because we're asked to calculate the probability that x is equal to something. 7, because we're asked to calculate the probability x is equal to 7. 10 trials, success probability of 0.5. This is a lot faster than this. Because I don't know 10 choose 7 in my head. I'd have to use a calculator to do that. Finally, we need to calculate the probability of getting at most 3 heads, or at most three tails, at most three heads or at least seven heads. Using the notation from chapter four, this is the probability of x being less than or equal to three, union, x greater than or equal to seven. Since there's no overlap between this event and this event, probability of the union is just the sum of the individual probabilities. So to do this by hand, we calculate the probability of x being less than or equal to 3 and add it to the probability of x greater than or equal to 7. x less than or equal to 3 is x is 0, x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3. And the event x greater than 7 is just 7, 8, 9, and 10. Have to calculate all of those individual probabilities, add them together, and we get the answer. If you do it by hand, there's no shortcuts on this, no special formula. It's just you got to use this formula properly changed for each of these. Now, if we want to do this in R, um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you would use the CDF function in R. Um, CDF, remember, is always less than or equal to. So we've got to change our less than or equal to 3 union greater than or equal to 7 into just two less than or equal to's. From chapter four, we got the complements rule. Uh, the probability of x being greater than or equal to seven is one minus the probability of x less than or equal to six, which means the probability that we need to calculate is just probability of x less than or equal to three plus this one minus probab probability of x less than or equal to six. Notice now all of our probabilities are cumulative. They're all less than or equal to which makes things rather easy. In R, this will be p binome 3, 
and then the definition of the binome, plus 1 minus p binome 6, plus the uh, trials and success probability. Notice we went from d binome to p binome. p is for cumulative probabilities, d is for what I call point probabilities. Uh, p is for less than or equal, d is for equal. Um, interstate war problem. Remember, I'm not going to do these. I will encourage you to do these yourself. I will require them as much as possible. Really not too much to say on these. There are more activities for you. Illustrating the calculations, some examples from the life of my, or time from my life as a um, consultant. So here's what we learned from this slide deck, the definition of the Bernoulli, definition of the binomial, expected value of a Bernoulli and a binomial distribution, the variance of both of those, applications, a lot of examples, got five examples. Again, you should go through to those. How to use R to calculate the point probabilities, the equals probabilities, cumulative probabilities, the less than or equal to's. Um, for the equals probabilities, you use D. For the less than or equal to, you use P. You'll want to download the all probabilities file. going to do the same thing with the Poisson in the future. We're going to see that these distributions do describe real-world events. We're going to repeat all this with continuous distributions. And we're going to realize that understanding the distribution of the data helps us to describe the underlying process better. And that will allow us to estimate parameters of interest. Um, covered two of these R functions in this slide deck, but I'm going to give you four of them. We looked at the D and the P versions. The D for the equal, the P for the less than or equal to, both of these calculate probabilities. You've seen the R version before. You saw that in a lab. R generates a random sample from that distribution. So D and P give probabilities, R gives a sample from the distribution, and Q will give you the quantile, or the percentile. Um, this will be useful for calculate, calculating medians, first quartiles, 97.5th percentiles, what have you. So the Q will calculate a data value, an X, corresponding to a given probability. And notice if you want to do Bernoulli random variables, just make sure size is equal to 1. Because really that's the only difference between a binomial and a Bernoulli. Um, R for starters, appendix A2 and A3 will help. Uh, Wikipedia's got a couple good pages on the Bernoulli and the binomial. And so here are the intralecture questions, not so intralecture for this section, but they're here. Um, again, on the left-hand side, write the question. Underneath of it, write your answer so that you can transfer that to your Moodle quiz. What are the five requirements of a binomial distribution? Again, you must memorize these. What is the difference between a binomial and a Bernoulli? And what is the formula for the expected value of a binomial random variable. And that's it. Um, hello and welcome to section 5.3, the Poisson distribution. Here we introduce a second discrete distribution and I'd like you to keep comparing it to the binomial to see what the similarities and the differences really are. So by the end of this lecture you should be able to determine what random variables follow a Poisson distribution. Um, by using the definition of a Poisson. Um, calculate the probabilities from a Poisson distribution both by hand and by R. And calculate the expected value, variance, median, probabilities associated with that pro uh, prob uh, Poisson random variable. <clears throat> 
So here's the definition. A random variable that is a count of successes over an area or a time period follows a Poisson distribution with an average rate parameter of lambda. Um, contrast this with the binomial distribution, which was a count of successes over a certain number of trials. Here it's over a, a time period. Um, so examples, heads flipped in an hour, as opposed to heads flipped in 10 flips, which would be binomial. Here it's heads flipped in an hour. Um, number of dents on a car. Um, number of errors on a page, number of terrorist attacks in a year, number of bacteria in a swimming pool, influenza cases in a week, wars in a year. Um, the binomial would be the number of states or countries at war in a year. Notice there's an upper bound to that. Um, or binomial would be the, the number of people in this class with influenza in a week, that also has an upper bound. Notice in each of those cases, you're, you're measuring the number of successes out of a total uh, population of n. Um, bacteria in a swimming pool would be a Poisson. A number of swimming pools in Galesburg with bacteria would be binomial. Um, notice what I'm getting at here is that for a binomial, it's the number of successes out of a number of trials. So the sample space is 0 through n. Whereas for a Poisson distribution, it's not the number of successes over trials. It's the number of successes in a time period or an area, in which case there is no upper bound. Um, therefore, the sample space for a Poisson is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot. It can be proven aka it's beyond the scope of this course, the probability mass function for a Poisson is, for a probability mass function, it's got the equals part, random variable is x, the value is little x, is equal to e to the power of negative lambda times lambda to the power of x, all over x factorial. This e is the natural log base, it's 2.7182, etc. Lambda is the average, that's the parameter that we have to give it, and x is the value that we want to find the probability of. It can be shown um, that the expected value and the variance for Poisson are both lambda. That's kind of cool. Um, we'll go with an example. Let x be the number of heads flipped in a minute. Um, given that I average 24 flips per minute. Um, notice I didn't say I am flipping the coin guaranteed 22 times, uh, 24 times in this minute. I'm saying oh, yeah, I average 24 flips per minute. If the coin is fair, then it's clear that x follows a Poisson distribution with lambda equal to 12. probability of getting no heads, probability of getting at most 20 heads, and the probability of getting at least one head in the first six seconds. Probability of getting no heads in that minute, so we're asking what's the probability x is equal to 0. We're given lambda is equal to 12, so it's a plug and chug, e to the negative 12, 12 to the 0, all over 0 factorial. Recall from chapter 4, 0 factorial is 1. So this is equal to 0 0.0000006114. In other words, if I actually do this experiment, flip the coin for a minute and come up with zero heads, then either I don't average 24 flips per minute, or the coin is not fair, or I should go out and buy a couple lottery tickets. Because this outcome is extremely rare. And R, this would be D plus 0, lambda equals 12. Again, D is for the probability, uh, calculating the probabilities of equals. Here, plus is for the Poisson distribution. 0, we're calculating the probability X is equal to 0. And we have to specify that lambda is 12. Because we're given lambda is 12. 
part two, what's the probability of getting at most 20 heads in that minute? So probability of x being less than or equal to 20, of the random variable being less than or equal to 20. This is a quote simple application of the probability mass function. This is equal to the probability x equals 0 plus probability x equals 1 plus the probability of x equals 2 plus the probability of x equals 3. OK, I'll stop there until we get to 20. Here's the PMF. We're just adding up for all those various values of x from 0 to 20. Easy way, since this is a less than or equal to, is to use the P form. Again, the stem is POIS for the Poisson. Calculate, calculating the probability of x being less than or equal to 20, and lambda is still to 12. Probability of getting at least one head in the first six seconds, at least. Notice x was flips uh, heads in a minute. We want to do this in six, six seconds, so we have to define a new random variable. Um, six seconds is a tenth of a minute. So the expected number of heads is just going to be 12 divided by 10. The number of heads in a minute divided by 10, because now we're in terms of 6 seconds. Plug and chug. y greater than or equal to 1. So we're, I guess this should be a y. So we're summing up from y is equal to 1 all the way up to infinity. This is going to take a long time if we do it this way. But we call the complements rule. Probability of y being greater than or equal to 1 is equal to 1 minus the probability of y equaling 0. And this part here is the probability that y is equal to 0. 1 minus that, that's y equals 2. We'll use a d for the equals and a 0. So there's about a 70% chance that I get at least one head in sec six seconds. Complements rule comes in really handy when dealing with Poissons. Let x be the number of wars in a year. Uh, from the binomial slide deck, we know that the average rate of wars in a year is 1 over 0.8462141. Um, fi section 5.1 gave us this. This one divided that would be 1.181734. So that's lambda for one year. I want to know what's the probability that we have five years without a war. If this is lambda for one year, the lambda for five years will be just five times that. Boom. And so probability of y is equal to zero is just 0 0.00271579. This is about 1 over 500, so we'd expect um, a 5-year peace streak to happen about once every 500 years, which seems to be borne out by reality. Real estate developer in Galesburg is looking to determine if it would be profitable to renovate the Ferris building downtown into a boutique hotel. To help determine this, he asked a student of mine who graduated last year um, to help estimate it. Um, John, the student, estimated the rate would be about 150 people per week. Um, the developer decided that a minimum of 130 per week would be needed to turn a profit. So if John is right, what proportion of weeks will not be profitable? So we're given lambda is equal to 150. We want to know the probability of being 130 or less. Or I'm sorry, less than 130. So this is the probability. This is not a cumulative probability because a cumulative would be less than or equal to. So we make it a less than or equal to by dropping the 130 by 1. It's now a cumulative probability. So we use P plus, because it's a Poisson, 129. And we're given that lambda is equal to 150. So about 4.5% of the weeks will not be profitable.
Another example, Galesburg crime. There's actually a few examples in part of example four. Um, reportedly, the number of violent crimes in Galesburg was 96 last year. So we're going to use that for our lambda. If there were four violent crimes last week, is there significant evidence of an uptick in the crime rate? Okay, so lambda is 96 per year. Um, I got four violent crimes last week, so we can make that lambda in terms of weeks by dividing 96 by 52. So if the number of violent crimes in a week, if x is that, and we're asked to calculate probability of x being greater than or equal to 4, and interpreting that, uh, we're given x follows a Poisson with lambda equal to 96. This is crimes in a year, divided by 52, so that would be crimes in a week. This is in the wrong direction. It needs to be less than or equal to. So this would be 1 minus x less than or equal to 3. Let's say less than or equal to, so we can use the p form of Poisson. 3 lambda is 96 out of 52. And we get 0.116. So what this means is if the crime rate stayed the same, that is 96 per year, then we'd observe four crimes a week about 11% of the time. That's rather large, really, taking everything into consideration. So it's not really evidence that the crime rate's gone up. That isn't evidence. Crime rate may have gone up, but this doesn't provide sufficient evidence for that. So let's say there were 16 violent crimes last month. Um, notice part A, it was four in a week. So we'd expect 16 in a month if it's four in a week for four weeks. So this really is, in some ways, the same question as last. But we're holding that increase of crime for instead of over a week, we're doing it over a month. So really, we're asking, does increasing the sample size affect the probabilities? So we're asking what's the probability, and we're supposed to interpret the probability of x being greater than or equal to 16. Given that lambda is 96 over 12, because it's written in terms of 12 months. Greater than or equal to 16 is 1 minus, less than or equal to 15. We're now less than or equal to, so we can use p form of Poisson, 15, lambda, and now we got probability of being 0 0.00823, that is very small. Um, in other words, if the crime rate stayed the same, we would expect to see 16 crimes in a month uh, less than 1% of the time. So this would constitute some evidence that the crime rate did go up this year. Now, the good question that you're thinking is, Okay, the last one it was 0.11 and this one's 0 0.008. The 0.11 it was relatively large, interpreted as being relatively large. 0 0.008 is relatively small. The 0.11 doesn't give us sufficient evidence. The 0 0.008 does. Where's the separation between doesn't give us the evidence and does give us the evidence? I'm not answering that now. But keep this in mind. In fact, over on the left-hand side of your notes, write something like, what's the difference or what's the separation between not enough evidence and enough evidence? Circle it. Make it stand out a little bit. Maybe put alpha around it a few times just to, so that we can refer back to that in the future. So here's a summary of the Poisson. Um, Poisson distribution models the number of successes over a time period or an area. Uh, parameter of a Poisson distribution is lambda. Um, this lambda is both the mean and the variance. Uh, we know the probability mass function of the Poisson that allows us to calculate probabilities from a Poisson random variable. In the future, we're going to look at the hypergeometric. Um, notice the hypergeometric is spelled correctly here, and also hypergeometric, we've 
bumped into that before in, in lab B, hyper or we're about ready to. Hypergeometric, like the binomial, models number of successes given a number of trials. So you gotta figure out what is the key difference between the binomial and the hypergeometric. And then chapter six will be the continuous distributions. Here are the R functions, two of these we dealt with, two of those are implied. They all have the stem POIS, and they all require specifying lambda, because those are the keys to a Poisson distribution. The D form uh, is for calculating probability of x equaling a value. The P form is for the CDF, calculating probability of x being less than or equal to a value. The R generates random values from a Poisson, and the Q form calculates the quantiles. Um, so if I want to calculate the median, I do Q plus of 0 0.5 and specifying whatever value of lambda it is. If I want to calculate the 10th percentile, I put in 0.1 for P. Uh, the readings, Hawks was section 5.3, R for stars, this is appendix A7. And as usual, Wikipedia's got a pretty good page on the Poisson distribution. It gives you a nice flavor of how far you can go with these probability distributions. So here's the intra lecture question for 5.3, or questions for 5.3. Question one, what is the parameter of a Poisson distribution? It is the parameter of a Poisson, hint it's called lambda. Question two, what's the difference between a binomial and a Poisson variable? I won't give you a hint on that one except to say go back over your notes to make sure that you have this written down. This is, this is important. And what's the formula for the expected value of a Poisson? That's also a pretty easy one. So of these three, the second one's going to be the tough one. And that brings us to the end of the Poisson distribution. Take care. Hello and welcome to the last section of chapter five. This will be the last named discrete distribution we'll be working with. Um, it's called the hypergeometric. This fe is featured in lab B. Um, so by the end of the lecture, you should be able to determine which random variables follow hypergeometric distribution using its definition. Identify the three parameters of a hypergeometric distribution and calculate the expected value of variance, mean, and probability associated with a hypergeometric random variable. Um, hypergeometric is rather difficult to work with, so don't expect too much work using the hypergeometric doing things by hand. Um, you'll see the probability of mass function and understand what I mean when you do see that. Uh, the hypergeometric distribution describes the probability of obtaining x successes in k draws or trials without replacement from a finite population that contains exactly m successes and n failures. <laughs> See, told you it was kind of complicated. Um, keys, two keys to this are it's without replacement, so you're drawing and you're not putting it back, and the population's finite. If you are uh, doing it with replacement, or if the population is infinite, then you've got a binomial random variable here. So this is a binomial constrained to a finite population without replacement. Um, it's, well, when you get to the lab, you'll understand that it's better, but as you work through this uh, uh, slide deck, you'll see why we tend to focus on the binomial uh, examples. Number of hearts drawn from a deck without replacement. So um, I draw five cards. What's the probability three are hearts if I don't replace? Finite population, capital N's 50, two, um, and it's without replacement. Uh, number of sophomores counted in the library without recounting somebody. Um, number of parolees that return to the Hill Correctional Center in Galesburg. In each of these cases, it's without replacement and the population's finite. So key. Um, so hypergeometric, finite, and no replacement.
Now you'll, you'll find out, and I think the lab helps with this, that if your population is sufficiently large but not infinite, then the advantage of using the hypergeometric is very small. You might as well stick with the binomial. Recall that the probability mass function provides the probability of each element for the sample space. For a hypergeometric random variable, this is the sample space. <laughs> see, notice automatically that we see that the hypergeometric is rather complicated to work with. Um, for the binomial, it's just from 0 to n. Here, it's the larger of 0 and k minus n all the way up to the minimum of k and m. Um, how do we parameterize this? There's lots of ways of parameterizing the hypergeometric. That's another frustrating thing with the binomial. It's always n and p or n and pi. For the hypergeometric, there's at least a half dozen ways. Um, in fact, Hawks uses a way that's different from either R or the Forsberg text. Um, the, uh, we can do it by successes and total, or by successes and failures, or by combination of the two. Um, but fundamentally, the probability mass function here at the bottom is just number of ways to su succeed times the number of ways to fail divided by the number of, of ways you can have those n trials. Um, and these are combinations, so review of chapter 4 would not be unwise. Um, so here's the probability mass function. It's m choose x times n choose k minus x divided by m plus n over choose k. X is the number of successes you care about. Um, M is the number of successes in the population. In this case, little n is the number of failures in the population. So X is the number of successes in your sample. K minus X will be the number of failures in your sample. And then the denominator is just going to be the total population size divided by the total sample size. And notice the switch here, k is now the sample size, not n. And trust me, this is one of the better parameterizations of the hypergeometric. Here's another one. Here, k will be the population successes, instead of little m. n will be the population size, which means n minus k will be the population failures. X will be the successes in your sample, and minus X will be the six, uh, failures in your sample. Here, N will be the sample size, so N choose N will be the denominator. They say the same things. They're using different letters to represent what those things are, but they're saying the same thing. This is the number of ways of getting X successes from the population. This is the number of ways of getting your specific number of failures in your population. And this is the number of possible samples you can draw from that population. Same as it was for the previous. Expected value of a hypergeometric does not need to be memorized. You've got this in your notes. So make sure you know where you can locate it. It's just k, your sample size, times p, the probability of a success in the population m is the number of successes, n is the number of failures, so n plus m is a population size. So this m over n plus m is just the probability of a success in the population. And that's the sample size, so it's essentially n times p, but we're using different letters. Here's the variance. It's your sample size times the probability of a success in the population times the probability of a failure in the population, times an adjustment factor. Notice this is, thinking back to binomial, this would be n times p times 1 minus p times some other number. Notice this number is always going to be between 0 and 1, which means that the variance of a hypergeometric is always going to be smaller than that of a binomial. That's important. Variance of a hypergeometric is always going to be less than 
or equal to, for extremely large sample sizes, that of a binomial, as long as k is not equal to 1. If k is equal to 1, then there is absolutely no difference between a binomial and a hypergeometric. Go back to the definition of a hypergeometric to see why that's the case. The big difference is with replacement or without. If you're only drawing one thing, it doesn't matter if you replace it or not. It's the same probability. This is another way of saying exactly what I did. Understand what the parameters represent. Don't get hung up on the formulas themselves. Understand that the expected value is just the sample size times the probability of a success in the population. The variance is n times p times 1 minus p times some adjustment factor. So here's a couple examples. Okay, here's a few examples. Uh, let x be the number of spades drawn out of four, car, uh, four draws from a deck of cards without replacement. If the deck is fair, then it's clear that x follows a hypergeometric with m equal 13, the number of successes in the population is 13, n, the number of failures in the population is 39, and our sample size k is 4. Success, failure, sample size. So here are the probabilities, or here are the questions. What's the probability of getting one spade? What's the probability of getting at most three spades? And what's the expected number of spades? Probability of getting one spade, plug and chug. Probability x is equal to one. We're given m is 13, x is one, n is 39. K is 4, 4 minus 1 is 3. A little check here. 13 plus 39 has to be 52. 1 plus 3 has to be 4. Why is that a check? This first refers to the number of ways of getting those successes. The second is the number of ways of getting those failures. And the total is just failures plus successes. So the probability of getting one spade is 0.43884753539. Here it is in R. Probability that x is equal to 1, so that's D, and a 1 there. This is a hypergeometric, so the stem is hyper. Parameters m is 13, n is 39, k is 4. By the way, this is the parameterization that R uses, M and K. Probability of getting at most three spades, this is a less than or equal to question. Less than or equal to three. Since it is a cumulative, a less than or equal to, we can use the P version. Three, M, N, and K. So the probability of getting at most three spades is 0.9973589. In other words, pretty good chance that you'll get at most three. What's the expected number of spades? Sample size times successes over trials. So the expected number of spades is going to be one. Make sure this result makes sense, especially thinking about lab B. A quarter of the deck is spades. I draw four, so I'd expect one. Example two, I wonder if STAT 200 attracts third year students at a greater rate than other courses. So X will be the number of third years in STAT 200. We know that the number of third year students at Knox is 356. We know the number of non third years is 978. We got that from the registrar's website. Therefore, those are population numbers. In this stat course, there's 41 students. 18 are third years. So we need to calculate the probability x is greater than or equal to 18. 
given m is 356, n is 978, and k is 41. This is in the wrong direction. It's got to be a less than or equal to. So using the complements rule, this is 1 minus probability of x is less than or equal to 17. This is what it is in R, 1 minus probability under hypergeometric of x being less than or equal to, oops, that should be a 17. So this number here should be 17, not 18. M, N, and K are given to us previously. This is probably around 0 0.005. Very small probability of this happening. Therefore, it appears as though third years are overrepresented in this course. Or, I'm wrong about M, N, and K. I trust the registrar to give me these two numbers. I know I can count to 41. Therefore, I'm going to conclude that third years are indeed overrepresented. If we were to pretend this was a binomial, we get a probability of 0 0.00537. Not much of a difference between these two. And the reason why there's not much of a difference between the two is because the population size is, quote, rather large. It's 1,300 or so. So once you get a large population, hypergeometric and binomial are essentially the same thing. I wonder if my Math 121 attracts fourth-year students at a lower rate than other courses. Let x be the number of fourth years in my Math 121 course. According to the registrar's website, we know the number of fourth years at Knox is 278. Non-fourth years is 1056. In my 121, there are 30 students. Three are fourth years. So I need to calculate the probability of x being less than or equal to 3 where x follows a hypergeometric distribution with m, n, and k equal to 278, 1056, and 30. p hyper, p because it's less than or equal to. We got it at the 3, I mean it right this time. m, n, and k given to us by the registrar's website and me being able to count the class. This is 10%. Because the probability is not that small, there does not seem to be much evidence that Math 121 attracts fourth years at a lower rate than other courses. 10%, not that small. Again, this goes back to, um, I think it was the binomial slide deck where we started talking about, okay, what's the difference between, no, it was the Poisson and the crimes. What's the difference between not that much evidence and sufficient evidence? So you might want to write in the, in the margin again, arrow there of asking the question. Difference between sufficient evidence and not sufficient evidence. By the way, 0 0.099 versus 0 0.102, hypergeometric versus binomial. Don't get me wrong, the hypergeometric is the correct distribution. And doing this by... Uh, using R is pretty darn easy. So there's no reason to use the binomial uh, approximation. But if you are doing it by hand or using some things that we will be doing in this class in the future that are predicated on the binomial, as long as your sample size is large enough, you can use those things, those future things, for both the binomial and the hypergeometric. So the summary, the hypergeometric models the number of successes out of a specific number of trials when the population is finite and the elements cannot be selected multiple times. There are multiple ways of parameterizing this distribution. I gave you two of them, but they all specify the sample size, the number of successes, the failures in the population in some way. Um, you saw the PMFs of the hypergeometric, uh, you know, the mean and the variance of the hypergeometric. Again, you should not spend your time memorizing those. Have them in your notes and make sure you're able to access them and use them. 
the future. Today was, the, or this lecture is the end of the discrete distributions. The future will be continuous distributions. That'll start with chapter six. We've got the four R functions. All of them have the stem of hyper for the hypergeometric. They all require you specify M, N, and K. Again, the D is for the equals probabilities. The P is for less than or equal. The R is for generating a random sample from that distribution. And the Q is for the quantile. So if I want the median, I'll put 0.5 for P, and I'll be able to get the median. If I want the third quartile, I would put 0.75 in here for P and get the third quartile. Course readings, section 5.4 in Hawks. This is appendix A6 in R for starters. Wikipedia's got an interesting page on the hypergeometric. Again, it'll give you a taste of where you can find the formulas if you forget them. And it'll show you a lot of things that we can do with this probability stuff. Which brings us to the three intra-lecture questions. Question one, what are the five requirements for a random variable to follow a binomial distribution? Yes, this is for the binomial distribution. You must know those five. Two, what's the difference between a binomial and a hypergeometric variable? And question three, what's the difference between a binomial and a Poisson random variable? So a little hint here, seems like we're focusing on the binomial as being the most important distribution in this chapter. If it seems that way, then good, because it is. But also you're seeing how close the Poisson and the hypergeometric are to the binomial when they are close. And by extension, when they're not close. And that's it. Take care. Hello and welcome to chapter six. In chapter six, we're talking about continuous distributions. Contrast this with the discrete distributions in chapter five. Um, chapter six in Hawks goes directly to the normal distribution, introduces some things that just kind of pop out of nowhere. Um, to help see where those things come from, I'm introducing two other distributions, the uniform distribution, which will be this lecture, and the exponential distribution, which will be the next. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to understand the difference between discrete and continuous random variables. Know the purpose of the probability density function. Notice this is the probability density function, not the probability mass function. Be able to prove that the density is not a probability. Know the purpose of the cumulative distribution function, CDF. Um, hint, it's the same as the purpose of the CDF with discrete random variables. Uh, be able to calculate probabilities using geometry or the CDF. In fact, we're going to figure out an easy way of calculating or creating the CDF um, for the uniform. And then understand the uniform distribution, its two parameters, <coughs> its sample space, its expected value, its variance, standard deviation, uh, median, things like that. So here's a definition of continuous random variable. It's a random variable with a sample space consisting of an interval of values. That means for continuous random variables, there is always a value between two other values in it. So there is no next to the continuous random variables. Um, for discrete random variables, you could list them off. There's a next to after one came two, after two came three. For a continuous random variable between any two values, there's always going to be another value. Um, examples of continuous, of actually continuous random variables, student height, age of a car, time spent at a stoplight, distance a golf ball goes, those are all continuous measures. Um, there's also a, a category <coughs> of random variables that are essentially continuous. They're, they're not continuous, they're discrete but we can pretend they're continuous and not lose too much, um, uh, not create too much error. In much the same way that when we were dealing with a hypergeometric distribution, 
if the population was, quote, large enough, we could use the simpler binomial and we wouldn't introduce too many errors. Um, such examples of, quote, near continuous random variables would be GPA, um, definitely a discrete distribution, but the distance between two levels of it is so small compared to the range that we can just pretend that it's continuous and not introduce too much by way of error. Annual salary, my salary is paid down to the penny. Uh, so the, the, the grid is the, a penny, but my salary is in tens of thousands of dollars. So that, that it's close enough to being continuous that we can pretend it's continuous. Same with gross domestic product, GDP per capita, crime rate, Number of ears of corn grown in Iowa, that's definitely a discrete distribution, but the distance between one ear and the next ear, that, that, that grid, is so small compared to the number of ears grown that we, it, we can pretend that it's continuous and not lose too much. What I'm getting at here is just like with the binomial, there are benefits to using the binomial when you can. Simplicity is, is the best. That even though the data are generated from a hyper, uh, hyper geometric. If this, the population is large enough, we can pretend it's binomial and not introduce too much error and then reap the reward of everything that comes from it being a binomial. Same thing here with these, quote, near continuous random variables. They're not continuous, they're discrete, but they're so close to being continuous that we can pretend they're continuous and reap all the benefits of a continuous random variable. And there are several. Um, the first continuous random variable that we're going to talk about is the uniform distribution. Um, the uniform distribution is a continuous distribution that describes random variables whose likelihood of occurring is constant across a specified interval. Notice the word probability is missing from that definition. Um, when we start talking about uh, continuous distributions, we have to start talking about likelihoods of events. Um, we'll be able to retrieve probabilities in a lot of cases, but we have to start talking about likelihoods. Um, if the random variable x has a uniform distribution, we're going to write x, and there's that tilde, is distributed as a uniform with parameters A and B. A is the lower bound, and B is the upper bound. If X is a uniform AB distribution, then the sample space is, <coughs> is all values between A and B. The expected value is just A plus B over 2. The variance is just the width of the interval squared over 12. Standard deviation is just the width of the interval divided by the square root of 12. In other words, it's the square root of the variance. This is the probability density function. For all x that's in the interval a to b, the likelihood is 1 over b minus a, or the density is 1 over b minus a. Outside the interval, the density or the likelihood is 0. It's a uniform distribution because each of the likelihoods is the same. In a probability density function, you're measuring the likelihood or the probability density. For the uniform, it's a constant between A and B. The height is going to be 1 over B minus A. Why is the height 1 over B minus A? This is a graph of the likelihood. Let me be clear. This is the graph of the density or the likelihood. This is not a graph of probabilities. Um, we know it's not a graph of probabilities because if A is 0, for instance, and B is 1 half, this width is going to be 1 half, and the height is going to be 2. And you can't have probabilities that are greater than 1. So this is clearly not a probability. Um, to obtain a probability, you just have to find the area 
corresponding to what you're trying to find, the event you're finding the probability of. So probabilities are just areas of the PDF functions. For most continuous distributions, that means we have to use calculus. For the uniform distribution, we can use high school algebra, or we can use sixth grade algebra. It's just squares and rectangles. No, now we know why it has to be, have a height of 1 over b minus a, because the interval length is a to b. It's the length is b minus a. And we know that the probability of something in this interval happening has to be 1. So the probability that x is between a and b has to equal 1. It's a rectangle, so b minus a, which is this width, times the height has to equal 1 because rectangles are width times heights, and therefore the height has to be 1 over b minus a. Um, note that the PDF has two purposes. One, it's to help the researcher understand the probability for a continuous distribution, and it's to help the researcher calculate probabilities of a continuous distribution. And in red, probabilities are areas under the density curve. Another thing that these PDFs can tell us is where the outcome is most likely. Um, here the, the likelihood is flat, therefore every value between A and B is equally likely. Um, if there was a mound to this, then those things near the high, those values around the highest, around the peak, that's the word, peak, will be more likely. So let's see how we do this. There's only one stoplight between home and school in the morning, my home and, and my school. It regularly cycles among green, 175 seconds green, 5 seconds yellow, and 180 seconds red. There's only one stoplight. Um, it's at Maine and Academy. It's, it's a doozy. Um, given that I stop at the light, in other words, given that the light's red, what's the probability that I wait at most 60 seconds? So let's define the random variable t as the time I spend waiting. And I want to find the probability that I wait at most 60 seconds. That t is less than or equal to 60. Because the time I wait does not depend on when I get there, notice it's the only light. If there were several lights I had to stop through, then it wouldn't be a uniform distribution. But because it's the only light, it is a uniform distribution. Because there's a definite lower and upper bound, the lowest that I will stop there will be for 0 seconds. And the highest that I'll stop there will be 180 seconds. Um, definite upper and lower bound, uniform distribution. We now have that t, the time I spend waiting at the light in seconds, is distributed according to uniform with parameters 0 and 180, or with minimum 0 and maximum 180 seconds. And again, we have to calculate probability t is less than or equal to 60, that I wait at most 60 seconds. The outside rectangle is the distribution of t. Specifically, it's the probability density function of t. The dark blue is the area that I want to calculate. It's the probability t is less than or equal to 60 seconds. To find the probability, it's just the area under the curve, of the density curve, corresponding to this width. The height's 1 over 180. The width of the dark blue is 60, so the probability of waiting at most 60 seconds is just 60 over 180. This should ring some bells from chapter 4 when you were talking about equally likely events. Because the PDF of the uniform is just a rectangle and because areas of PDFs are probabilities, and I want to emphasize that again, areas in PDFs are the probabilities. We just need to calculate the region of t less than or equal to 60. Height times width. 
So 33.3% chance <clears throat> that I wait at most 60 seconds. For the uniform, this is easy to do in our heads. If we want to use R, here's how we use R. Again, we're looking for a probability of t being less than or equal to something, so we use the p version. The stem for the uniform is unif. We're looking for the probability t is less than or equal to 60. Then we specify the parameters of the uniform. Min equals 0, max equals 180. And the keywords are min and max, not a and b. The CDF of a probability distribution, recall, is defined as a probability that random variable is less than or equal to some value. Traditionally, we give this a capital F. For continuous distributions without knowledge of calculus, this is frequently rather difficult to calculate. Um, however, for the uniform, we can just rely on middle school geometry. So we're back to our generic uniform distribution, ranges from A to B, which means the height is 1 over B minus A. We're going to let X move between A and B, and we need to find, calculate this area here. That's pretty easy. The area of this is just X minus A divided by B minus A. And surprise, you just calculated the CDF function. This is the CDF function. So if I want to calculate the probability, probability that x is less than or equal to 6, I put 6 in here for x, 6 in here for x. And I would have to know a and b from the definition of the uniform. I want to be clear. Calculating CDF functions usually requires calculus usually requires integration. But for those who've had calculus, integration is just a fast way of finding areas. And in this case, we've got geometry to help us find the area. The quantile function is the inverse of the CDF. We've bumped into the quantile function several times in the past. Um, it's the quantile function is a function of p. The CDF is a function of x. It's the same relationship here, by the way. CDF is a function of x that calculates p. Quantile function is a function of p that calculates x. They're inverses. So from the CDF, we know that p is equal to x minus a over b minus a. This is for the uniform. All we have to do is solve for x. So x is equal to p times the width plus a, the starting point. So this thing on the left is the quantile function. You're given p, you solve it for x. The first line, the thing on the right, was the CDF. You're given x to calculate p inverse functions. So here's the quantile function. We can use a capital Q to symbolize it. The quantile function for the uniform is just p times the width plus a, the starting point. So here's what we've learned in this slide deck. Actually, let's go back a page. So how can I use this quantile function? I can use it to calculate the median. Remember, the median is the 50th percentile. So to calculate the median of this uniform distribution, we put 0.5 in for p, 0.5 in for p, and solve. If we know what b and a are, we can come up with a number. If we don't know what b and a are, then we just got an expression. I will leave it as an exercise for you to show that the median of a uniform distribution is equal to the mean of the uniform distribution. All it takes is understanding what the quantile function is and a little simple algebra. Um, so here's what we learned in this slide deck. Actually, before we get to this,
Let's go to our intra lecture questions. There's three of them. Again, write the question over on the left hand side of your notes, answer below it so you can transfer that into Moodle. Question one, what is the difference between a discrete and a continuous random variable? Question two, what is the definition of a uniform random variable? And question three, what are the two parameters of a uniform distribution? And remember, you do have the pause button to use. Okay, let's go on to the uniform summary now. Here's what we learned in this slide deck. Uh, continuous random variables describe different phenomena than discrete random variables. They describe things that are continuous instead of counts. Um, in a discrete random variable, you talk about the probability mass function, which actually does give you a probability. Um, in continuous, you talk about a probability density function, which gives you a likelihood. And you have to calculate areas in order to turn that likelihood into a probability. Probability is the area under the PDF curve. The CDF is probability that the random variable is less than or equal to some value. Uniform distribution describes a random variable where all values are equally likely. The mean of a uniform random variable is a plus b over 2. It turns out that that's also the median, and I gave you that as a, a fun exercise. Future, we're going to look at the exponential and normal distributions. We're going to practice calculating probabilities using formulas, tables, and R. Going to continue thinking about the relationship between random variables around us and their distributions. The key part for chapters 4, 5, and 6 is starting to look at the world around us and think in terms of probability distributions. Here's the four R functions. Notice the stem for each is UNIF for uniform. For the density function, the PDF, it's just D. Uniform. Now we see what the D actually means. For the cumulative probability, it's P. For a random sample from this distribution, it's R. And then the quantile function is Q. And while we were here, we calculated the, P, uh, the CDF. We calculated the PDF as well. And we calculated the uh, quantile function by hand. We realize it's not that difficult, but let's be clear, it's not that difficult for this distribution. Once you go beyond something as simple as the uniform, it begins to get much more difficult. And sometimes you can't even determine what the quantile function or the CDF function is. It may not exist. The readings are for starters appendix B1 and B2. There's nothing in Hawks and uniform distribution continuous in Wikipedia. Now this is as far as you have to go. If you've taken some calculus and you want to see how to use it, I give you the calculus extra. But if you don't know calculus, skip over this and you will lose nothing. So how does one directly calculate the expected value for a continuous distribution? You use calculus. Refer back to the discrete case for the expected value. It was x times the probability of x added up over everything in the sample space. In the continuous case, you're integrating over the sample space of x times the probability density function. So this is the definition of the expected value in the continuous case. Similarly, this is the formula for the variance in the continuous case. Notice again, there's an x minus mu squared. And this f of x isn't a probability, but it sure looks like that's where the probability was in the discrete case. And instead of adding, you're integrating. There's another formula for the variance that's equivalent, and sometimes it's easier to use. Sometimes it's not. So for let's see how to use these formulas. <coughs> Expected value of x is the integral over the sample space of x times the density, dx. 
Sample space is all values between a and b of x times the density. The density is just 1 over b minus a dx. 1 over b minus a is a constant, so it can be pulled out. Integral of x dx is x squared over 2. x squared over 2. There's that 1 minus b, 1 over b minus a. And it's evaluated between b and a, between x equals a and x equals b. x equals b, this is b squared over 2 times 1 minus b over a. Subtracting off the evaluation at the lower bound, a squared, which gives us this next line. Now we can do some calculus, not calculus, algebra stuff. B squared minus A squared is B minus A times B plus A. Why did I know to do that? Well, there's a B minus A out here, and I knew this was the difference of squares. So the B minus A's cancel, and I'm left with A plus B over 2. Variance, same idea. I'm using the second formula for the variance, calculating what's called the second moment just the integral over the sample space of x squared times f of x dx, and then I'll subtract off the mean squared. Integral of x squared dx is x cubed over 3 times 1 over b minus a, evaluating between b and a, so it's b cubed minus a cubed over 3, and b cubed minus a cubed has a b minus a term to it, b cubed minus a cubed, who knows b minus a times b squared plus a b plus a squared. Now we got some canceling there going away. I combine these two fractions, a one-third and a one-fourth, common denominator is the 12. Ah, that's where the 12 comes from. Common denominator is 12, so this becomes 4 over 12, and this is 3 over 12. There's the 4, there's the 3 cancels, distribute the 4, distribute the 3, combine like terms, b squared minus 2ab plus a squared we know is equal to b minus a squared. It's amazing how much high school algebra does come in handy sometimes, which gives us our formula for the variance. Now it makes sense the b minus a squared. I mean the, the wider the interval, the more uncertain we are in the outcome, so it makes sense that the variance would depend on b minus a squared. Now we see where the 12 comes from. It comes from combining these two parts. And that's it for the calculus extra. Again, if you haven't had calculus, you shouldn't have watched that. And if you have had calculus, you see why you've had calculus. Take care. Hello, and welcome to the second lecture of chapter 6. This one covers the exponential distribution, and the previous one covered the uniform distribution. The uniform distribution was very good at modeling stuff that had a definite lower and a definite upper bound, and was continuous, and you knew nothing else about it, other than it had a definite lower, definite upper, and was a continuous random variable. An exponential distribution will be very useful when you've got a continuous random variable that has a definite lower bound of zero and no hard upper bound. So it's bounded on one side. Um, examples of this would be wait times. Um, so by the end of this lecture, you should be able to determine which random variables may follow an exponential distribution, specify the characteristics of an exponential distribution, compare and contrast exponential with uniform, calculate probabilities using the CDF, and quantiles using the CDF. Um, so here's the characteristics. It's a continuous distribution describes a random variable whose probability of occurring decreases with time. Um, it's frequently used to model, quote, time until something occurs when there is no upper bound. We say x follows or has a distribution of an exponential. The parameter for an exponential is lambda. Lambda is the rate of the thing happening. Sample space is from 0 to infinity. There is no upper bound. There is a lower bound of 0, but there's no upper bound. Expected value is 1 over lambda. The variance is 1 over lambda squared, which means that the standard deviation and the expected value of the exponential are identical. 
1 over lambda. The rate of something happening, well, if we remember our physics, the rate of 1 divided by the rate is just the frequency. So it makes sense that the expected value would be 1 over the rate because it's an average frequency of it happening. This is what the exponential distribution looks like, smooth, declining. The height happens at lambda when x equals 0. The probability density function is lambda times e to the power of negative lambda x for x greater than 0 and 0 otherwise. And again, it's important probabilities are areas under the density curve. Notice there's no rectangles here for us to play with, so calculating those areas is going to be a bit more difficult than it was in the uniform case. Let's go into two examples. Time between when I fill my bird feeder with seed and when Chunky the squirrel starts eating from the feeder follows an exponential distribution with an average time of 10 seconds. In other words, if we define t as the time in seconds until Chunky raids the bird feeder, t follows an exponential distribution with lambda equal to 1 over 10. Lambda is 1 over the mean. The mean is 1 over lambda. Lambda is 1 over the mean. We're given the average time is the mean time is 10 seconds. So what's the probability that he waits at most a half minute before chowing down on some awesome seed? Um, at most a half minute, so we're looking at the probability of t being less than or equal to 30. Dark color is what we need to calculate. Remember again, for continuous random variables, areas under the PDF curve are the probabilities. No rectangles to use. Can't use the tricks from last lecture. We're going to have to jump directly to the CDF function. I leave it as a proof for those who enjoy calculus to prove that this is indeed the CDF for the exponential distribution. What we did with the uniform, remember, is we created this ourselves. For the exponential, it's given to us, and we use it. For the normal, which is the next distribution in the next lecture, we realize there is no function. We have to use something else. So. We want to find the probability t less than or equal to 30. It's just the CDF at 30. Lambda is 0.1. x is 30. Here's the CDF function. 95% probability that Chunky will wait no more than 30 seconds to raid the feeder. This was a little bit more involved. If we got r open, might as well use r to do the calculations. It's a less than or equal to, so this is a p. The stem for the exponential is exp. We want to find the probability t is less than or equal to 30. And we're told lambda is equal to 1 tenth. We're not calling it lambda here. We're calling it rate. So be aware that this has to be rate. Example 2. Time I wait until the Gold Express bus comes follows an exponential distribution. My average wait time is 5 minutes. In this cold of winter, it takes 10 minutes for frostbite to start. So given this, what's the probability that I will have frostbite before the bus arrives? In other words, given that 1 over lambda is 5, what's the probability that t is greater than 10? This is not a CDF, it has to be in the form of a less than or equal to. But using the complements rule, we can easily change this into from p is uh, from t greater than 10 to 1 minus probability of t being less than or equal to 10. Chapter 4 pops up every once in a while. And this is probably the most important thing from chapter 4, the complements rule. 
So now we do is calculate the probability is less than or equal to 10. That's the CDF at 10, given that lambda is 20. Uh, sorry, 0.20. 1 over 5 is 0.20. Plug, chug, 13.5% chance that I get frostbite. Or it's 1 minus P, EXP, of 10. Rate equals 0.2. Again, it's P because we're looking at the CDF function. It's EXP because it's an exponential distribution. We can also calculate the median Um, remember the median is the value x tilde such that the CDF at x tilde is one half. The part on the left is the uh, CDF function evaluated x tilde, which is just one minus e to the negative lambda x tilde. 0.5 stays on the right. Now what we're doing now is solving for x tilde. Um, subtract 1 from both sides and then multiply through by negative 1. Gets us here. Take the natural log of both sides. Gets us here. Divide by negative 0.2. Gets us here. Remember the log of 1 half is negative log of 2. So the Median is 3.466 minutes, and we can show in general that the median is just mu, the mean, times log 2. And this is the natural log of 2. Or instead of doing all this calculation, in R is just Q, Q because we're looking at the quantile at 0.5. This will give us the median. EXP because it's an exponential. And the rate is 1 over 5. It's 1 over mu. We could also calculate the 90th percentile. Set the CDF equal to 0.9. And solve for x star. Or just put 0.9 in the quantile function and solve. Before we get to the summary, let's go ahead and put in the intra-lecture questions. There's three of them as usual. And again, as usual, write these on the left side of your notes, answer them, so you can transfer them into Moodle. One, give an example of a random variable that follows an exponential distribution, something other than the two examples that we did today. Two, what is the parameter of an exponential distribution? And three, what are the mean and standard deviation of an exponential distribution? Give me the formula for those. I did say mean and standard deviation. The reason I'm asking this is to set something in your mind so that you can contrast the exponential with the Poisson, because exponential and Poisson both use lambda as the parameter. Um, so here's a summary. Uh, we reminded ourselves that probability is the area under the PDF curve. The CDF function is x probability of x less than or equal to x. Um, in this case, we needed calculus to find the CDF, although the calculus extra is where we prove it. I just threw the formula at you. Exponential distribution describes a white wait time random variable, the time until something happens. Uh, the mean and variance of an exponential random variable are 1 over lambda and 1 over lambda squared, respectively, meaning that the standard deviation is going to be the square root of the variance. In other words, the standard deviation is 1 over lambda. Last distribution is the normal distribution. Um, normal distribution is the key distribution from Chapter 6. Um, when we get to chapter 7 and talk about the central limit theorem, I'll drive this home as to why the normal distribution is the most important. We cannot, there is no formula to calculate the normal distribution probabilities. We can either use the table at the end of the book, no, 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 or we can use R to do it. 
We're going to look at quantiles, otherwise known as percentiles, and we're going to, again, understand the difference between discrete and continuous random variables. Here are the R functions again. All of them have the stem EXP for the expected value, and all of them require that you specify what their rate is, and the rate here is lambda. D for the density, the little f of x. P for the cumulative probability, the capital F of x. R to generate a random value. Q for the quantile, so the median we'd use the Q EXP and then put in 0.5. For the 10th percentile we'd put in 0.1. For the 99th percentile, we'd put in 0.99. Uh, nothing in Hawks about this. R for starters, it's appendix B5. Uh, Wikipedia's got the exponential distribution. In the Wikipedia page, you'll see that there's actually two parameterizations for the exponential. The one that we're using in class, which is lambda, and the one that mm, ec uh, the uh, engineers tend to use theta, if memory serves me right. That's kind of the end. Again, if you are not a calculus person, you can stop here. If you are a calculus person and want to see the, how to actually create that CDF function, continue on. So here's a proof of the exponential CDF. Remember the definition of the CDF, it's the probability, otherwise an an area under this uh, under the PDF curve of the random variable being less than or equal to x for the exponential that means that you're integrating from 0 to that x value f of t is the exponential PDF probability density function dt substitute f of t is just lambda e to the negative lambda t this lambda doesn't depend upon t, so it can be pulled out. So we're integrating from 0 to x of e to the negative lambda t dt. Not too difficult. The integral of e to the negative lambda t is just negative 1 over lambda times e to the minus lambda t. Evaluated from t is 0 to x. This lambda and this lambda cancel, so we're left with just a negative e to the negative lambda t. Evaluated at x, subtract off this thing evaluated at 0. Here it is evaluated at x, subtract off, evaluated at 0. Notice e to the 0 is equal to 1. Subtracting off a negative 1 means you're adding 1. No simplification the first term. So we're left with CDF being 1 minus e to the negative lambda x. Again, this is for those who want to see that their calculus time was well spent, that it's used a lot in statistics and probability theory, and I'm sure it's used other places, but really I don't care. It's all about the statistics and probability and how we're using the mathematics. So I'm done. Um, have a good one. Hello and welcome to chapter 6 from Hawks. This lecture will cover uh, section 6.1 through 6.4. All four of those discuss the normal distribution. Um, because we spent some time building up things with the uniform distribution, the exponential distribution, we'll be able to cover the normal distribution in one rather lengthy lecture, but still just one lecture. Uh, by the end of this lecture, you should be able to discuss the differences between the uniform, exponential, and normal distributions. Know the expected value and the mean of a normally distributed random variable. It's kind of tricky because remember the mean and the expected value are the same thing. Sketch the graph of a normal distribution. Realize that capital N normal and lowercase n normal mean different things. The capital N normal refers to the distribution and lowercase n normal just means typical or not surprising. We'll be able to calculate probabilities of normal random variables and quantiles of normal random variables. So here's the arc that we've been working on. Chapter 5, we looked at discrete distributions, um, which included probability mass functions, PMF, um, calculated mean, the variances, sample spaces for those discrete distributions. Um, the discrete distributions we looked at were the Bernoulli, the binomial, the Poisson, and the hypergeometric. We also looked at 
generic discrete distributions in the first section of chapter 5. <laughs> chapter 6 looked at, looks at continuous distributions. I introduced the uniform distribution so you could get an idea that probabilities for continuous distributions were actually areas under the PDF curve, which meant the PDF curve was not probabilities, they were probability densities or likelihoods. We use the uniform to illustrate how to calculate the CDF, the cumulative distribution function, using simple high school geometry. And then we moved on to look at how to calculate the mean, the variance, the sample space, the median, other quantiles on the uniform. So that section on the uniform just laid the foundation for all the other important uh, features of continuous distributions. The second section was the exponential, where we did the same thing, but then we realized creating that CDF function, that cumulative distribution function, was not easy. And in that case, we had to use calculus to get it. Or it, came, it was given to us pop, fully formed out of the seafoam. Your choice. So we went from the uniform, where we created it ourselves and got a good feel for how it was created, to the exponential, where we had to use calculus if we wanted to see how it was created to this lecture it's normal and there is no CDF function um, which means that in the uniform we really didn't have to pay attention to the CDF we could calculate those probabilities in our head exponential we needed to use the CDF but it was a nice simple form that we could use for the normal we got to go to a table or to a computer and for much of the second half of the 19th century um, a lot of effort was spent trying to create those tables. It was pretty easy in the early 19th century to create a CDF function for, for values of, we're going to see z, between negative 1 and positive 1. That was pretty easy to do. Once you got outside that negative 1 to positive 1 realm, it got harder and harder and harder to get good estimates of those probabilities. Um, with the advent of computers, it's much easier. I mean, we could even do it. Um, today we're going to look at the normal, the probability density function for it, the CDF function for it, the mean variance sample space, median quantiles, aka percentiles, same stuff. We're going to see the function, the PDF function. We're going to realize, okay, we don't need to memorize that. We're going to see that we can't write out the uh, CDF function in any meaningful way, but we'll find out ways of calculating. Um, the Gaussian distribution apparently was named, or no, apparently about it. It was named after Carl Friedrich Gauss, um, who advocated for its use, aka created it. Um, or at least we think he created it. Those who stem from the German school of thought think he created it. Um, his first paper, though, was 1809. Um, it was Laplace who published a paper earlier than that using this distribution. Uh, that's why the French descendants call this the Gauss-Laplace, or just the Laplace distribution. But we're going to call it the normal distribution. Um, Gauss said, hey, wait a minute, Laplace, I was working on this way back in 1794. Um, no evidence of it except Gauss's word. Normal distribution arises from modeling observed randomness in astronomical and geodetic data. It arises in variables that have a specific expected value but demonstrate some minor random variation above and below. So for instance, um, this pop that I'm drinking now says that it contains 100 milligrams of caffeine. So I would not be surprised if the distribution of caffeine in these bottles followed a normal curve. That is, the mean would be 100, and there would be some variation above and below, because you can't get exactly 100 milligrams of caffeine every time. Um, there are two parameters to the Gaussian distribution, or to the normal distribution, the mean and the standard deviation, mu and sigma. The most important distribution in statistics because of the central limit theorem, which we'll see in Chapter 7. So for the record, if x, a random variable, follows or is distributed according to a normal distribution with mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma, then the PDF is, lowercase f, of x is this thing. 
Notice that the PDF depends on mu and sigma. Depends on sigma in a couple places. <coughs> However, recall to chapter 3 when we re looked at the standardized score, we can subtract off mu divided by sigma and we actually come up with another normal distribution. It's a normal distribution that does not depend upon mu and sigma. It's a standard normal distribution with mean zero standard deviation of one. So the normal distribution has two parameters, mu and sigma. The standard normal distribution has no parameters. And it's the standard normal that is tabulated in books. Here's a graph of the standard normal PDF. Notice that it goes off on both sides forever. This should raise some memories of the uh, empirical rule. Um, you will see sometimes that the PDF is symbolized with a lowercase phi, Greek letter phi, lowercase phi, lowercase f, because it's a PDF, and the CDF will be an uppercase phi. I don't think I have an uppercase phi on here. Here's the mean. Notice it's also the median. Normal distribution is symmetric, so mean and median will be the same. Notice also it's the most likely value because the distribute or the, the the likelihood function, the the PDF, is highest there. So this is the highest likely or the most likely value from this distribution. So the normal distribution, the mean, median, and mode are the same value. Here are the standard deviations. At this point, you should be able to say, hey, what I know what percent of the data or of this distribution is between negative 1 and positive 1. And what percent is that? No, 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 no. Oh, I'm sorry, I misheard you. Yeah, 68%. And what percent is between negative 2 and positive 2? Yep, about 95%. And between negative 3 and positive 3 is 99.7%-ish. Call the normal distribution is continuous, but it's not rectangular. And it can be proven that the CDF cannot be written out. Hence, late 19th century, early 20th century as well, working on estimating those probabilities. So you have to use a table or a computer. Table 1 uh, tabulates this CDF. Computer calculations are easier to perform, however. <coughs> They're more accurate, and they are more precise. The stem is norm. You have to specify the mean, m, and the standard deviation, s. P for the cumulative probability, Q for the quantile, R for generating random values. P, Q, R is the same as it has been with all the other probability distributions. STEM is norm and you have to specify M and S. So some examples. Um, intelligence quotient. By design, <laughs> The IQ measures in the United States follow a normal distribution with mu equal to 100 and sigma equal to 15. This is by design. This is how they create this test. What proportion of the U.S. population has an IQ less than 90? In other words, if... What RAM variable do I use? In other words, if this is the distribution of IQs in the United States, I want to find the area under the curve less than 90 the purple area. I want to calculate the probability that x is less than or equal to 90. Given that x follows a normal distribution with mean expected value of 100 and standard deviation of 15. Here it is in R. P for cumulative probability. Norm is the stem for the normal. 90 is the value. We're specifying m is equal to 100 and s is equal to 15. This comes out to be about a quarter of the population. Wait a minute. 
I can hear you saying, I thought this P only worked when it was less than or equal to. What is going on here? Are you trying to pull something over on us? The answer is no. Remember that x follows a continuous distribution. In this case, it's a normal distribution. That means that the probability of x equaling 90 exactly is 0. Think back to the uniform distribution. It's an area, so it's the base times the height. If the base consists of a single point, then the width is 0. And a width of 0 times whatever height is going to give you a probability of 0. So for continuous distributions, less than or less than or equal to are going to be exactly the same. What IQ value separates the lower 30 from the upper 70%? So we're looking for an IQ value. That tells me I'm going to be using a quantile. I'm looking for the 30th quantile or the 30th percentile. So I'm looking for this value here such that 30% is in purple. Q for quantile, we're looking at the 30th percentile, so it's 0.3 here, and we specify the mean and standard deviation. 92.13399. So approximately 30% of Americans <coughs> have an IQ score of less than 92.13399, and approximately 70% of Americans, that's everyone else, have an IQ of more than 92.13399. 30%, it's pretty frequent still. So in other words, IQ of 90, and no big deal. By design, IQs, etc., what's the proportion of Americans that with an IQ score between, oh, we haven't dealt with any between calculations yet, between 87 and 122? So we want this purple area between 87 and 122. For calculating cumulative probabilities, it's got to be in the form of less than or equal to's. So I can do less than or equal to 122, but that covers everything here, not just what we want. But notice I, that this region is less than 122 minus less than 87. Looking for this, this is just the prob cumulative probability at the upper minus the cumulative probability at the lower. So approximately 75% of Americans have an IQ between 87 and 122. That's a lot. And now we'll go for above. We did a less than, a between, now we'll do an above. It's probability of proportion of Americans have an IQ above 90. So this blue uh, purple area. Complements rule, this this purple area is just 1 minus the white area, 1 minus the white area. So again, about 3 quarters of Americans have an IQ above 90. So let's do a learning check. I'm going to ask some questions. I'll pause. You answer them on your own, out loud, because dog's watching you, and you really do want to talk to it. What type of random variable will have a normal distribution? A random variable with a definite target and some random variation added to it will tend to have a normal distribution. What's the difference between capital N normal and lower N normal? Capital N normal is, refers to the distribution itself. Lower end normal refers to the fact that something is not unexpected. What is the sample space of a normal random variable? All real values, there is neither a lower bound nor an upper bound. What is the expected value of a normal random variable? Very good, that's mu. 
It's one of the parameters. What is the variance of a normal random variable? Yes, sigma squared. It's the square of one of the other parameters. Remember, there are two parameters, mu and sigma. The variance is just the square of sigma. What R function is used to calculate cumulative probability for normal? Yep, cumulative probability, so it starts with a P for normal random variables, so it's P norm. And what R function is used to calculate the quantiles? Q norm, Q for quantiles, norm for normal random variable. Future, we're going to keep working with the normal distribution simply because of the central limit theorem. And we're going to use this normal distribution to estimate population parameters. But this, this last one, will be the second half of the course. Here are the R functions. None too surprising. The stem is norm. Then we got the D, P, R, and Q. Notice when we were dealing with the discretes, we used the D a lot. Now that we've moved on continuous, we really don't use the D. Um, I use the D norm to create those graphs, but really you don't use the D norm function at all. You focus on the P norm and the Q norm and the R norm. Here are some readings for you. R for starters, appendix B3, C1, and C2 and Hawk section 61 to 64. Normal distribution in Wikipedia is a good one. Um, oh, I haven't done the intra lecture quiz or questions. Here we go. Question one, give an example of a random variable that follows a normal distribution. Question two, what are the two parameters of a normal distribution? And question three, what are the mean and standard deviation of a normal distribution? Three, again, will be really easy. Two will be pretty easy. One, eh, that'll take some thought, but it'll be easy. Oops, went too far. Um, so I guess I'm done. Hello, and welcome to this last section of chapter six. This is where we're going to use the normal distribution to approximate the binomial distribution. Notice this is rather interesting because the normal distribution is continuous and the binomial distribution is discrete. So indeed we can approximate discrete distributions using these, the, the continuous distributions. <coughs> so by the end of this lecture you're going to be able to describe the normal and the binomial distributions. You're going to see how the normal <laughs> can be used to approximate the binomial. You're going to calculate the approximate binomial probabilities and understanding why the binomial is useful, even if we have a computer to calculate them exactly. Um, so here's the arc. <clears throat> We've examined recently discrete distributions, of which the binomial is one, and continuous distributions, of which the normal is one. We looked at probability mass functions, means, variances, sample spaces for the discretes, We've looked at probability density functions, means, variances, sample spaces. The CDF can be applied to both discrete and continuous, as can median and quantiles. Today we're going to <coughs> approximate one distribution with another. So the first thing we have to do is explain what we mean by uh, approximating one distribution with another. Um, the short answer is that the cumulative probabilities are close. Um, that is, if x1 and x2 are different distributions that are approximately the same, then this relationship holds for all values of little x. Of course, there is a whole lot of detail hidden in that little tilde, that, I'm sorry, that approximation sign. Um, if x1 is approximately the same as x2, how close is close enough? Um, how approximate is necessary? Uh, it's a question of precision, and we leave that up to the scientist, um, not the statistician. The scientist comes to me and say, uh, says, I need probabilities to be within 0 0.003 of each other. From that information, I can say, okay, I need a sample size of 1,300, or something like that. 
Um, so we're going to approximate the binomial x1 with the normal x2. That is, we'd like to determine some rules on n, p, mu, and sigma to ensure that this relationship, this approximation relationship, is true. Now, surprisingly, it's not as difficult as it seems to get a good first order approximation. Uh, what do we remember about the binomial? We remember these five requirements, and again, you need to have these memorized. <clears throat> the number of trials is known. Each trial is a Bernoulli trial. Success probability is constant. Trials are independent, and the random variable is the number of successes in those trials. Um, this led to an expected value and variance of NP and NP1 minus P. So from this, it's nat natural for us to see just how well this x2 distribution, which is a normal, how well this approximates the binomial, where the mean is np and the variance is np1 minus p. In other words, we want to see how far apart those CDFs are. So here's the CDF of a binomial 5.1. Um, n is 5, p is 0.1. This is CDF. Here's the graph of a normal uh, 0.5 and 0.45. So this normal is, according to the rule, this will be the x2 distribution. And this should illustrate how close they are. Midway between the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it's right on, or really, really close. The closer you are to one of the integers, the worse off it is. In fact, here is a uh, animated graphic of the difference in the CDFs between the binomial and the normal. Sample size is up here. Um, this is the value of x. And the, the height here for any value of x is binomial CDF minus normal CDF. Notice we have spikes at the integer values. Now, I would love to press play, but unfortunately, this, uh, this uh, Adobe Acrobat type program isn't Adobe Acrobat. So I'm going to have to open up this file separately. Um, notice sample size is changing. Notice also the worst is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So here we are at about 70. It's the worst is 0.05. We're coming up on 100. The worst looks to be about 0.045. Let me just keep this running and notice that the error, the worst error, tends to go to zero as the sample size increases. But notice that it doesn't go to zero too quickly. Here we are at a sample size of about 200, coming up on 200. We're going to see that's only about 0.03. Worst error is 0.03. And we start over again. And I don't know how to stop that from continuing. Uh, 0.03 as the difference between the normal and the binomial CDF. That's 0.03, which is a probability, so that's a large difference. So if the correct probability is 0.57, then this error could be anywhere from, or this would be anywhere from 0.54 to 0.60. That's, that's a big range, big error <coughs> introduced. But as you saw, it's a sample size increase that the worst absolute error uh, went to zero. So large sample size, um, we can go ahead and say the normal and the binomial are close enough. That also kind of leads to the physicist who tells me I need to be within 0 0.03. 0 0.03, I can come back and say, OK, sample size needs to be at least 200. Or the physicist comes to me and she says, I want it to be within 0 0.003. I'll come back with, OK, sample size needs to be at least 20,000 or whatever. So one conclusion is the approximation increases as values of n increase.
And we're going to see that again when we get to the central limit theorem in chapter 7. Um, with additional exploration, we could come to a second conclusion that the approximation is better for values of p close to 0.5. Um, the example I gave you, p was 0.1. So if p is close to 0.5, we don't need as large a sample size as we do if p, uh, p is 0.1. So combining these two observations leads to the following quote, rule of thumb and this rule of thumb tends to change from source to source. Um, the normal distribution is sufficiently close to the binomial if both np and n times 1 minus p are at least 5. Um, I happen to think 15 or 20 is a better rule for that. And if I need a lot of precision, that I'll need NP to be at least 1,000 or maybe 2,000. And the approximations improve by using, quote, a continuity correction of 0.5 added to or subtracted from the number value. We'll have an example of that shortly. Um, this is not the best correction, but it's a good correction. So we're going to use a cont continuity correction factor to describe the area under the normal curve that approximates the probability that at least two people in a math class of 50 regularly cheat on their tests. Assume the number of people in the math class of 50 who consistently cheat on their tests has a binomial distribution with a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 2.12. So in other words, if x is the number of students cheating in the class, x follows a binomial of 50 with a p of 0.1. We need to calculate the probability that x is greater than 2. So we're going to begin by converting the discrete number 2 into an interval by adding 0.5 and subtracting 0.5 from it. Uh, the discrete number 2 is changed to a continuous interval from, point, uh, from 1.5 to 2.5. Here's a picture of that. So for the discrete, we could just use 2. <coughs> for the continuous, because the probability of x equal to is 0, just like x equal to any single number, we need to change it into an interval. So that 2 will, will be replaced by the interval from 1.5 to 2.5. Now we're going to draw a normal curve with a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 2.12. Those were given to us. And indicate the interval from 1.5 to 2.5 to represent the number 2. That's what this is. The red curve's the normal of mean 5, standard deviation of 2.12. And I've got the value of 2 in the double shaded, or the shaded and hashed. Now we're going to shade the area corresponding to the phrase, quote, at least 2, because we need to calculate the probability of at least 2. And that's the blue shaded area. It's this hashed part, which is 2 and above. So in other words, if x is binomial and y is the normal approximation, the probability of x greater than 2 is about probability of y greater than or equal to 1.5, because it's everything blue. If I were calculating the probability of x being less than 2, it would be y less than or equal to 2.5. Use a normal distribution to estimate the probability of more than 55 girls being born in 100 births. So exactly we need to calculate the probability x is greater than 55. Given x follows a binomial distribution out of 100, p of 0.5. Using a normal approximation, that means we're going to find a y variable to follow a normal distribution, y follow a normal distribution, the expected value of 50, 100 times 0.5, and variance of 100 times 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5. And we're going to calculate the probability that y is greater than 40, uh, I'm sorry, 
that y is greater than 54.5. There we go. Now we could calculate the exact answer of 13%. 1356 to 65. Notice how close the approximation is, though. This is using the p binom, and this is using the p norm. Very close. And the sample size is only 100. I say it's very close. We're off on the fourth digit, fifth digit. So if I need precision beyond the fifth digit, then I'm going to have to have a larger sample size. If I did not use the continuity correction, I'd be much further off. After many hours of studying, you believe you have a 90% 90, <coughs> 90 probability of answering any given question correctly. Test is 50 true-false questions. Oh, that would be horrible if I gave you 50 true-false questions for the test. Or would it? Nah, I wouldn't do that. Assuming that your estimate is the true probability that you will answer a question correctly, let's estimate the probability that you'll miss no more than four questions. So each of the 50 true-false has a probability of 90% being right. Uh, we want to say missing no more than four questions, so the probability of missing will be 0.1. 50 questions, this is the exact distribution of x, this is the exact uh, probability to calculate. We can approximate this binomial with a normal. y will follow a normal distribution of expected value 50 times 0.1 and variance of 50 times 0.1 times 0.9. And we'd calculate the probability that y is less than or equal to 4.5. Oops, too far. 40%. The real answer is 43%. So I'm off by 2.5%. Many toothpaste commercials advertise that 3 out of 4 dentists recommend their brand of toothpaste. Using a normal distribution <coughs> to estimate the probability that in a random survey of 400 dentists, so we'll be using random sampling, simple random sampling, exactly 300 will recommend brand X toothpaste. We're going to assume the commercials are correct, and therefore there's a 75% chance that any given dentist will recommend brand X. So if X is the number in that sample of 400, X follows exactly a binomial and a 400 p of 0.75 and we need to calculate exactly x equals 300. The approximation y will follow a normal distribution expected value of 400 times 0.75 variance of 400 times 0.75 times 0.25 and we need to calculate the probability that y is between 299.5 and 300.5. And we get 0 0.046, 04, 03. And the real answer is 0 0.046, 02, 432. So the normal distribution with the continuity correction did a very good job here as well. Without the continuity correction, this would be terrible. In fact, without the continuity correction, the probability estimated would be zero because you'd be calculating the probability that y was equal to 300. <clears throat> so learning check. What's meant by the normal distribution approximates the binomial. Correct. Their CDFs are, quote, close. Um, what are two requirements for the approximation to be, quote, good? Right. Uh, n times p is at least 5, and n times 1 minus p is at least 5. Again, I would recommend higher numbers for those if I really, really care about the results. Um, how do we make the approximation better? 
algorithm? Yes, larger sample size. You'll find in statistics that a larger sample size solves a whole lot of problems. Um, from the economic standpoint, however, larger sample size causes problems because it costs time, money, other resources to collect that larger sample size. What is the continuity correction? Why is it used? Very good. Continuity correction is used to help ensure that the normal approximation to the binomial is, quote, better. Continuity correction itself is to uh, treat an equals as adding 0.5 and subtracting 0.5 and calculating that interval. In the future, we're going to explore the normal integrator detail. We're going to use the central limit theorem, which will be chapter 7, and discover that the binomial is not special, the normal distribution is. Um, here's a question that you may have. We, we have a computer. We can easily calculate these binomial probabilities exactly. Why do we still need to approximate a binomial with the normal? And here, here's the answer. Um, the examples that were given today were given where you could calculate exactly and approximately and, and compare, just so you get a feel for how, how good this approximation is. When we get to trying to estimate a single proportion, we're going to stick with the exact way of doing it, using the binomial distribution and everything we know about the binomial. However, when we start to look at comparing two proportions or trying to estimate the difference between two proportions, two population proportions, we won't be able to use an exact distribution because we would need to find the distribution of the sum of two binomials, and that doesn't exist. However, we do know the distribution of the sum of two normals. That's a normal distribution. So we would use, we would have to use the normal approximation when we start comparing two proportions. Until we get there, we, we can use the exact form. Now with that said, some books, and I think Hawks does this, Hawks will use the normal approximation for even the one population parameter, est uh, population proportion estimating. Um, so there is reason to look at this approximating the binomial not just it's the next section in the chapter. Um, here are the R functions. We've seen these already, D binom, P binom, and P norm. Here's some readings. Appendix C, an R for starters, and Hawks uh, section 6.5, and then Wikipedia central limit theorem. Um, Appendix C and the central limit theorem in Wikipedia will give you good background um, for chapter 7. And this approximating the normal uh, approximating the binomial distribution with the normal is actually a result of the central limit theorem. Um, so questions? Where are those questions? There they go. Question one. Again, I recommend writing these questions in the left hand side of your notes, answering them below so you can transform the uh, trans put them into Moodle quiz. What does it mean for one distribution to approximate another? Question two, what are the mean and the standard deviation of a binomial? Question three, what are the mean and standard deviation of a normal distribution? And that's it. Take care. Hello and welcome to section 7.1 where we introduce the central limit theorem. Um, central limit theorem, I would argue, is the most important theorem in all of introductory statistics. In fact, I'd argue it's the most important theorem in all of statistics. It helps to explain that when we have data that comes from a continuous distribution and we're trying to estimate the population mean, we don't really care that much about the distribution of the data. We just, quote, pretend that the data comes from a normal distribution because the central limit theorem says, hey, regardless of where the data comes from, the sample means follow a normal distribution. And it's the sample means that we're going to use to understand our population mean in the future. So from this point forward, when we're dealing with continuous data, the sample means are going to follow a normal distribution, or it's going to look like a normal distribution. And we see that in lab C. 
So by the end of this lecture, you're going to be able to state the central limit theorem, state the requirements for applying it, and state its consequences. Um, so in recent computing activities, we've examined drawing random samples from a known distribution. We've looked at calculating sample means from subsets of those distributions. We've created histograms of the distributions of those sample means. Today, we're going to examine the central limit theorem, which kind of gives a mathematical explanation for everything that we've observed about those sample mean distributions. So here's the statement of the central limit theorem. Um, let x be a random variable with a mean, we're going to call that mean mu, and a finite variance, uh, sigma squared. And we're going to draw a random sample of size n from this distribution. So that first paragraph is all about the data itself. The data comes from some distribution with a mean and a variance. Second paragraph. Then the distribution of the sample sums converges to a normal distribution as n gets larger. So the first paragraph said we don't care about the distribution of the data. Second paragraph says therefore the distribution of the sample sums converges to a normal distribution. So the data could be exponential, the data could be uniform, the data could be binomial for all we care. It's the sample sums that are going to be normally distributed as n gets larger. Specifically, this thing on the left is just how we represent sample sums. We're adding up, this is a big summation, adding up over all n values in our sample, those values. It converges in distribution, that's what the D on top of the arrow means, it converges in distribution to a normal with the expected value of n times mu and a variance of n times sigma squared. We've actually kind of seen something like this in the past, but let's keep working forward. Um, the proof of this theorem is beyond the scope of this course. I think the first time you get to see it is in Math 321. Um, happens at the end of Math 321 after you've learned about these things called moment generating functions. Um, so our first intra lecture question is here. Again, on the left hand side of your notes, write the question, write the answers so that you can come back to it later. Remember you got the pause button. So there are three co main consequences. Um, central limit theorem tells us the following. One, it tells us that the sum of independent random variables is more normal than the distribution of the variable itself. Of course, if the data do come from a normal distribution, you already start at normal, so you don't have any place to go. But if you start at uniform, it takes a little bit to get to normal. If you start at exponential, it takes a little bit longer to get to normal. Um, Recall that the binomial is the sum of independent Bernoulli random variables. We use that fact to prove things about the binomial, specifically the expected value and the and the expected value and the variance. Um, Poisson happens to be the sum of independent Poissons. We've alluded to that in the past, um, but that means that as n increases, the binomial becomes more normal, and as lambda increases, the Poisson becomes more normal. It's because the Poisson is just the sum of independent Poissons and a binomial is the sum of independent Bernoullis. It's kind of powerful right there. Uh, second uh, consequence is because the sample mean is just the sample sum divided by a constant, the central limit theorem tells us that the distribution of sample means will tend towards normal. And again, if the data starts with the normal, this tending towards happens immediately. If it starts with the uniform, it takes like 10 to get there. If it's an exponential, it takes like 50 or so. But eventually, those sample means will become as close to normally distributed as you want them to be. You just have to get a larger n sometimes. And the third, um, the speed of convergence uh, depends on how close the data are distributed to normal. Um, the closer they are to normal, the faster. Thus, the normal, if the data actually do come from a normal distribution, then the sample means are immediately normal. Um, the Poisson is closer to normal than, the, uh, than s many of the binomials, so you'd need a lambda smaller than the n for a binomial. Um, so Poisson's converge faster. Um, 
let's look at the next introduction question. It's going to ask you about the uniform and the exponential. Oh, no, it won't. Well, it will pretty soon. So question two is state the second consequence of the central limit theorem. And then I'm going to pause. Then I'm going to go directly to question three, which talks about the third consequence. Um, since the speed of convergence depends on how closely the data are to normal, as a missing L, which of these two will converge the fastest? If the data follow a uniform, will that converge? Will the sample means converge faster to the normal than if the data follow an exponential? Remember to write down the question on the left, answer it so that you can transfer it into Moodle. Um, again, if the data follow a uniform, will the sample means converge to normal faster than if the data follow an exponential? Pause, moving back. Um, so here's one of the big uses that is used sometimes. Um, let x follow a binomial distribution. Remember there are two parameters for binomial n and p. Um, we're going to use the central limit theorem to approximate the distribution of x. We actually did this back in section, I believe it was section 6.5, but here we're going to see why it actually works. Um, or we're going to apply a mathematical reasoning for why it works. Remember the binomial is just the sum of n independent Bernoullis. That is, if y sub i follows that Bernoulli, then x being the sum of those y's follows a binomial of np. So according to the central limit theorem, since it's the sum of independent distributions, the x is going to be approximately normal with a mean and a variance. That mean is just going to be the mean of this binomial. Well, what's the mean of a binomial? It's n times p. And the variance is just going to be the variance of this binomial. Well, what's the variance of a binomial? n times p times 1 minus p. So this gets us directly to the approximation of the binomial with the normal in about one step. More importantly for us, okay, never mind. Um, we're going to let e x, for another example, follow a uniform, a, b. a is the minimum value, b is the maximum value. We're going to use the central limit theorem to estimate the distribution of the mean of a sample of size n. Remember that x bar, the mean, is just 1 over n times the sample total. And we represent the sample total this way. And so by the central limit theorem, t follows approximately, the dot on top of the tilde means approximately follows, a normal distribution, n times mu, and n times sigma squared, where mu is the mean of the underlying distribution of the x distribution, and sigma squared is the variance of that underlying distribution of the x distribution. From our knowledge of the uniform, we know that the mean of the uniform is just a plus b over 2, and the variance is b minus a squared over 2. So the sample sum is approximately normally distributed with expected value n times a plus b over 2, and variance of n times b minus a squared over 2, uh, over 12. Remember, the question was originally about the distribution of the sample mean. And x bar is just 1 over n times t. That means the, uh, that x bar approximately, again, dot on top means approximately follows a normal distribution. Expected value of mu, uh, n times mu divided by n. And n times sigma squared divided by n squared. So the expected value of x bar is a plus b over 2, which happens to be mu. And the variance of x bar is b minus a squared over 12n. Now, notice something that we didn't notice before. The expected value of x bar is mu. The variance of x bar is smaller than the variance of x. So as n increases, the variance decreases to 0, which means these x bars that we actually measure from a sample, 
the observed x-bars, are going to tend to be closer to the mu. So in other words, as n increases, the precision of our little x-bar increases. So the big question that comes in here is why is there an n in the denominator of the variance? Recall that the variance is defined as the sum of x minus mu squared times the probability of that x value. So the variance of a times x is just the sum of a times x minus a times mu squared times the probability of the x value. Factor out an a from both of these out front, that gives us an a squared times x minus mu squared times the probability of the x value. This is just a constant, has nothing to do with the i, pull it out. So we've got a squared times the sum of the x minus mu squared times p of x. So the variance of ax is just a squared times the variance of x. In other words, where does that squaring come from? It comes from the fact that the random variable itself is squared in a variance. So when we found the variance of x bar, that was just the variance of 1 over n times t. Pull the 1 over n out front, it's 1 over n squared times the variance of t. There's 1 over n squared. This n times b minus a squared over 12, that's the variance of t. The n on top cancels with one of the n's on the bottom. That gets us our variance of x bar. So a learning check. What is the main consequence for the central limit theorem? I'll just pause for a little bit. You can go ahead and hit the pause button to give yourself some more time. The main consequence for the central limit theorem is that the sample means will become more and more normal. What are the requirements for the central limit theorem? The expected value and variance both have to be uh, finite. And the x's have to be independent. Why does this mean we should focus on the normal distribution as we move forward in the course? When we care to estimate the population mean, we're going to use the sample mean. And since the central limit theorem tells us the sample means are going to eventually follow a normal distribution, as long as n is large enough, then we should just focus on this normal distribution. R for starters, this is appendix C3. Hawks, this is section 7.1. Demov Laplace theorem is interesting. Uh, of course, Wikipedia's got a really good entry on the central limit theorem. And that's the end for section 7.1, um, the central limit theorem. By the way, you will see the central limit theorem at least in the next two lectures, but in undergirding all lectures from this point forward in this course. So, enjoy. Hello, and welcome to section 7.2. Last section we looked at the central limit theorem. Here we're going to be applying the central limit theorem to the distribution of sample means. Um, so by the end of this lecture you should be able to state the central limit theorem and to apply the central limit theorem to the problem of sampling distribution of the mean, or what most books just refer to as the sampling distribution. Um, so here's the arc, the way what we've been talking about. So recently we've examined drawing random samples from a known distribution. We've calculated sample means from subsets of those distributions. We've created histograms of those distributions. We've seen that those histograms tell us that the sample mean distributions look pretty darn normal. In the last slide deck, we introduced the central limit theorem that says, yes, they do look pretty darn normal, and that's not, a, that's not an accident. Uh, we've looked at the central limit theorem and its requirements and its consequences. And the main consequence is the distribution, the sample means, tends towards normal as the sample size increases. So today we're going to uh, examine the central limit theorem in terms of what it tells us specifically about the distribution of the sample mean. In the next lecture, it'll be about the distribution of the sample proportion. But if you think back to section 7.1, in fact, if you think back to when we first introduced the binomial distribution, we realize that the sample proportion and the sample mean are not that different at all. Mind so, here's the statement of the central limit theorem again. 
Let x be a random variable with a finite mean and finite variance. Let us draw a random sample of size n from this distribution. Remember, random sample means it's an independent sample. Each of those x values are independent of the others. And again, note that that first paragraph talks about the distribution of the data. So the data have a mean and a variance, and the data were generated from some sort of independent process. That's all we need from the data. The data is the prerequisite to the central limit theorem. So then, and here this part is the consequence of the central limit theorem, the distribution of the sample sums converges to a normal distribution. Notice the only thing we need from the data from paragraph 1 is that it has a mean, a variance, and is from a random sample. That tells us, paragraph 2, that the distribution of the sample sums converges to a normal distribution. So here's our first intra-lecture question. State the central limit theorem as I have stated it in this lecture. That question's pretty familiar to us. Again, write the question on the left-hand side, answer it on the left-hand side of your notes. Therefore, when you get to Moodle, you can write it in nice and easily. Here's a corollary of it. It's the distribution of the sample mean. So we're going to start with x being a random variable, mean mu finite variance sigma squared, draw a random sample of size n from this distribution. In other words, that first paragraph, notice, is exactly the same as the first paragraph of the central limit theorem. Therefore, those tell us that we can now apply the central limit theorem. Consequence of this is the distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal. Here's some notation. x bar is the sample mean. Sub n, we're going to index it by n to indicate the sample size. This converges in distribution to a normal expected value of mu, variance of 1 over n times the variance of the original data. Here's the proof. From the central limit theorem, we know this is true. We get this from that first paragraph. This first paragraph, same as in the central limit theorem, so this is the consequence of that first paragraph. Boom. Now we wonder about the distribution of x bar. Well, x bar sub n is just 1 over n times the sum of those xi's. Hey, look at this. The sum of the xi's, what distribution does that have? Normal. Boom. Expected value of the sum of the xi's is n mu. Expected value of 1 over n times the sum of the xi's is mu. The variance of the sum of the xi's is n sigma squared. The variance of 1 over n times those xi, uh, the sum of the xi's is 1 over n times sigma squared. Why are we dividing by n instead of having just sigma squared? Well, subproof 1, this is why the expected value of x bar is mu. I want to find the expected value of x bar sub n, substitute, pull out because expected value is a linear operation. Expected value of ax is a times the expected value of x. In this case, a is at 1 over n. We know the expected value of t is just n mu. The n's cancel. That was easy. Subproof 2 with the variances. We want to find the variance of x bar sub n, substitute. 1 over n times t. Pull out that 1 over n. It's 1 over n squared. Why is it now squared? Look back to the lecture on uh, section 7.1. It's because there's a square in the calculation of the variance of the random variable. Variance of t is just n sigma squared. That n and one of these cancel out, so we're left with 1 over n times sigma squared. And that brings us to the conclusion of the corollary. And this is exactly what we just showed. So let's have a couple intra-lecture questions. Question two, how does the distribution of the sample mean depend on the distribution of the data? And might as well do question three now while we're at it. 
Since the speed of convergence depends on how closely the data are to normal, I got the L in there finally, I edited it, which of these two will converge fastest, the uniform or the exponential? Yep, question one and three are from the last slide deck. Question two is kind of the key, uh, is the most important part of this slide deck. So let's go back to some examples. Example one. Let's say I draw a sample of size 14 from a population that has a mean of 126 and a variance of 42. What's the approximate distribution of the sample means? Notice I didn't tell you that x followed a normal distribution. I didn't tell you x followed a uniform distribution. I didn't tell you x followed an exponential distribution. It doesn't matter. I know x has a finite variance. Therefore, I can apply the central limit theorem. Whether or not n equals 14 is large enough for this approximation to be good, that's another question. All I want is an approximate distribution of the sample means. So this is a straightforward application of the main corollary from this section. Um, approximate distribution of the sample means, x bar is approximately normally distributed the expected value mu of x bar being 126, the same as the expected value of the original distribution, and variance of being 1 over n times 42. 42 is the original variance, or I'm sorry, the variance of the original distribution. So 1 over n times that sigma squared. 42 over 14 is 3, so x bar approximately normal mean of 126, variance of 3. Example two, I've been told that the average adult height for males in the United States has mean of 69 inches and standard deviation of three. What's the probability of having the mean of a sample of size two being less than 65 inches? So in the last example, straightforward application, we didn't do anything with the distribution of x bar. Here, we're going to do something with that x bar. We're going to ask, what's the probability of observing an x bar being less than 65 inches? Um, so we're asked, ultimately, what is the probability of having the mean being less than 65? We're asked to calculate this. And if you want to do a sub 2 here, that would be fantastic. So we're asked to calculate the probability of x bar sub 2 being less than 65. That means we need to know the distribution of x bar sub 2. We have, we're trying to solve a probability statement about x bar sub 2. We really need to know the distribution of x bar sub 2. So to calculate this, we're going to use the central limit theorem. x bar sub 2 is just, is approximately normal. Expected value the same as the original distribution. And variance equal to 1 over n times the original variance. Notice I told you the standard deviation was 3, therefore the variance is 9. So we know x bar sub 2, approximately normal, mean of 69, variance of 4.5. Now we use that to answer our original question about the probability of x bar being less than 65. Using R, this is P norm. Remember, it's got to be a less than part. Uh, 65 is from here. M is equal to 69. S, which for R needs to be the standard deviation, that's just the square root of the variance. The variance is 3 squared over 2. So this R code will get us 0 0.0297. In other words, there's about a 3% chance that I will observe an average being less than 65. Given that the mean of the population is 69 and the variance of the population is 9. In other words, this, this, this uh, probability is small, and therefore my beliefs about the original population are unlikely. Um, thus, the probability of observing this event, given our assumptions are correct, is quite small. So either I did not observe this event, or my assumptions are not true. So example one, straightforward application of the central limit theorem. Example two, okay, now that we've got the distribution of x bar, let's see how we're, we can use this. Okay, 
Now my sample is size 10. Same mean and variance of the uh, adult height for males. Um, but now I'm doing a sample of size 10. I want to know what's the probability of that sample of size 10 being less than 65. Same statement, it's probability of x bar being less than 65, except in this case, n is now 10. So from the central limit theorem, x bar follows an approximately normal distribution with mean of 69 from the original distribution and variance of 1 over n times the original variance. And the original variance is 3 squared. So x bar now follows this distribution. Notice the expected value is the same. The variance is smaller. So as the sample size increases, the variance of x bar gets smaller. So again, I want to calculate probability of x bar being less than 65. This is p norm of 65. Mu, uh, m is equal to 69. s, standard deviation, is just the square root of the variance of 0.9. This is 0.0000124. So again, very small probability. Meaning, if everything I said is true, then the probability of me observing this is small, incredibly small. It's 1 in 10 to the negative fifth. It's 1 in 10,000. Since the probability of me observing this is so small, I no longer really believe all of my assumptions. Maybe mu for the population isn't 69. Maybe the variance of the population isn't 9. Um, maybe the distribution of the population is so non-normal that the central limit theorem is not helping when n is equal to 10. But still, there is a 1 in 10,000 chance that my assumptions are correct, and I observe this event. So it is possible. But it really draws, uh, brings into, um, really makes you doubt the assumptions. Fourth example, crime. Uh, the 2,000 violent crime rate for the 50 states plus DC are given in the data file crime. Uh, we need to find a 95% confidence, central confidence interval for the mean violent crime rate. This is not the first time you've seen the word confidence interval. Um, that would be one of the labs. So here we're asked to calculate the 2.5th and the 97.5th percentiles of the sample means drawn from the 2,000 violent crime rate. Why is it the 2.5th and 97.5th? Note the difference is 95. And notice you got 2.5% below and 2.5% above. So that gives us the central part. So those two quantiles will give us the central, the endpoints of that central 95% confidence interval. It's a confidence interval, so it's going to be an interval on the means. It's a confidence interval, so it's going to be an interval on the means. Probably want to put a star there, some googly eyes staring at it, and a big expression of, wow. Um, one way of estimating this confidence interval is to apply the corollary to uh, central limit theorem. Uh, from the data, we've got a mean of 441.55 and a standard deviation of 241.45. Thus, by the corollary to the central limit theorem, we have x bar is approximately normal. Expected value 441.55 and variance of 1 over n times the variance of the data itself. And so the endpoints for the 95% confidence interval are the 2.5th and 97.5th quantiles of that distribution, which in R we can do this way. Let's look at all the parts. That's a Q. Q norm is for the quantiles of a normal distribution. These are the two percents that you want, or the two proportions you want, the 2.5th percentile and the 97.5th percentile. Got to put them together in a C function, followed by a comma, followed by how you're defining this distribution, mean of 441.55, standard deviation of 241.45 divided by the square root of 51, 
I could have written this as the square root of 241.45 squared over 51, but the square root of a square, you're just pulling that 241.45 out front. So in other words, this is really just s over square root of n. So we're 95% confident that the actual mean is between 375 and 508. And that's violent crimes per 100,000. Confidence interval is on the mean. Um, review back what an observation interval is. That's on all the observations you've seen. Um, recall back what a prediction interval is on all the observations you will see in the future. Um, confidence interval is about the means, the sample means. We could also, and this part is bootstrapping, we could also estimate the confidence interval from the data itself um, using a process that's called bootstrapping. Um, here's the code to do it, and this will give us a 95% confidence interval from 380 to 510. Um, I'm going to go through the lines of this code very carefully shortly, but notice that the confidence interval you get through bootstrapping is 380 to 510, but what we got from using a normal approximation was 375 to 508. In other words, not too different. Okay, so five lines, six lines. Here are the two key lines. and They're inside the for loop, actually. This line is key, and this line is key. So let's look at the x equals line. We're drawing a sample from the violent crime rate in 2000. This is going to be a random sample. That's what the sample command does, draws it and allows you, and it does replace equals true, which means it allows you to draw a state's violent crime rate more than once. If replace equals true isn't there, then this is just going to give you the same 51 values in a different order each time, but the same 51 values. And if it's the same 51 values, the mean of those values will be the exactly the same each time. So we need the replace equals true to do bootstrapping. So this x equals line will draw a random sample from the violent crime rate in 2000, allowing for states to be chosen multiple times. Stores it in the variable x. Second line, second important line, we calculate the mean of that sample. We're going to store it in the variable called mn. Uh, mn is for mean, but we're going to store it in this variable. Bracket i bracket, that is done to allow us to um, remember or to allow R to remember each of those sample means. So x equals that gives us the sample, this line gives us the sample mean of that sample, storing it in the variable mn in the ith position. And bracket i bracket will mean that this is stored in the ith position. We're going to do that 10,000 times. That's what the for loop does. First time through, i is equal to 1, because 1 colon 1 e4 is 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 10,000. First time through, i is equal to 1, draws a sample, calculates the mean of that sample, stores it in the variable mn in the first position. Closing brace goes back up here, i is now equal to 2, draws another sample, calculates the mean of that, stores it in the uh, variable mn in, sp in position 2. Closing brace goes back up here. I is now equal to 3. Draws a random sample, calculates the mean, stores it in position 3. This is continued 10,000 times. So at the end of this, uh, at the end of this loop, at the end of these four lines, the variable mn will con contain 10,000 values. Each of those 10,000 values will be a sample mean from this distribution. The bottom line gives us the endpoints of that 95% confidence interval. Remember, this is sample means, so an interval on sample means will be the confidence interval. Quantile function, you give it the, ver the vector first, and then you specify its the, uh, the percentiles you want. So we've explained every single line there except the first. In R, when you're building a vector, such as the way that we're doing it here, you need to tell R to set aside memory for that vector. Um, this line 
sets us, tells R, hey, we're going to create the vector MN. It's going to be a numeric vector. It's going to hold numbers. And you just need to set aside memory so that we can build it. And then this loop will build it. And then at the end, we're going to use that MN. I strongly suggest at this point, you type this in, you run it, and you see that it actually does work. Your confidence interval will be slightly different. Why will your confidence interval be slightly different, or why could it be slightly different? Because this is a random sample. We're drawing a random sample, so your random sample will be different from my random sample. The fact that we're doing this 10,000 times means that the interval endpoints are probably going to be really, really close. If we want to make them even closer, we do this a million times, 1e6. So here's the question, why is there a difference between the two confidence intervals? Doing it bootstrap, it's 380 to 510. Doing it using the normal approximation, it's 375 to 508. The reason it's different is here we're assuming that the sample means follow the normal distribution. And here we're, we're not making that assumption. Here we're saying, OK, data, I don't care what distribution you have. I don't care what the distribution of the sample means actually is. I want to see the, I want to have a good estimate for that confidence interval. Since the endpoints are so close to each other, that tells me that this normal approximation is not a bad approximation when the sample size is 51. If the sample size were 5,000, I would expect the, this interval to be the same as this interval. If the sample size were 5, I would not be surprised if this interval and this interval were very different. Did I give you all of them? I did give you all of them. OK. So learning check. What's the main consequence of the central limit theorem? You can hit pause, come up with an answer, and then I'll give you the answer. The distribution of the sample means is approximately normal. What is the sampling distribution for the mean? Sampling distribution for the mean is normal, with expected value of mu, and variance of sigma squared over n. How does the sampling distribution for the mean depend on the distribution of the data? If the data are normal, then the sampling distribution for the mean is exactly normal. If it is not normal, then the farther the data distribution from normal is, the larger the sample size needs to be for this to be a good approximation. What is bootstrapping and what is its greatest use? Bootstrapping is using the data under repeated sampling to estimate a population parameter. And I would argue its greatest use is to estimate the confidence interval for the mean. Uh, section 7.2 in Hawks, Appendix C3. Um, and of course, Central Limit Theorem. You may want to also look at Wikipedia Bootstrapping if you've got questions on bootstrapping. And that's it. See you in Section 7.3. Hello, and welcome to the last section of Chapter 7. Chapter 7 covered the Central Limit Theorem, or covers the Central Limit Theorem in two of its most important applications. Uh, section 7.1, you s were introduced to the central limit theorem. 7.2, you saw its application to sample means. In this section, you're going to see its, uh, its application to sample proportions. Um, so by the end of this lecture, you should be able to state the central limit theorem, apply the central limit theorem to the problem of the sampling distribution of the proportion, uh, estimate the sampling distribution for the proportion, and understand the relationship between the sample size and the precision of the estimate. We've been hinting at that, that there is a, 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 a strong relationship between sample size and precision for a long time. Here we're going to actually see it in the form or in the guise of something we call power. Um, here's the arc. In recent computer activities, the SCAs, we've examined random draws. Uh, calculating sample means from subsets, histograms from those. And we've seen that those histograms illustrate that the sample means look pretty normal. And then we looked at the central limit theorem and saw, oh, that makes sense, because the central limit 
limit theorem says, sample means are going to tend to be normal, especially if the sample size is large. In the last slide deck, we also saw this application to the sample mean, so boom. Um, today, we're going to examine the central limit theorem in terms of what it tells us about the distribution of the sample proportion, aka the sampling distribution of the proportion. So last time it was the mean, this time it's the proportion. So here's the, th the central limit theorem again. Again, the first paragraph is the premise. These are things that must be met before you can apply the central limit theorem. Um, notice that the premises, premises, premises uh, speak about the distribution of the data. The consequence of the central limit theorem, the second paragraph, talks about the distribution of the sample uh, totals. Um, so let x be a random variable with mean mu, finite variance sigma squared. Let us draw a random sample, in other words, all the x's are independent, of size n from this distribution. Notice we didn't specify that the data have to be normal or exponential or uniform or gamma or beta or whatever. We just said it has to have a mean and finite variance. And the data have to be random draw from this distribution. Consequence, then the distribution of the sample sums converges to a normal distribution. Specifically, t, which is the sum of the xi's, converges in distribution to a normal with expected value n mu and variance n sigma squared. Which brings us to our first intro lecture question. State the center limit theorem as I have stated it in this lecture. So again, write this over on the left-hand side, answer it below. This is really important because a lot of students in the past have thought the central limit theorem says the data become more normal. That's not true. The data, central limit theorem doesn't tell us anything about the distribution of the data. It requires that the data has a finite variance and a mean, but it doesn't say, therefore, the distribution of the data becomes more normal. No, it says the distribution of the sums becomes more normal. There we are. Um, so there's the theorem statement. Here's the corollary for the sample proportion. We saw one of these with the sample mean. We're going to see it for the sample proportion. Let x follow a binomial distribution with parameter values n and p. Remember, n is a sample size, and p is the probability of success on each of the trials. Let the x be a random sample from n Bernoulli random variables. There, notice again, remember back to 7.1, I framed the binomial as being just the sum of independent Bernoullis. We're using that here. Then the distribution of the sample proportion, which I'm going to call big P, is which is defined as 1 over n times x, the number of successes from that binomial, or the number of successes from those n Bernoullis. So this is 1 over n times x. Oh, I've seen 1 over n times x before. I forget what that was. Uh, converges in distribution to a normal with expected value little p. Hmm. Hmm. And variance of p times 1 minus p over n. So here we are for intro lecture question number 2. If I can find it. What is the distribution of the sample proportion? This is an important one. Also, while you're here, look at how this distribution compares to the distribution of the sample mean. Going back. So here's the proof. From the central limit theorem, we know x follows an approximate normal distribution, expected value np, uh, variance np1 minus p. That's straight out application of the central limit theorem. np is expected value of x, np1 minus p is the variance of x. Remember, we want to find the distribution or the approximate dis distribution of p, the sample proportions. So expected value of p which is expected value of x over n. Pulling out that 1 over n, because expectation is a linear operator, we get expected value of x over n. 
we know the expected value of x from a previous slide is just np. The ends cancel out, and we're left with p. So the expected value of p is little p. So the expected value of your sample proportions is your population proportion. Normal distribution has an expected value and a variance, so let's calculate the variance of your sample proportions. Again, first step, substitution. We're going to factor out that n as an n squared. Check back to section 7.1 why we we're factoring out an n squared. It has to do with the fact that the variance, you square the random variable. Variance of x is np1 minus p. This n and one of these cancels out. p times 1 minus p over n. Therefore, sample proportions are approximately normally distributed, expected value of p, the variance of p times 1 minus p over n. Notice the expected value of p is little p. Um, since the expected value of p is little p, this is an unbiased estimator. And notice that as the sample size increases, the variance also, well, I'm sorry, sa sample size increases, the variance decreases. In other words, as n increases, the precision will increase as well. The variance decreases, precision increases. So there's our result. Some examples. According to the U.S. Census, 18% of Americans are below the poverty line. If I randomly sample 10 people from the United States, what's the probability that more than 20 of them are below the pro poverty line? So notice I'm asking a, a probability question. It's what is the probability that more than 20% are below the poverty line? So I'm asked probability of he being greater than 20, uh, I'm sorry, 0.20. Since we're doing a pro a, uh, trying to calculate a probability about the random variable p, we need to know the distribution of p. From the corollary f to the central limit theorem that we covered today, p approxim is approximately normal. Expected value of 0.18, because that's, uh, that's p in the population. And variance of p times 1 minus p over n. So p, big P, is approximately normal, mean of 0.18, variance of 0.01476. We need to calculate the probability that p is greater than 0.2. Remember, in order to use cumulative probabilities, this has to be a less, less than. Complements rule from chapter 4 says probability of p being greater than something is 1 minus the probability of p being less than or equal to it. We've got a less than or equal here, so we can use the p-norm, 0 0.2, 0 0.18, and this is standard deviation, so it's the square root of the variance. That gives us a probability of 0 0.4346. That's not small, not at all, so it wouldn't shock me if more than 20% of my sample is below the poverty line. Assuming that the, uh, the population mean, uh, po uh, population proportion is 0.18, then the probability of me observing more than 20% being under the poverty line of is 0.43 doesn't give me any evidence against my assumption of the 0.18. It's a coin flip, essentially. About half the time I'll be above 20%, about half the time I'll be below. Same assumption, uh, the population uh, proportion is 18%. I'm now going to sample 100 people instead of what I did in the previous example, increasing the sample size. And I want to calculate the same probability, probability that more than 20% are below the poverty line. So again, pr uh, we're asked to calculate the probability that P is greater than 0.2. We know, need to know the distribution of P from the central limit theorem. It's 18%, 18% times 1 minus 18% over n, n here is 100. 
This gives us that distribution. We need to calculate the probability of p being greater than 0.2. That's 1 minus probability of p being less than or equal to 0.2. And I get a probability of 0.3. So also not a small value. It's about a third of the time I'll get a, uh, a sample proportion being greater than 20%. If our assumption about the population is true, that is, if the population uh, poverty rate indeed is 0.18. Notice the probability did go down though. In the previous example when n was 10, this was 0.46 or 0.47. It's gone down, it's 0 0.30, which makes sense because I collect more and more data, I would expect my ob observations to average out to being closer to the real average. Now my sample size is 1,000. I'm going to ask 1,000 people. The first it was 10, then 100, now 1,000. We're going to look at a 95% confidence interval for the sample proportion. Confidence interval is on those sample statistics, not on observations that we've seen, which is an observation interval, not on observations we're going to see in the future, which would be a prediction interval, but on the sample uh, uh, statistic, in this case, sample proportion. So with 1,000, I would expect to see 95% of the time somewhere between 0.156 and 0.204. So if reality is correct, I'm, I'm sorry, if my assumption about reality of 18% is correct, and I collect a sample of size 1,000, I expect 95% of the time the sample proportion is going to be between 15 and 20%. How do I get that? I've got the proportion is normally distributed, so I'll use the norm stem. I'm looking at the quantiles, so I'll use Q norm. I'm doing the 2.5th percentile, the 97.5th percentile, and the rest just specifies that particular normal distribution. Now I'm going to ask 100,000 Americans. And I want to know the probability that more than 20% of them are below the poverty line. So I did 10, 100,000, now 100,000. And my confidence interval is 17.8 to 18.2. So I would expect 95% of the time my sample of 100,000 to be between 17.8 and 18.2. Got the 2 and the 8 switched uh, between 17.2 and 18.8. So if I fell out of the interval of 17.2 to 18.8, I'd say, well, there's something wrong with my assumption of 18%. Here's a, a graph of the probability that the observed sample proportion is greater than 0.2 as graphed against the sample size. Our first example is 10. n equals 10. Our probability of observing it was way up here about 0.46, I think. The second n was 100, and the probability we got was about 0.30. So as the sample size increases, the probability of observing a extreme event decreases. doesn't go away. And here we are with n equal to 1,000, we've still got a probability of about 0.08. So about 8% of the time, that sample of 1,000 will give me a sample proportion greater than 0.2. We can also look at this in terms of confidence intervals. As the sample size increases, the upper confidence bound and the lower confidence bound get closer and closer together. They never become the same. I mean, even out here at n equal to 1,000, there's still a sizable ver uh, uh, gap between the two. So 
So this is where power comes in. Power is the ability to distinguish between a true and a false null hypothesis. In other words, we are assuming that the sample, I'm sorry, we're assuming that the population proportion is 0.18. Power is the ability to say, no, it's not, given our observations. So if we observe p being greater than 0.2, the probability of us saying, no, that 0.18 is wrong, gets bigger and bigger as sample size increases. In terms of confidence intervals, remember the width of the confidence interval is the precision. The smaller the width, the higher the precision. As the sample size increases, our precision increases. Most of the benefit happens in the first couple hundred. What this means is as the sample size increases, we're going to observe sample proportions closer and closer to our population proportion. We still get some above and some below, but they'll be much more concentrated around the sample proportion. Which brings us to intra-lecture question number three. What is power? When we get to chapter 10, we'll have a much better understanding of power, but you got to dip your toes in here. So learning check, what's the main consequence for the central limit theorem? The main consequence for the central limit theorem is that the means, the sample means and sample proportions are much more normally distributed than the data itself. What is the sampling distribution for the proportion? Uh, the sampling distribution proportion, capital P, is approximately normal with expected value of little p and variance of p times 1 minus p over n. What effect does sample size have for precision in estimating the sample proportion? As the sample size increases, the precision increases as well. That was section 3. You may also want to glance through Appendix C3 and Central Limit Theorem. You may also want to look at power in statistics on Wikipedia. And that's it for Chapter 7. In Chapter 8, we're going to use all of this uh, Central Limit Theorem stuff to start creating confidence intervals. And in Chapter 10, we're going to look at hypothesis testing. But in all reality, we understand what confidence intervals are at this point. But when we get to chapter 8, we're going to get a much deeper appreciation for confidence intervals. And that's it. Hello, and welcome to the video lecture on chapter 8, where we introduce the theory of confidence intervals and how to calculate them by hand, which we should never want to do because calculating things by hand introduces errors in many, many places. Um, it's much better to learn how to do these with a computer, which will be the next lecture, learning how to do count confidence intervals on a computer, specifically using the R statistical environment. Um, I guess we get to start. Um, by the end of this lecture, you should be able to state what a confidence interval concerns, what it is, uh, state the theory behind calculating those confidence intervals, and understand that they represent a proportion not a probability, but a proportion. Um, so here's the entire arc of the course, or the story of the course uh, thus far. Um, the second examination would have taken place right uh, last week if we had a typical course. Um, so before that, back when we were talking about probabilities, we calculated three types of intervals. Uh, we calculated the observation intervals, the confidence intervals, and the prediction intervals. Um, and these three were actually intervals about different things. Even though it's all based on the data, they all were intervals about different things. The observation interval is intervals on observations that we have already had. Um, prediction interval is on observations that we will have in the future. So a 95% prediction interval tells us that 95% in the future, we will be within this range. 
whereas a 95% observation interval tells us that of everything that we've observed so far, 95% of those observations are in this range. Now contrast both of those with the confidence interval. Recall that the confidence interval was about the population, I'm sorry, about the, the sample statistic. So we had confidence intervals looking at the sample mean, or confidence intervals looking at the sample proportion, or confidence intervals looking at the sample variance. And chapter 8 onward, we're going to be using these confidence intervals in a much more mathematically balanced way. Um, I'm laying out the theory today. Um, we also examined the central limit theorem when we looked at the normal distribution a lot. And I, when we talked about the central limit theorem, I said this tells us, this, this theorem is so important that it tells us that we can just focus on the normal distribution for a good first approximation any time in the future. So that's why the normal distribution is so important. It's also why the central limit theorem is so important. And we're going to use both of those today to create these, this mathematical confidence interval. Um, so today we'll look at confidence intervals that deal with population parameters. Um, the confidence intervals we've dealt with in the past have looked at the sample statistics. Now we're going to do it for the population parameters. And remember, the goal of inferential statistics is to take our sample and draw conclusions about the population parameter. So now we're going to take our sample, and from that sample we're going to calculate a confidence interval. And that confidence interval is going to tell us about reasonable values for this population parameter. So, so let's start with the definition. A confidence interval is a set of values that theoretically contain the population parameter a given proportion of the time when the experiment is performed many, 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 many times. So it's a set of values. Usually it's an interval, so we have a lower bound and an upper bound, and we assume every value between those two, lower and the upper, constitute the interval. It contains the population parameter that we're, we're interested in a given proportion of the time. So if we're talking about like a 95% confidence interval, then theoretically the population parameter is in about 95% of those confidence intervals. When we do this experiment over and over and over. When we do it for just once, then we just have to hope that the population parameter is in the interval it, and be confident at a certain level that it is in the interval. Um, and this is why it's important to replicate experiments over and over again, because one confidence interval could be based on biased data or data that's not representative of the population. and even we could use the best sampling method on the world, and we would get a, 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 set of, a, a set of data, a sample of that data, that's not representative of the population. We'd never know that if all we do, the, if all we do is do this once. And that's why replication is so important, so that we know that whether or not our first sample was representative or not. Because if it's unlikely that the sample is unrepresentative, then it's going to be doubly so if you have two samples and that they're both unrepresentative. So note that it gives populate information about the population parameter. It's a set of reasonable values for that parameter. Some population parameters we'll be looking at will be the mean, the variance, the proportion. Um, it's a set of reasonable values. It's a function of the data. You collect data and from that data you calculate the endpoints of that confidence interval. Um, since it's a function of the data, it's a random variable. Um, and it is a result of a probability distribution calculation, and we'll see that later. Um, so if LCL and UCL, LCL for lower confidence limit, and UCL be upper confidence limit, if it's a 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval for parameter theta, and theta could be mu or sigma squared or p, then about 1 minus alpha times 100% of the intervals under repeated experiments will contain that parameter. Uh, by default, we'll use alpha of 0 0.05, which means that we'll be talking about 95% confidence intervals, um, just by default. Uh, which I say here, the confidence level C is 1 minus our alpha. By default, we're going to use alpha of 0.05 in this course. 
and the value of alpha will be reintroduced in chapter 10 when we talk about hypothesis testing. It's going to be the theoretical or the nominal type 1 error rate. And those words will make sense when we get to chapter 10 when we start talking about uh, hypothesis testing. Note that alpha is selected by the researcher, therefore the confidence level is selected by the researcher. Uh, so unless it's stated otherwise, um, we're going to have alpha of 0.05 in this course. Um, so let's get to our first intro lecture question. That intro lecture question will be, define the confidence interval. And again, I suggest writing down the, the question on the left-hand side of your notebook. Answer it below that. And this is especially important because understanding what a confidence interval is, is extremely important for understanding what you can learn from your data. Okay, so that's where we were. Let's move on to something called bootstrapping. In a previous class, we introduced bootstrapping. Uh, it's in uh, SCA 5B, I believe, um, and obtaining a confidence interval for a population parameter. So let's look at the code again. Um, this is how you would load in data from this uh, path. It's geography.csv. These are the results of a previous class taking a geography quiz. Six is the highest possible score on the quiz. Zero is the lowest. Um, load it in, attach the data set. If you want to, you can do, uh, do summary of DT to see what the mean and the median are. Um, see what the min and the max are. See what the first and the third quartile are. You could also calculate the standard deviation doing SD. Uh, you can do the IQR interquartile range using the IQR function. Um, then we performed these two lines multiple times. The first line draws a random sample from the variable score. That's the score that the students uh, made on the quiz uh, with replacement. So each time through, x is going to be a vector of scores. On the second line, you find the mean of that. So this will calculate the sample mean of that particular sample of scores and store it into the variable st at the ith position. This is a for loop, so it will be doing this, these two lines, or everything between the two braces, 1 times 10 to the 4th times. So at the end of running this loop, you're going to have 10,000 sample beans. Doing a histogram of those will show you the distribution of those sample means. And doing the quantiles from these two positions, these two points, or these two levels, will give you the endpoints of a 95% confidence interval for the mean. And we've done this in the past. Here's what the histogram looks like. Notice the histogram looks rather normal. Um, considering that the actual data look nothing like a normal distribution, the distribution of the sample means definitely does look normal. That does not surprise us, or it should not surprise us, if we actually understand the central limit theorem, because what does the central limit theorem tell us? Sample means will be much more normally distributed than the data itself. And these are the endpoints of the 95% confidence interval. So we're 95% confident that the population mean mu is between 1.63 and 2.57. 1.63333 and 2.566667. Uh, again, these are out of 6. So the mean is definitely going to be less than 50%. Because 50% is 3, and that's way, way over here. And just about all of the histogram is to the left of 3. So we're almost positive that the mean, understanding of geography, is less than 50%. This is fine if all we have is the data, and that's all we did here. We just looked at the data, we drew from the data, we dealt with the data as being representative of the population. Um, we didn't 
say the data was normally distributed. We didn't say the data followed a binomial distribution. We just said, here's the data. If we can make an additional assumption about the data, specifically that the data are normally distributed, then we can go a little bit further. We don't have to do bootstrapping. We can just run a simple test. So recall that for large n from the central limit theorem, x bar is approximately normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared over n, where sigma squared is the variance of the data or variance of the data generating process, and mu is the expected value of the data generating process. So this should look familiar from chapter 7, section 2. Now if we apply the z-transform from back in chapter 3, we're going to subtract off mu from both sides, and we're going to divide by the square root of sigma squared over n. We're going to get that x bar minus mu over root sigma squared over n is approximately normal, 0, 1. This is why it's called the z-score. This distribution, normal 0, 1, is also called the z-distribution. This is normalizing the x-bar distribution. So we have x-bar minus mu over square root of sigma squared over n is approximately normal, is approximately standard normal. That means the expression on the left is between the values of negative 1.96 and positive 1.96 about 95% of the time. How do I know that? Because the 2.5th percentile and the 97.5th percentile of the standard normal are negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. How do we know that? Q norm of 0 0.025 will give us the negative 1.96, and Q norm of 0.975 will give us the 1.96. And so we would say that a theoretical 95% confidence interval, I'm sorry, a theoretical 95% interval for this quantity, this thing on the, on the left, x bar minus mu over square root of sigma squared over n, is between negative 1.96 and 1.96 by definition. So this bottom statement would be a definitional statement. That is, if I have x that's normally distributed, with mean mu and variance sigma squared, and I draw a sample of size n from the x distribution and calculate this, there's a 95% probability that it's going to be between negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. Because 95% of the time, it's between, this quantity is between negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. About 2.5% of the time, it's above 1.96 and above about 2.5% of the time, it's less than negative 1.96. Now, we really don't care about the interval for this quantity. We want it for mu. We want a confidence interval for mu. Well, all we have to do is solve this equation, this equaling negative 1.96, for mu. And here's what we get. Here's the quantity equal to negative 1.96. We're solving for mu, remember? So we multiply both sides by the square root of sigma squared over n. And this is kind of important. This quantity, square root of sigma squared over n, is called the standard error. Now we got x bar minus mu is equal to negative 1.96 times the standard error. We subtract an x bar from both sides. Remember, we're solving for this mu. So we're subtracting x bar from both sides left with the negative mu on the right, multiply through by negative 1, we get that this is the upper bound for mu. So this we're going to call the upper bound on the 95% confidence interval for mu. I leave it as an exercise to show that this with the negative sign here is going to be the lower bound. How would you do that? this quantity equal to 1.96 and solve for mu. So we got it x bar minus 1.96 times the standard error and x bar plus 1.96 times the standard error are the two endpoints. 
we can symbolize it in just one expression, x bar plus and minus um, z of alpha over 2 times the standard error. If alpha is 0 0.05, then this will be a 1.96 out front. Um, so we would call this, oddly enough, we would call this the confidence interval from u. Technically, this would just provide the two endpoints of the confidence interval from u. I'm going to go to the next intro lecture question at this point. Oops. What is the distribution of the sample mean in this lecture? So what did we require the distribution of the sample mean to be? Notice, not the distribution of the sample. We're looking at the distribution of the sample mean. So what was that in this lecture? And again, write the question on the left side, your answer below it. OK, so this confidence interval that we just calculated is for mu. And it works, this confidence interval is for mu, and it works when you're estimating mu, which makes sense. If you're trying to estimate the variance, you wouldn't use a confidence interval for mu. If you're able to calculate x bar and n, well, if you can't calculate x bar and n from the data, then you, I don't know what to say. This goes back, uh, calculating x bar from the data is pretty straightforward, and as you're just counting the data size. And if you know sigma squared, remember sigma squared is the population variance. Um, I don't know that we would ever know the population variance. And then last but not least, the data are generated from a normal process or n is large enough so that the central limit theorem says that x bar is approximately normal. And again, the reality here for 4 is we just need x bar to be approximately normal. At no point in the last few slides did I say x has to follow any specific distribution. Every distributional statement we made was that x bar was normal, or approximately so. Um, Call the going back to number three. The, you have to know sigma squared, the population variance. Um, recall the definition of the population variance. In order to calculate it, you need to know what mu is. However, since we're trying to estimate mu, we don't want to know what mu is. Therefore, how do we know what sigma squared is? Um, and in general, if we don't know sigma squared, then what we just did doesn't work. So your question is, your question to me is. Why did we do it if we never know sigma squared, and therefore what we just did doesn't, doesn't do anything for us? And the answer is, this process that we just did gave us an opportunity to show how confidence intervals are constructed, what they actually indicate, and how they can be useful. Kind of shaky on that last one. But now that we know the process in creating confidence intervals, we can fix this, quote, error, or try to figure out some way that we can get by without having to know sigma squared, and create a confidence interval from that, using the same theory behind it. I mean, specifically, since we can't use the Z procedure, which we just did, it's also called the WALD, W-A-L-D, uh, named after, uh, I think it was Benjamin WALD, could have been Abraham WALD. Um, I probably should have looked that up. Uh, we're going to use a different procedure. If we know sigma squared, we can use this procedure we just did. If we don't know sigma squared, we can't, because we need to know sigma squared to do this procedure. Instead of the Z procedure, we'll use the T procedure. Here's the function that we will calculate. It's x bar minus mu. Numerator is the same as it was for the Z procedure denominator, we're looking at s squared over n. In the z procedure, that was sigma squared. Here it's s squared. s squared would be the sample variance. And if we've got the sample, we can calculate s squared. And this quantity follows approximately a t distribution. A t distribution has a parameter called the degrees of freedom. Um, in, for one sample cases, the degrees of freedom is just equal to n minus 1. 
Now with this said, we can go through the same procedure we did before with the z's to come up with the endpoints of a confidence interval using the t. It's x bar plus or minus this distributional multiplier times the standard error. Just in this case, the standard error is the square root of s squared over n. Compare this confidence interval to the one we calculated just earlier. So here, capital T sub alpha over 2 is the alpha over second quantile for the t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Um, table 2, by tradition, table 2 is the t distribution table. Um, so in the back of the book, there's probably a table 2 that you would use if you had to. I'm, this slide compares with the z distribution, the standard normal distribution, the blue distribution, how it compares to the t distribution. Notice the t distribution is much wider than the standard normal. There's more measurements out here in the tails, far away from zero. In other words, the t distribution is much more variable than the z. Why does that make sense? It's because when the z distribution, when we were using the z distribution, we only had one source of uncertainty. That was in the x bar. The denominator was a sigma squared, a population variance. With the t, we've got more sources of uncertainty. We've got the x bar, but we've also got a s squared. That's a random variable also. So we've got two sources of randomness. So we would expect the t distribution to be much wider than the z. Now this confidence interval from mu works if you're trying to estimate mu. If you're able to calculate x bar and n and s squared, which again, those are from the data, so you should be able to calculate them. And if the data are generated from a normal process or if n is large enough. Again, we're doing this for x bar has to be normally distributed. And that happens in two ways. If the x's are normally distributed or if n is large enough and the central limit theorem works. Um, let's do question three. Um, why do we use a t distribution when the population variance is unknown? So that should be two or three sentences, or maybe one or two sentences. Again, write the question on the left-hand side, answer it below. So we've got our uh, procedure to estimate mu, okay, just one mu. As we go through this, this section, this, this, these two chapters, 8 and 9, we're going to get more and more procedures to estimate things. We're going to get a procedure to estimate p. We're going to get a procedure to estimate sigma squared. Um, we're going to get a procedure to estimate two mu's, or the difference in two mu's, the difference in two proportions, the, the, the ratio of two variances. We're going to get procedures that work when the sample is not normal enough. Um, so make sure that you can uh, match the uh, the what you're trying to estimate, the parameter, with the correct procedure and the requirements for that procedure. If we go back one, whoo, uh, these are the requirements for the t distribution. Or I'm sorry, these are the requirements for the t test, for the t procedure. If you don't meet these, then you've got to use something else. Here's a list of several others. Go to the allprocedures.pdf handout that's located online. That will give you all the procedures we'll be looking at. And we're going to be able to even have a procedure for mu tilde, the, the population median. So in, today, in today's slide deck, we covered the central limit theorem again. Uh, we looked at the definition of confidence intervals. Um, we look for confidence intervals for mu when sigma squared is known, uh, for mu when sigma squared wasn't known. In both of those cases, x bar had to be approximately normal. Uh, we looked at confidence intervals for other instances, or I just mentioned them. And most importantly, the idea or the theory behind confidence intervals. This is the key for today. Understand what confidence intervals tell us. Once you understand this, then you can just hop on the computer and have the computer calculate those confidence intervals for you. It's the theory that you need to understand. In the next slide deck, we're going to show how to do these 
confidence interval calculations in R. Um, tomorrow we're going to review a little bit of today. We're going to look at some processes to create confidence intervals for one and two means, medians, proportions, variances. But we're going to do it in R, so instead of having to actually do those calculations by hand, it's going to be one line of code and interpret the results. So in the future we're going to see a lot of these procedures. Make sure you keep a separate sheet. I would have it in the back of your notebook. And for every procedure you should state how to do it in R, what the procedure is for. Is it for a single mean? Is it for two proportions? Is it a ratio of, of variances, etc.? What the requirements are, otherwise known as the assumptions of it, and then how to interpret. Uh, so chapter 8 and 5, and then Wikipedia. All of those will be helpful. Hope this was helpful. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello and welcome to chapter 10. This is the chapter where we introduce hypothesis testing and see several different types of tests. Um, so this lecture is going to be about the theory of hypothesis testing. Um, so this will lay the groundwork, tie it into previous um, topics that we've discussed. Um, the next lecture will be how to actually do this using R so you don't have to worry about all these probability calculations. <clears throat> so by the end of this lecture you should be able to identify the research null and alternative hypotheses. The research hypothesis is given to you by the researcher. The null and the alternative you have to come up with. You have to calculate the p-value for a given alternative hypothesis. And again, this uh, slide deck will be about doing it by hand. That'll let you know exactly what the p-value means and what it doesn't mean, um, which ties into the third objective. The next lecture will be how to do this in R, so all you have to do is interpret the p-value that R gives you. Um, so previously we've calculated confidence intervals and we've interpreted confidence intervals. Today we're going to look at the other side of the statistical inference coin and looking at hypothesis testing and p-values. Um, the key, one of the, the key, one of the key differences is in hypothesis testing, you create the hypothesis before you collect the data, and then you test that hypothesis with your data. So a hypothesis comes first, collect your data, then test the hypothesis. Whereas in confidence intervals, you walk into it with no idea what the parameter value is supposed to be, and you estimate the parameter value from the data, and only from the data. So confidence intervals solely from the data, hypothesis testing is from the data, and from a claimed hypothesis. So here's the theory. Uh, the theory behind hypothesis testing is, one, state the research hypothesis and the null hypothesis. Two, somehow determine how much the data support the hypothesis. And by the hypothesis, I mean the null hypothesis. Um, if, to do that, you need to determine the parameter being tested, um, turn the, determine the appropriate statistic or estimator, uh, determine the distribution of that statistic under the null hypothesis, determine how likely it is to observe that statistic if the null hypothesis is true, and that last thing is called the p-value, and then finally interpret all of that, specifically interpret that level of support. So let's go through a few definitions. We're going to talk about that, the three hypotheses types. Um, hypothesis is a testable claim about reality. That's all it is. Um, since it's a claim about reality, it's going to concern some aspect of the population. And this aspect of the population is going to be a parameter. That's, we've been dealing with parameters from the second uh, chapter onward. We're going to start testing hypotheses about that population parameter based on our sample now. The usual parameters hypothesized about at this level are just the mean, the proportion, the variance, but we can hypothesize about any aspects of the population. Uh, we're going to symbolize this generic parameter using the Greek letter theta. So theta can represent the mean, the proportion, the variance. 
Um, since it's a claim about reality, since this hypothesis is a claim about reality, it separates all possible realities into those that are consistent with the hypothesis and those that are incompatible with it. So every single reality will either be consistent with the hypothesis or incompatible with it. And we have to determine which reality we fall into. If we fall into the reality that is consistent with the hypothesis, we say the data support the hypothesis. If we fall into the reality where the data, uh, the we fall into the reality that is incompatible with the hypothesis, we reject the hypothesis. We say that the data are not supporting it. Um, the most absolutely, without question, the most important hypothesis is the one made by the researcher and that is the research hypothesis. It's a testable claim about reality, that's hypothesis part, made by the scientist or the researcher, and that's the research part. Um, this is the one that the statistician must eventually come to a conclusion about. <clears throat> we are going to create two additional hypotheses to help us with coming to a conclusion about the research hypothesis, but, a, but ultimately we have to come back to the scientists and say, yes, the data support the research hypothesis, or no, the data do not support the research hypothesis. Um, because we're using statistics, we create two statistics-specific hypotheses. Um, these two hypotheses divide all possible realities into two groups, those that are a part of the research and those that are not a, that are not a part of it. Um, so here's a scary table. Pay attention solely to the first column, the column headed HR. That's going to be the different types of research hypotheses. Recall that theta is the parameter of interest. It could be mu, it could be p, it could be sigma squared, it could be, I can't think of it, it could be lambda, remember lambda from the Poisson and the lambda from the exponential. It could be a, it could be b from the uniform but we're focusing solely on mu and p and sigma squared, the mean, the proportion, and the variance. So those thetas represent one of those three. The value theta zero, or the, the symbol theta zero, represents a hypothesized value claimed by the researcher. The theta naught is just a, a, a number that the researcher thinks is interesting. So now we got these six symbols between the theta, the parameter, and the theta naught, the value. The relationship between theta and theta naught has to be one of these six. Theta, the, the researcher could hypothesize that theta is less than some value, equal to some value, greater than some value, less than or equal to some value, not equal to some value, or greater than some value. And again, the research hypothesis is given to us by the, stat, uh, by the scientist. From that research hypothesis, we statisticians create a null and an alternative. Now let's look at the null and alternative uh, columns, starting with the null column. Notice the null only has three types of, of symbols. Greater than or equal to, equal to, or less than or equal to greater than or equal to, equal to, or less than or equal to. The null hypothesis must always have the equal to part. And that's because we are going to create a probability distribution for the parameter, or for the st statistic, based on that equals part. So the null hypothesis always has to have the equals part. Contrast this with the alternative, there is never an equals part. In fact, if you notice, the null and the alternative are complete opposites. If the null is greater than or equal to, the alternative is less than. If the null is equal to, the alternative is not equal to. If the null is less than or equal to, the alternative is not less than or equal to, otherwise known as greater than. It's because the null and the alternative have to divide reality up into two parts one part that supports the research hypothesis and one part that doesn't. Now which part supports the research hypothesis? The answer is well it depends. What is the symbol in the research hypothesis? If the symbol is less than that cannot be a null hypothesis so that's got to be the alternative. 
if the symbol is equal to, well, that's one of the allowable si symbols for the null, so that's going to be the null. And the alternative is the opposite. If the research hypothesis uses greater than, well, that has to be the alternative, because it can't be the null, and the null is going to be the opposite. Less than or equal to will be the null. Greater than or equal to will be the null. Not equal to will be the alternative. So this, the HR column, is given to us by the researcher. And from that, we create a null and an alternative hypothesis that split the world up into a, an, a, a reality that supports the research hypothesis and a reality that does not. We have to determine which reality we're in. Don't memorize the table. Understand it. Learn what it says about the relationships. These research hypotheses are given to us. We just have to figure out what the null and the alternative is. First step is to determine if the equals part is a part of the research hypothesis. If it is, then the research hypothesis and the null hypothesis are the same. Otherwise, the research hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis are the same. And then the null and the alternative are always opposites. What do all the null hypotheses have in common? Already said that. What's the relationship between the null and the alternative? Said that. Why does that relationship have to exist? Okay. Now we know what the hypotheses are. The research, the null, the alternative. Now let's look at this thing called the p-value. The p-value is the probability of observing a test statistic this extreme, or more so, given the null hypothesis is true. Some key points there. It's a probability. It relates to the test statistic. It's a probability of observing such a test statistic that is this extreme, or more so, given the null hypothesis is true. So we assume the null hypothesis is true, and we calculate the p-value based on that. Now this is the stat statistical definition of the p-value. This is the one that's usually in the books. p-value is the probability of observing data this extreme, or more so, given the null hypothesis is true. While the first definition makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside, the second one actually ties it more closely to the data that you've observed. And then the one I really like, the one that makes me feel all nice and warm and fuzzy inside, is the last one. It's not a mathematical definition, but it's a gut-level definition of what the p-value actually tells us. p-value is the amount of support in the data for the null hypothesis. And again, it's for the null hypothesis. In other words, if the p-value is large, then there is a lot of support at the data for the null hypothesis. If the p-value is small, then there is very little support in the data for the null hypothesis. The third definition comes from the second definition, and the second comes from the first. And they're all equivalent, assuming that your test is appropriate and you've collected the data well. So now we know to look at the p-value. And to interpret the p-value, it's just a matter of the p-value is how much support is in the data for that null hypothesis. And remember, we've got to tie it eventually back to the research hypothesis. OK, now we've got two of the three parts of the hypothesis testing theory we laid out earlier. The last part's making a decision about a research hypothesis based on the data. So the fundamental question is, do the data sufficiently support the research hypothesis? Do the data sufficiently support the research hypothesis? And note that this is a binary yes or no. Yes, the data do. No, the data do not. This goes back to the p-value. But we need to somehow change that p-value, a probability that ranges from 0 to 1. We need to change that into a yes or no. And to do that, we just have to determine some sort of cutoff between what supports the research hypothesis and what does not. 
this cutoff boundary we're going to refer to as the alpha value. Um, the typical alpha value is 0 0.05. Um, my default is 0 0.05. Um, if the level of support is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. The data do not sufficiently support the null hypothesis. If the, if, the, uh, if the level of support is greater than alpha, if the p-value is greater than alpha, we don't reject the null hypothesis. The data do not tell us the null hypothesis is wrong. Notice that there is information in the p-value that goes above and beyond just the yes or no answer. So not only should we interpret the p-value in terms of yes the data support it, no the data don't, but we should also provide the p-value because that will also tell us how much it supports it or how much it doesn't. Continuing on, to, and continuing on with decision theory, this alpha value. The alpha value is the type 1 error rate that's claimed by the statistician. Um, a type 1 error occurs and the researcher rejects a true null hypothesis. Um, so there is that null hypothesis. If it's true, then alpha, then the type one, uh, type one error occurs when we reject that true null hypothesis. Now the thing is, we never know if a null hypothesis is true in re real life, which can be a problem. But then, if we knew a, a null hypothesis was true in real life, then why would we do statistics to test the null hypothesis? I mean, we'd already know that it was true. Uh, the type 1 error rate is the proportion, the type 1 error rate is a proportion of the time that the researcher commits a type 1 error. So the rate part means it's the proportion of the times that the researcher commits that type 1 error. Um, note that the actual type 1 error rate may not be alpha. Um, the alpha is claimed by the statistician, but the test may have some flaws to it where the actual type 1 error rate is not alpha. And Laboratory F explores this in much greater detail. However, we tend to just pretend that alpha actually is the type 1 error rate. Um, it's a lot of good pretending in statistics. Um, if there is a type 1 error, then there must at least be a type 2 error, otherwise why would we call it a type 1 error? A type 2 error occurs when the researcher, researcher fails to reject a false null hypothesis. Type 1 w occurred when the researcher rejected a true null hypothesis. A type 2 occurs when the researcher fails to reject a false null hypothesis. Or we could also think of it as a type 2 error occurs when the researcher rejects a true alternative. Although we never frame it in terms of rejecting a true alternative. The type 1 error rate, uh, that slipped in, uh, the type 2 error rate is symbolized with beta. Just like the type 1 error rate is symbolized by alpha, the type 2 error rate is symbolized by beta. Um, both are errors and error rates. So we would like to minimize both. However, uh, it's reducing one increases the other. Uh, furthermore, if we want to choose, if we want to make either one of them zero, then the other one goes all the way up to one. So it's we're kind of stuck there. We uh, tradition in statistics is to set alpha, and then beta just happens as it happens. Uh, beta is going to be a function of alpha as, as described here, but it's also going to be a function of the sample size. It's also going to be a function of how wrong the null hypothesis is. Um, so if we want to reduce the type 2 error rate, then l increasing the sample size is guaranteed to do that. But unfortunately, as we've seen in the past, increasing the sample size tends to be a little bit expensive at times. Here's an aside. This is not statistical here. Well, it is kind of statistical, but it's if there's a type 1 error rate, then there must be at least a type 2 error rate, a terror, uh, error. Um, there are, in fact, a couple more. These are non-standard, by the way. Um, but they do give us some insight into what can go wrong in a statistical analysis. Uh, so we'll define a type 3 error, which 
I want to introduce here, but I only want to introduce this to you so that you think more through the process and where errors can pop in, not so that you can replicate this on a test. A type 3 error occurs when the researcher rejects a false null hypothesis. That's good, but for the wrong reason. That's the error part, is you're doing it for the wrong reason. Um, type th uh, so here are some causes of type 3 errors. Um, one is using the wrong test. Um, two is aggregation bias. In other words, you're measuring at a lo at uh, measuring something about groups, and you're trying to draw conclusions about the individuals in the groups. Um, yeah, there is ecological fallacy, which is just about the opposite of that. Uh, collinearity among predictors. It just means you're using two independent variables that are highly correlated, and you're not able to determine which is causing the the effect that you're looking at. Um, so the key to avoiding the type 3 error rate is to fully understand the statistical tests, the data collection, the relationship amongst the independent variables. In other words, the key is to understanding your model and your data. The wrong test, the wrong inter interpretation, the wrong assumptions all lead to errors. But also realize that type 3 errors can be eliminated. It just requires that the statistician is careful. Type 1 and type 2 errors cannot be eliminated. So let's go through three simple uh, the CCD examples. Um, I'd like to test if my coin is biased in favor of getting heads, specifically using statistical language. My research hypothesis is HR for research hypothesis, that's a colon. P is our parameter, so it's a population proportion. My research hypothesis is that P is greater than one half. I would like to test if my coin is biased in favor of heads. So P must be the probability of getting heads. So this will be our research hypothesis. Going back to the table, if this is our research hypothesis, what, will this also be the null, or will this also be the alternative hypothesis? The key is looking at the symbol in the middle. There's no equals part, so this will also be the alternative hypothesis. Since this is the alternative, what is the null? I recall that the null hypothesis is the logical opposite. What is the opposite of greater than? Correct. It's less than or equal to. And as always, if we're going to test a hypothesis, we collect data. In this case, I flip the coin 100 times and I get 58 heads. Um, from the way the problem is set up, we know that the number of heads is follows a binomial distribution. n is 100. It's the number of trials, the number of times I flip the coin. p is 0.5 because that's my null. That's the equals part of my null hypothesis, that p is equal to 0.5. Note that if the number of heads observed is too large, then the alternative hypothesis is more likely to be correct. If the number of observed heads is too large, because where research hypothesis is greater than 1 half. So let's calculate the p-value from the definition. P values the probability of observing data this extreme or more so, given the null hypothesis is true. So here's the p value. It's the probability of, of observing more than or equal to 58 heads. Because I observed 58. The p value is the probability of observing data this extreme or more so, greater than or equal to 58 given the null hypothesis is true, given the null hypothesis is true. And this is the null hypothesis in distribution form. N's 100, P is 0.5. And guess what? We know how to calculate this from back in Chapter 5. We also know how to do it rather quickly. It's so a greater than or equal to 58. X is a discrete, so we actually do have to pay attention to the 58. This is 1 minus x less than or equal to 57. N's 100. 
p is 0 0.5. So the p-value is 0 0.0660531. So how do we interpret that p-value? Let's go ahead and look at the distribution of the number of heads. So this is the probability mass function for our null hypothesis. The dark blue is the greater than or equal to 58. So the dark blue is going to be the p-value and technically the sum of the area under the dark blue will be our p-value. Um, since the p-value is greater than our usual alpha of 0.05, remember it's 0.06 something, we do not reject the null hypothesis. The data are not sufficiently against the null hypothesis. Therefore, we actually cannot uh, conclude anything about the research hypothesis. P may be greater than 0.5, P may be less than 0.5, P may be exactly equal to 0.5. If you look at the confidence interval for P by doing the binomial procedure, you'll see that the confidence interval includes 0.5. It includes some numbers less than 0.5 it includes some numbers greater than 0.5. And as such, we know that that entire confidence interval is a set of reasonable values for P, since it includes things above, below, and equal to 0.5. All of those are reasonable realities. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. P-value is too large. Example 2 cards. I believe that my blackjack dealer is cheating. If everything is fair, then I expect to have a blackjack 4.75% of the time. You can calculate that using Chapter 4 stuff. I've played 132 hands and got a blackjack only once. Do I have evidence that the blackjack, blackjack dealer is cheating? In other words, using statistical language, my research hypothesis, my claim about reality, is that P is less than 4.75%. Why less than? Why would my blackjack dealer cheat and give me a higher probability of winning? So, less than. Will this also be the alternative or the null? Correct, this will also be the alternative. This has no equals part to it. So what will the null hypothesis be? Very good, greater than or equal to. From the way the problem is set up, we know that the number of blackjacks x follows a binomial, n of 132, the number of hands I've played, p of 0.0475, which is 4.75%, which is the equals part in the null hypothesis. Also, we know that if the number of blackjacks is too small, then the alternative hypothesis is more likely to be correct, and we would reject the null. So let's calculate the p-value. I observed 1, so the p-value is going to be x less, the probability of x being less than or equal to 1, given x follows this distribution. So it's p-binom 1 size 132 prob 0.0475. That gives us a p-value of 0 0.0123027 because the p-value is so small. I reject the null hypothesis. I have evidence that the blackjack dealer is cheating. Notice that I say I have evidence. I don't say this is proof. Statisticians deal in evidence, not in proof. So this will be the distribution, or part of it. It continues on to the right a lot. Uh, distribution under the null hypothesis. The p-value will be the sum of these two heights. Notice that it is very small, very low. p naught is our claimed. Well, oh yeah, uh, p naught is our uh, 
uh, is the 4.75%. Um, sorry, it threw me off there for a moment. Uh, P0 is our 4.75%. 4 4 yeah, 4.75. What we observed was way down here. And remember, the p-value is what we observed, or more so. Observed more so. Next example, the D in CCD. I believe that this die is biased against getting a 6, specifically using statistical language. My research hypothesis claim about reality is HRP less than 1 sixth, which is 0.11, I'm sorry, 0.1667. To test this, I roll the die 100 times and get 6 a total of 9 times. Um, because this is less than, that's the alternative. The null would be greater than or equal to. This is also binomial. N of 100, P of 0.1667. I need to calculate, let's see, I got a total of 9 times. So I need to calculate the probability of x being less than or equal to 9. The equal to is data this extreme. The less than is or more so. We know how to calculate this. This comes out to be 0.02124964. If we need to make a decision, since this is less than our alpha of 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. We have evidence that the die is biased against the number 6. Here's the probability mass function for that particular binomial. I observed 9, which is right here. p-value would be the sum of the heights for 9 and less. Those are pretty straightforward. Those are the binomial examples. Let's look at some means examples. These will go back to the z distribution. Um, some fast food restaurant in town claims that the weight of a quarter pounder hamburger before cooking is four ounces with a standard deviation of sigma equals one ounce. Notice we are given the population standard deviation is one. Um, the research hypothesis or the claim by Wack Donalds is mu is equal to four. Since this is an equals, this will also be the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis will be not equal to. That's new. We haven't done a not equal to. To test this, we weigh a stack of 25 patties and find that the total weight is only 94 ounces. We would expect it to be 100, 4 times 25, but it's only 94. Is there sufficient evidence that Wack Donalds is incorrect? So we're trying to calculate probability that T, remember capital T is the statistic total, or the sum of the uh, observations. Probability that T is less than or equal to 94, or T is greater than or equal to 106. Well, the less than or equal to 94 is pretty obvious. We observed 94. That's less than what we would expect. Therefore, we'd have to calculate the probability of P being as extreme, the equals part, or more so. But remember the alternative is not equal to, and therefore being too high would also be as extreme or more so. 94 is 6 less than what we would expect, so the upper end will be 6 more than what we expect. And then greater than or equal to that 106. Uh, T follows a normal distribution with expected value of 100 and variance of 1 times square root of 25. Remember this is for the sample total and this statement more or less comes from the central limit theorem. In fact, forget the more or less, the statement does come from the central limit theorem. Specifically since I didn't tell you the actual distribution of the uh, patty weights. 1 times the square root of 25 is just 5, so keep that in mind. This is just 2 times the probability of x being less than or equal to 94. 
given mu is equal to 100 and s is equal to 5. Why is it 2 times this? Well, notice we're only calculating the lower tail, and we actually have to calculate both the lower and the upper. But the normal distribution is symmetric, so I can just double the lower. It gives me a p-value of 0.23. Because this p-value is greater than alpha, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. If we do a confidence interval, we'll see that the confidence interval does include 100, as well as values above it and values below it. So we don't actually know if mu is 4, or greater than 4, or less than 4. All values work according to our data. Which means we probably should go back there and collect some more data. Here's the distribution of t. Notice we observed 94. This area is less than or equal to 94. This is the as extreme or more so on the bottom end. This is 106, so this will be the as extreme or more so on the upper end. Normal distribution is symmetric, so this dark blue area will be exactly the same as this dark blue area. So we can get away with just doubling this lower tail. So the total area, or double the lower, is the p-value. Uh, Wack Donald's claims that the weight of a half pounder hamburger patty before cooking is eight ounces with a standard deviation of sigma equals one. Again, we know we're given sigma, the population standard deviation. In symbols, this will be mu is equal to eight because they're claiming that the average weight is eight ounces. To test this, we weigh a stack of 25 patties and find that the average now we're looking at the average, is only 7.5 ounces. Is this sufficient evidence that Wack Donald is incorrect? Since the research is equal, that will also be the null. Alternative will be not equal to. We observe 7.5 ounces, so we need to pro uh, calculate the probability of being less than or equal to 7. ounces and greater than or equal to 8.5 ounces because the alternative is not equal to. Here x bar follows a normal, mean 8, standard deviation 1 over 5, 1 over the square root of n. And again, this comes from the central limit theorem. 2 times p norm of 7.5, mean of 8, standard deviation of 0.2, gives us a p value of 0 0.01241933. How should we interpret this result? Because the p-value uh, is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. We have sufficient evidence that mu is less than 8. Here's the distribution of x-bar. We observed way down here. Wack Donald's claims way up here, but we observed down here p-value is this area plus this area because both are as extreme from mu or more so. Or we can just double the lower tail. That will give us the p-value that we sought. Very small probability. We're way out here in the tails. Wack Donald's claims that the weight of a pounder hamburger patty before cooking is at least 16 ounces with the standard deviation of sigma equal one ounce. In symbols, this is hr, mu, that's the average, is greater than or equal to 16. Why greater than or equal to? Because it's at least. That's what greater than or equal to means. This will also be the null hypothesis because it has the equals part. The alternative will be the opposite of this. It will be less than. To test this, we weigh a stack of 100 patties and find that the average weight is 15.9 ounces. Is this sufficient evidence that Wack-Donald's is incorrect? Let's calculate the p-value. 
I'm going to calculate the p-value. This is just the probability of x bar being less than or equal to 15.9. Why only one direction? It's because the research hypothesis only has one direction. Notice we're calculating less than or equal to. The alternative was less than. And we know that x bar follows a normal mean of 16, standard deviation of 1 over 10, because n is 100. And this is a really good weekend for me. Here's how we calculate the p-value. comes out to be 0.1586553. This value is greater than alpha. Therefore, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. There is not sufficient evidence that McDonald's is wrong. I mean, McDonald's is wrong. They could be wrong, but we don't have the evidence that they're wrong because the p-value is so high. Here's that distribution of x bar. This is what we observed. Remember, the alternative was less than because the null was greater than or equal to. The alternative was less than, so we shade less than what we observe, this will be the p-value. One more example after this. Number of calories in a McPork is at most 350, with a standard deviation of 50 calories. In symbols, this is less than or equal to. At most is less than or equal to. Uh, to test this, we perform a calorimetry test on a stack of 100 McPorks. What a waste of good food. And find that the average number of calories is 343. Note the alternative is greater than, because this is less than or equal to. This will be the null. The or equal to part is key there. The alternative will be the opposite. So now we ask, what's the p-value? Is there sufficient evidence that McDonald's is incorrect? need to calculate the probability of x-bar being greater than or equal to 343. We observed 343. The alternative is greater than, so the greater than part will be the or more so extreme. And we got x-bar follows a normal 350, because that's our claim, with sigma equal to 50, boom, 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 divided by the square root of n. This is just p norm, 343, 355, gets us a p value of 0.9192433. Because the p value is greater than alpha, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. There is no sufficient evidence that Wack Donalds is wrong about its calorie statement. They could be wrong, we just don't have the evidence. There is the distribution. Remember the alternative was greater than, so we shade above what we observe. And that's a lot of dark blue, so the p-value really looks really big. So short summary, we looked at stating hypotheses, testing hypotheses, calculating p-value from the definition. We looked at two R functions. These are things that we've seen in the past. Um, download the all procedures PDF file that lists all the statistical procedures we're going to use in R. We're going to see how to use those in the next lecture. Because um, in the next lecture we're going to review today and use R to perform the calculations really easy. I guess that should be p-values. Um, again, we're going to cover a lot of tests so keep separate sheets for each of the tests. There's an example of a flow chart on how to uh, test me a single mean um, on the module on the module four page. Um, follow it. Create your own for the rest of them. Here are some readings: are for starters, chapter four, Hawks Learning, chapter ten, of course, Wikipedia hypothesis tests. Which brings us to the intra-lecture questions. There's three of them. Question one, and again, write question one. The question on the left-hand side of your notes. Answer it below so you can easily transfer it into Moodle. What is the relationship between the null and the alternative hypotheses? 
question two. What are the three allowed signs in a null hypothesis? Question three. When is the research hypothesis the same as the alternative hypothesis? And all three of these get back at a common problem in intro stats of trying to figure out, okay, I've got a research hypothesis. Where do I go from here? Um, you may want to review the table, um, or you may not. So those are the three. And that's the end of this. Um, again, next lecture, we're going to see how to do this in R. Thank you much. Hello and welcome to section 10.4. Chapter 10 is all about hypothesis testing. Section 10.4 is about handling proportions, one sample and two sample proportions. Um, so by the end of this lecture, you should be able to understand the theory behind and test hypotheses about a single population proportion and the difference between two population proportions. You should also better understand that the, uh, the uh, better understand what the p-value means and how to test hypotheses and clearly specify why confidence intervals and p-values both give important information about the population parameter. So, one parameter procedures, um, this will be about population proportion, p. And the parametric procedure is the binomial procedure. The usual graphic is the binomial plot. Huh, that seems to be a lot like what we did back with confidence intervals and one parameter, uh, one population proportion. Hmm. Uh, requires the data being generated from the binomial distribution. That really sounds familiar. The R function is binom.test, x comma n, x is the number of successes, n is the number of trials. I, s I guarantee we've seen this somewhere before, haven't we? Um, note that this is not the procedure that Hawks covers. They use something called the Wald test, Wald.test. It also takes x comma n. So that should help you with the Hawks assignments. Here's the tests theory, and we've actually covered this back when we introduced hypothesis testing. It was a whole bunch of binomial stuff. Well, this is what led to the binomial test. Uh, we're trying to draw conclusions about a single population proportion. We should use a test statistic based on the sample proportion or on what we observe, the number of, of successes. Um, if we do it based on the sample proportion, we'll use the Wald test. If we do it on the number of successes, we'll use the binomial test. Again, the binomial test is the exact test, and the Wald test is the approximate test. Um, we're given x follows a binomial distribution. Recall that the binomial has two parameters, n and p. Um, the number of observations serves as a particularly fine test statistic because we know its distribution exactly. Uh, it's binomial. Um, we only know the distribution of the proportions approximately. Um, x divided by n is only approximately normal. And that only comes about because of the central limit theorem. If we go all the way back to section 6.5, approximating the binomial with the normal, we see, oh, there's a lot of error that can pop in there because it is a, an approximation. And the smaller the sample size, the more the error. Um, the following are three examples showing how to perform these calculations. I have a coin that I think is fair. To test this, I flip it 10 times and count the number of heads in those 10 flips. A total of three heads actually came up. Is this sufficient evidence that the coin is not fair? So the claim is p is equal to 1 half. That's the research hypothesis. Since it contains equal sign, this is also the null hypothesis. Since the equals is the null, the alternative will be not equal. We're trying to make a conclusion about p, where the data are generated from a binomial. Thus, under the null hypothesis, x follows a binomial, n of 10, p of 0.5. We observed x equals 3 p-value is defined as the probability of observing data this extreme or more so, given that the null hypothesis is true. In other words, the p-value is the probability of x being less than or equal to 3. 
plus x greater than or equal, uh, probability of x greater than or equal to 7. Data this extreme would be x equal 3, the or, or more so is less than 3. Where did the 7 come from? Well, expected value of x, which is n times p, is 5. 3 is 2 less than 5, just as extreme would be 2 more than 5. And more extreme than that would be greater than 2 plus 5. There's the distribution of x, distribution of the number of heads. We observed 3. That's the red thing. 7 is equally extreme. Less than or equal to 3 is or more so on the left, and greater than or equal to 7 is or more so on the right. So the red heights added up will give us our p-value. So the p-value is 0.34375, simply using calculations that we did back in Chapter 5, Section 2. And in fact, we did these calculations back in Chapter 5, Section 2. And we interpreted it correctly as evidence in favor of or against the claim. We're just giving it some more terminology and some more meaning. From the all procedures handout and the SCA examples that we've looked at, we know we can also do binom.test, x equals 3, n equals 10, and p equals 0 0.050. Line tells us that the p-value is 0.3438. Since this is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. The coin may be fair, the coin may not be fair. We have no evidence that can tell us either way. A 95% confidence interval for the probability of a flip landing head is between 6.7% and 65.2%. That is an extremely wide confidence interval. How possibly could we make it narrower? Right. Collect more data. Instead of flipping the coin 10 times, flip the coin 100 times. 100 times, 10,000 times. The larger the sample size, the narrower the confidence interval. Example two, this goes back to an, uh, a uh, lab that we did. I contend that more than a quarter of students at Knox are juniors. To test this, I randomly sample from the student body asking class year. In my sample of 100 students, 30 stated they were juniors. Here the claim is p is greater than 0.25 because I contend that more than a quarter, so it's more than, since it contains the greater than sign, this will be the alternative. The null will be the opposite of greater than, which is not greater than, otherwise known as less than or equal to. That means the two statistical hypotheses are given below. Here's the distribution of the number of juniors under the null hypothesis. Remember, the null hypothesis contains the equals part of a quarter. I asked 100 people, so this will be the distribution of the number of juniors that I experience. P-value will be the probability, oh, remember I got 30 of them. So this is what I observed right here. Since the alternative was greater than, the p-value is going to be the probability of x being greater than or equal to 30. The equal to is as extreme, and the greater than is the or more so. We get 0.1495 because the p-value is greater than alpha. We fail to reject the null hypothesis. We do not have sufficient evidence that the proportion of juniors is greater than a quarter. In fact, we can calculate the confidence interval directly and find that the proportion of juniors is greater than 0.2249 based on this data. Or we can use a binomial test. 
x is 30, because that's what we observe, the number of successes. n is 100, that's the sample size. p is 0.25, that's my value of interest, that's my theta naught. The alternative is greater because I claim that mu is, I'm sorry, I claim that p is greater than 0.25. We get a p-value of 0.1495. We get the confidence interval from 0.23 up. So I'm 95% that the proportion of juniors is at least 0.2249232. One thing that we can definitely use this binomial test for is to check if a data set is representative on its face. Um, the data file is some college. Um, this is real data. I had to change the name of the college to protect the innocent. It was sent to me by the registrar of some college to do some statistical analysis. I did a little check, sent it right back and said the data are not representative. Um, she said, yes it is. I said, okay, I'll go ahead and do the analysis, and it'll be worthless, but I will tell you it's worthless. She kind of got upset with me. Um, I was supposed to model the success, the high enough GPA given some of the other variables. Let's perform a quick check to see if the data are reasonably representative of the population at that college. So my provided sample consisted of 661 students. She claimed a random sample from the college, of which 22 were freshmen. Given that the proportion of freshmen at SCU, some college university, is 28%, um, is the are the data representative in terms of freshmen? So here the claim is p is equal to 0.280. Since it contains equal sign, it's the null. That means that the two hypotheses are equal and then not equal for the alternative. Under the null hypothesis, the number of freshmen in my sample should follow this binomial distribution, n of 661, p of 0.28. Remember, I observed 22. So I observed something down here. Something just as extreme is going to be located way up here. Or we can simply just double the probability of x being less than or equal to 22. Probability of x being less than or equal to 22 is 0. I'll go ahead and double that. 2 times 0 is 0. Um, we could also add 0 to that. Um, we could multiply by 1 if we want to stretch this out, but it comes down the p-value is 0. Um, since the p-value is less than our alpha of 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. In terms of freshmen, the sample is not representative of the population of SCU. Since I'm trying to model the GPA, it is very reasonable that freshmen GPA will be different from sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Therefore, in order for my analysis to be worth the weight that it's to be worth its weight in gold, I really do need more freshmen in my sample. Or we can just use power of R binome dot tests. X is twenty two, number of successes. N is six hundred sixty one, P is point two eight. I got the point two eight from their uh, website. Got a p-value of being less than two point two times ten to the negative sixteenth. This data would be representative if the proportion of freshmen at SCU is between two percent and five percent. Now that I talk about this, I realize I never did get paid for this, so. Yeah, it's okay. I didn't do anything other than say that they didn't give me the data. Uh, next types of tests, the two parameter procedures. Um, we're going to compare P1 minus P2, or we're going to compare P1 and P2. 
the parameter of interest will be P1 minus P2. This will be the proportions procedure, or the two proportions procedure. The graphic will be the binomial plot. It requires that the expected number of successes is at least five in each group. Uh, some would say at least 10 in each group. Uh, if no one's dying from you being wrong, then at least 10 should be fine. If you really do need to make sure that you're right, then at least 50 or at least 100 in each group would be preferred. The proportions test is based on the normality approximation to the binomial distribution. Therefore, a large sample size is required. The R function is, <coughs> pardon me, is prop.test. Um, you give it the number of successes, x, and the number of trials, n. Since it's two, um, two proportions we're comparing, you've got to give it two sets of x's, or two x's, and two n's wrapped in c's. Um, they use something close to this, but this procedure actually makes adjustments for the fact that the binomial distribution is discrete and the normal is not. As such, you'll need to use the Wald test to perform Hawk's homework estimating P1 minus P2. So again, when you're using proportion stuff with Hawks, use the Wald test. The Wald test will, act, will require both the X and the N, just as laid out here with prop test. Um, sample sizes are large, the Wald test and the proportions test will give you essentially the same answers. It's only when the sample size is small that they're going to be different. So here's the theory behind the proportions test. Um, actually, here's the theory behind the Wald test. Um, since we're trying to draw conclusions about the difference between two population proportions, we're going to use a test statistic based on the difference in two sample proportions. Um, in other words, we're going to use sample proportion 1 minus sample proportion 2. We do know that X and Y both follow binomial distributions, each with their own sample sizes, each with their own probabilities, Px and Py. Um, one of the biggest problems is X minus Y is not going to work because we don't know the distribution of X minus Y. It's not binomial. Um, we, uh, but we do know that the sample proportion for x minus the sample proportion for y is a good estimator of px minus py. And the sample proportion is just the number of successes divided by the number of trials. So that's going to be successes over trials for x minus successes over trial for y. All we have to do now is figure out the distribution of this statistic. If we're okay with approximation, we know that x is approximately normal and y is approximately normal, which means that x over nx is approximately normal and y over ny will be approximately normal and x over nx minus y over ny will also be approximately normal. Um, central limit theorem is just so awesome. I mean, we can say all of that simply because of the central limit theorem. And the approximation increases, I mean, the approximation gets better as the sample sizes individually get better. Um, which is what we're saying here. Remember that the if x follows a binomial, then it also approximately follows a normal with expected value of np and variance of np1 minus p. And we'll subscript all the x stuff with x and all the y stuff with y. Standardizing, or I'm sorry, dividing by x, n, x, and, and y will get us this as our normal distributions. Subtracting x over n, x, and y over n, y gets us its own normal distribution. Notice that this px minus py is what we're trying to estimate. In other words, our sample proportion for x minus the sample proportion for y is unbiased for our population proportion x minus population proportion y. That's good. Here's the variance, though. And we'll do the typical standardization. We're going to subtract off the expected value divided by the square root of the variance. And that means that it will follow this, this test statistic here 
will follow a normal distribution with mean 0, standard deviation 1. And the standardization comes directly out of either chapter 2 or chapter 3 when we did the Z scores or the standardized scores. If PX equals PY is our null hypothesis, then that means that the second half just goes to zero or is equal to zero, and this is the usual Z procedure version of the test. We can do an equivalent test to this. This is an aside. Um, if we square this thing on the left, and that means we have to square this thing on the right. Squaring this thing on the left leads us to this. Squaring the thing on the right brings up a new distribution. It's the chi-squared distribution. This probability statement and this probability statement are identical. There is no information contained in one that's not contained in the other. There is no difference in power. There is no difference in precision. There is no difference in accuracy. The two tests are mathematically equivalent. So the one you use, if you use this one, you might as well use this one. If you use this one, go ahead and use this one. They're the same. Um, the proof of that is left for a later class, 225 or 321. So let's see how to do this. I'd like to determine if the proportion of males who wear hats is the same as the proportion of females who wear hats. Notice now we're dealing with proportions in two separate populations. Proportion of hat wearers of males and proportion of hat wearers of females. To test this, I sample 100 males and 100 females. 10 males and 16 females were wearing hats. So those are the hypotheses. Step one, we're going to assemble the information we have. P sub x is what we observe, P sub y, uh, sample proportion, I guess, uh, nx and y, we asked 100 males, 100 females, alpha is 0.05, which means our z sub alpha over 2 is plus or minus 1.96. This is the test statistic we have to calculate. I'll give you a hint. There's a fast way of doing this in R, and you already know it. But let's go ahead and, and churn through this. So here's the formula for the test statistic. This is the plug. This is the chug. And we're chugging some more and more chugging and chugging. And we're done chugging. So our test statistic is negative 1.26601. This is this distribution is our standard normal distribution. This is what we observe. Negative 1.26601. It's right here. That value is as extreme, so as positive 1.26601, or more so, is the shaded area on both sides. So these two areas add up, give you the p-value, because the normal is symmetric, twice this area is the p-value. So we can calculate the p-value. It's 0 0.2053. Because the p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We do not have evidence that men wear hats at a rate different than women, which is what this says. There is no evidence to claim that. They may. They may not. We just don't know. We don't have the evidence. Um, what I just described is the Wald test. Uh, doing this in R is just one line, as opposed to doing all this calculation by hand, all this fun calculation. It's just one line. This is the output. 10 successes for males, 16 successes for females out of 100 trials for men and 100 trials for females. Gives us back the data. Here's the p-value. 0.2071, greater than alpha, failed to reject the null hypothesis, no evidence of a difference, and that's it. How, how much faster is this 
then all of this and I'll, I'll tell you this when I was typing this up you know how many times I had to go through this and make sure I didn't make a mistake in the calculations I'm not talking about it in the typing it up I'm talking about the calculations I think I even made a mistake in the numerator here I, I think I made this as plus 0 0.06 so allowing the computer to do all of this in one line is just amazing. So in today's slide deck, we covered procedures for estimating a single population proportion and for estimating the difference in two population proportions. If you're doing this in R, I'm sorry, if you're doing this for Hawks, Wald test works for both of these. And you should use the Wald test if you're doing Hawks. If you're doing this for real, binomial test for the first and prop test for the second. Um, in the future, we're going to see many, 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 many more procedures, uh, more tests. Again, create that section in your notebook dedicated to tests and the assumptions of the tests. Um, we looked at binom.test and prop.test. Um, wall.test behaves the exact same as either one of these, except instead of binom.test, you'll do wall.test. And instead of prop.test, you'll do wall.test. But the, the parameters that you put over here are going to be the same. Here are some available SCAs to help you work through these. Um, uh, SCA 12 and 22. Um, the 2 means it's for proportions, the 1 is the number of samples, so this SCA 12 is for 1 sample proportions, and SCA 22 is for 2 sample proportions, and they're all located in the usual place. Um, so now I'm going to ask the intra-lecture questions. One of these will be very familiar. Question 1, when is the research hypothesis the same as the alternative? I encourage you to go back and look it up again. The rest of the, the remaining two questions will be different, um, but similar to each other. Uh, for what types of hypotheses do we use the binomial test? And what I mean by that is, I'll just give you the answer because it's fun. Um, the types of hypotheses for which we use the binomial test are those where we're trying to test hypotheses about one single population proportion. And question three is what types of hypotheses do we use the proportions test? And I can give you that answer too. It's for hypotheses about comparing two population proportions. I don't mind giving the answer sometimes. Chapter 8 in R for Starters, sections 10.4 and 11.4 in uh, Hawks. Go ahead and read up on hypothesis tests in Wikipedia. All procedures at PDF, you should have that printed out and available to you when you're working on stats. And that's the end. Handling proportions. Um, hope this was helpful. I will see you or talk to you later. Hello and welcome to chapter 10 where we cover lots and lots of tests for hypothesis testing. Here we're going to look at section 10.6 where we look at discrete distribution matching. We introduce the um, chi-squared goodness of fit test. And by the end of this lecture you should be able to understand the theory behind and test hypotheses about just one thing. Comparing an observed categorical distribution to a hypothesized one. Um, also, the usual, better understand the p-value and how to test hypotheses. But this one is about goodness of fit tests. Um, so here's the parametric procedure. It's the only procedure we've got, the chi-squared goodness of fit procedure. The null hypothesis is that the data are genera generated by the hypothesized distribution. So the research hypothesis is going to be, and the null hypothesis is going to be, that hypothesized distribution. The alternative hypothesis will be the data are not generated by that hypothesized distribution. Um, the graphic is going to be the usual binomial plot. Um, notice that it's expanded to go from not 1, not 2, but k, different values or different groups. 
these will be successes, the x's and the n's will be the number of trials. Um, requires that the number of successes and the expected number of successes in each group is at least five. Sometimes there's required to be ten. Um, it really does come down to how precise or accurate do you want your values to be or your estimates to be. Um, more data is always better, as long as it's good data, of course. Um, if your expected number of successes is not at least five in each group, um, it's really not anything you can do except collect more data. And if you can't collect more data, then you've got to conclude whatever you can conclude from this test. But you must specify the sample, uh, the sample size is too small to properly use this chi-squared goodness of fit test. Therefore, these results are highly questionable. Um, the R function is chisk.test. Um, what does chisk stand for? It's chi squared. And notice again, we got a dot test thing. We get a whole lot of dot test things. And the dot plot things, we got a lot of dot plot things. Um, note that this function, this chisk.test function, is not hawks. Um, they use something close to this, but the chisk.test function actually makes adjustment for the fact that the binomial distribution is discrete and the normal is not. Um, the hand calculations that we have do agree with Hawks, however. Um, so pay attention to the quote hand calculations and how to do them in R. So all you have to do is just substitute a few, change a few numbers and it'll be good for you. So we'll start with a framing example. Um, that is a picture of a three-sided die. I would like to test if it is fair. To do this, I roll it 600 times and tabulate the observed frequency distribution. In those 600 rolls, I got 181s, 215s, and 205s. Note that I would expect to have 200 ones, 200 twos, and 200 threes if the die were fair. I didn't. I got 181s, 215 twos, and 205 threes. Now the question is, is the 180, 215, and 205 just due to the random fluctuation in a fair die, or are those values too far away from what we would expect? if the die were fair. And that's really what all of the statistical testing is coming down to. It's what I expect versus what I observe, and is what I observe too far away from what I expect given expected random fluctuation. So we're given this information, I'm just abstracting it. The observed counts are 180, 215, 205. The expected counts are 200, 200, 200. Now, where did I get the 200? Sample size is 600. I rolled it 600 times. I want to test if the three-sided die is fair. If it is fair, then I would expect the number of ones to equal the number of twos to equal the number of threes, each of them to be a third of 600. Note what the information above actually gives to us. It gives us a, a set of observed counts and a set of expected counts. We're going to call the observed counts x's and the expected counts mu's. And in this, there are k groups. That's what the k stands for. In the example that we're working on, k is equal to 3. So our goal is to create a test statistic that measures how far apart the observed is from the expected while creating, well, still having a distribution that we know. Um, and we're going to use define we in this case as statisticians. We in this class don't know this distribution yet, although technically we have bumped into it once when we were doing one var dot test. So it can be shown, but not in this class, that the test statistic approximately follows a chi-squared distribution with k minus 1 degrees of freedom. The approximation gets better as mu gets larger. 
Um, so that statement, the TS equals the sum and the probability statement, is something that is to be shown in a future course. In other words, it's beyond the scope of this course. I like that phrase, beyond the scope of this course. Uh, TS represents test statistic. It's the sum over all of the groups, the observed minus the expected squared divided by the expected. Why the squaring? We're squaring it because if we don't square, then the sum of the xi minus the mu i is always going to give us zero. So this squaring allows us to avoid the zero problem and to indicate that larger values of there are could be too high or too low. They're just farther away from what you would expect. So recall the observed counts were 180, 215, 205. The expecteds were 200, 200, 200. The expected values again came from NP. N is our number of trials. P is the probability of success for each of those categories. The probability of getting one is one third. So the expected number of ones is 600 times one third. Expected number of twos is 600 times one third. Expected number of threes is 600 times one third. Yes, binomial. Mu is equal to NP. So let's go ahead and do these calculations out for fun. Um, TS, the test statistic, is defined as this. If we expand that summation, that's what this means. First time through, i is equal to 1, so it's x sub 1 minus mu sub 1 squared over mu sub 1, plus, because it's a summation, next time through, i is equal to 2, x sub 2 minus mu sub 2 squared divided by mu sub 2. Third time through, again, we're going to add on the third term, which is x sub 3 minus mu sub 3 squared over mu sub 3. So this is the expansion of the summation. And now all we're doing is just substituting in the values we've got. x sub 1 is 180, x sub 2 is 215, x sub 3 is 205. Those are what we experienced or observed. The expected values were 200 each. Now we do the calculations, 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 calculations. So our test statistic is 3.250. This is the distribution, the chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom. This is what we observe for our test statistic, 3.250, 3.250. Shaded area is 3.25 is the probability of having an, a test statistic of 3.250 or greater. So this shaded area is the p-value. And that p-value actually comes out to be 0.1969. Here we are with a p-value. We know how to interpret that p-value. This has been the same since we introduced p-values. P-value is greater than alpha, failed to reject the null hypothesis. We don't have evidence that the die is unfair. P-value greater than alpha, we failed to reject the null hypothesis. We don't have evidence that the die is unfair. P-value greater than 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We don't have evidence the die is unfair. I think three is enough. So there's the conclusion. We don't have evidence that the die is unfair. It could be unfair. I don't know. But the data doesn't tell us it's unfair. Note that the data doesn't tell us it's fair either. The data leaves it up to a big question mark of we don't know. Could be fair, may not be fair. We don't have enough data to say. So here's the way of getting it in uh, for Hawk's calculations. OBS will be the observed counts. EXP is the expected counts. So these will need to change for your problem. TS, this is how you quickly calculate that test statistic. That doesn't need to change. 
just running TS will give you the value of the test statistic. That won't need to change. 1 minus P Kaisk doesn't change, of TS doesn't change, but we do need to change the degrees of freedom. This 2 needs to be K minus 1, with the number of groups minus 1. So if we've got 10 groups here, change that to a 9. If you've got 2 groups here, change that to a 1. This will get you the Hawks answers. So we get a test statistic of 3.25, a, a, a p-value of 0.1969. Here it is using R. Kaisk.test, you give it the, the observed distribution of counts. And this is important, this is a distribution of counts. And you also give it the hypothesized distribution but these are going to be probabilities. So instead of 200, 200, 200, you give it one-third, one-third, one-third. Just so happens in this case, you do get the same chi-squared test statistic, degrees of freedom, and p-value as if you did it by hand using the Hawks method. Example 2. My friend claims that the proportion of cars in the Knox campus that are American is the same as the proportion that are European and as the proportion that are Asian. Okay. So to test this, I went to the parking lot across Berrien from SMAC and counted the cars and their origins and had a conversation with a couple of people who were wondering what I was doing over there. Um, I on that day, I, there were 19 American, 23 Asian, and 2 European cars. So the observed and expected values are 19. The observed is 19, 23, and 2. The expected is 44 thirds, 44 thirds, 44 thirds. Those are expected counts. Why is it thirds? It's because they're the same proportions. So the proportion of Americans equals the proportion of Europeans equals the proportion of Asians. One third, one third, one third. Where the 44 come from, there are 44 cars. So let's go ahead and calculate this out. Three groups. So the test statistic, this is the formula, which is expanded to this. Plug and chug and chug and chug. Are we done chugging? There we go. Test statistic is 16.954. Here's the distribution. Here's the chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom. There are three groups, so it's three minus one, two degrees of freedom. Um, where's the p-value? Wait, where's the test statistic? Test statistic was almost 17, so I guess test statistic is way over here. Uh, p-value 0 0.0002, because the p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. The proportion of cars on campus is not the same for American, Asian, and European. That's all we can say, is it's not the same. This is not the distribution. Because the null hypothesis and the research hypothesis for chi-squared goodness fit test is, this is the distribution. The alternative would be this is not the distribution. Um, what does this conclusion assume? And it's time we start thinking about this again. Notice how I collected the data. I went across the street from SMAC and went through the went through the parking lot. For this to be an appropriate conclusion, the data I collected has to be representative of the cars on campus. The cars in that one parking lot has to be representative of all the cars on campus. The cluster sampling I did has to be appropriate. Remembering back to chapter one, since it's cluster sampling, I have to somehow assert or check that the proportion of cars that are American, European, Asian is independent of the parking lot. Huh. How could we test that? 
I'll give you a hint, we don't know yet because we would be uh, testing for independence between a categorical variable, car type, and a categorical variable, parking lot. So be aware, that'll be a future test. Um, here's the code. Again, three groups. Degrees of freedom is 3 minus 1. We can also do this with the KISC.test. Notice I did not specify comma p equals one third, one third, one third. Here's why. By default, R assumes equal probabilities. So if you are testing equal probabilities, you don't actually have to specify that for R. You can. I encourage it because it increases the readability of your code, but you don't have to. In fact, I strongly encourage it because it does make very explicit that you are testing equal probability amongst those three groups. Sample three, Department of Mathematics claims that the proportion of its graduates who went to grad school is twice the proportion of any other post back path. To test this, the department sent out a questionnaire to all of the alums who, for whom they had current addresses. Here's a table of the results. That includes the count and the expected. We had 35 that we could get in touch with. Um, Notice we said twice the proportion of any other post back, so 14 expected for grad school, but 7 for business, 7 for education, 7 for unemployed. By the way, this is fake data. Um, we actually counted 14 grad school, 7 business, 10 education, 5 unemployed. So this will be the vector of counts observed. And this will be a vector of counts expected. This is how we calculate it by hand. Notice we now have four groups. Here's the chi-squared distribution with three degrees of freedom. K is four, K minus one is three degrees of freedom. Here's our the value of the test statistic we got. Um, the shaded region is our p-value p-value of 0.5874. Because the p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We do not have evidence that the data do not follow the distribution, the claimed distribution. The claim made by the math department that twice as many of its graduates go to grad school as in any other category is reasonable. Note that we did not prove that the math department is correct. We just said their claim is reasonable given this data. Given additional data, it may not be reasonable, but given this particular data, it is. And then, of course, I'm going to ask, what does this conclusion actually assume? So I want to start tying back to chapter one more and more, not just subtly, but very explicitly. How did the math department get this data? Is this data representative of all math majors? In other words, who would we have kept in touch with or who would have kept in touch with us? Is it equally likely that any graduate of the math department would have kept in touch with us? Or are certain types of students, like grad students, more likely to keep in touch with us? or like education students, more likely to keep in touch with us. Notice that we sent out a questionnaire to all of the alums for whom we had current addresses. Who are we more likely to keep current addresses for? Who is more likely to fall off the grid? This is how you do it for Hawks. Notice we got four groups, so the degrees of freedom will be three. A 
notice I did the p is equal to c of 14777 divided by 35. I could have done c of 14 over 35 comma 7 over 35 comma 7 over 35 comma 7 over 35. This is a little bit faster. One last example. One of the initiatives of Knox College is to become more representative of the U.S. population. This raises a question of whether we have succeeded in terms of numbers. Um, according to the fall 2019 domestic numbers, the data are observed, expected, and the expected is due to, uh, it, it compares, aha, let me start that again. Expected proportions are from the uh, uh, Census Bureau. Um, so we have 109, 71, 194, and 635. We would expect 163.58, 73.10, 238.37, and 555.61. If we perfectly followed. Here's a graph. Notice what the the boxes with the lines are what we actually are and the dots are the population of the United States notice we are below average here we're dead on here we're below here and we're way above here by the way the boxes indicate confidence intervals The horizontal line is the proportions, the sample proportions. So here we are um, using our uh, chi-squared tests. That's the observed counts. This is proportions according to the Census Bureau. I run it, got an error. The error is probabilities must sum to 1. What's the error? Well, these probabilities don't add up to 1. Why don't they add up to 1? Well, there's a po couple possibilities. One is I may have dropped a couple of the smaller groups. Two, there could be rounding errors. But for R to do this, <clears throat> these probabilities have to add up to 1. So the question comes down to how do we fix it? If we actually did leave out some of the smaller groups, or if there is rounding, how do we fix this? Um, R does have a uh, parameter rescale.p. We set it equal to true. It'll rescale these so that they do add up to 100%. So this will fix the error. Gives us a p-value that is significant, uh, is much, much less than alpha. We have evidence that the distribution of races and ethnicities in Knox is, does not match that in the population at large of the United States. However, realize that this p-value corresponds to a snapshot in time. It doesn't compare where we were 10 years ago. It just says where we were fall of 2019. So we weren't there. We didn't match the distribution in the United States in 2019, but we actually are getting much closer to, rea uh, to the population in the United States. Much closer. So the p-values are getting larger. The test statistics are getting smaller. And that's what this conclusion assumes. Um, so let's go ahead and do the uh, intro lecture questions. There we go. Huh, this looks familiar. Question one, when is the research hypothesis the same as the alternative hypothesis? Question two, I like question two and question three. So they're, they're the same question essentially, but I'm, I, I want two examples. Question two is give an example where you would use the chi-squared goodness of fit test in your area of interest. So if your major is or will be political science, give me a time when you would use the goodness fit test in political science. 
if your area of interest is or will be biology, give me an example where you'd use a goodness of fit test in biology, or in physics if you're going to be a physicist, or in, uh, uh, I can't think of any other areas, um, and so if you're going to be an anthropologist or sociologist. That's question two is give one example. Question three is to give another example. So question two and three are give examples of where you would actually use this chi-square goodness of fit in your discipline. And this actually could be in classes that you've taken in your discipline. Um, for instance, in chemistry, um, reaction rates would be, um, no, that wouldn't work. Um, for instance, chemistry, you've had uh, classes in chemistry, you may have needed to use a chi-square goodness of fit test. So in today's day slide de uh, deck, ah, let me start that slide again. So in today's slide deck, we covered procedures for testing if the observed categorical data came from the hypothesized distribution. That's it. Um, in the future, we're going to look at the chi-square test of independence. Um, we're going to look at analysis of variance. We're going to do linear regression. Those are the three remaining tests. Um, all procedures take advantage of the SCAs. Please take advantage of the SCAs for work, uh, for practice. Um, we only had one R function, chi-square.test. Remember, X and P um, are the numbers of successes and the probability of successes in each of the groups, respectively. Um, SCA 32 is going to be very helpful here. Uh, two for proportions, which goodness fit test does talk about proportions, and three more than two samples. Um, there's nothing in R for starters for this. Hawks Learning, this is section 10.6. That brings us to the end. Um, that's it. Um, so, bye. Hello and welcome to chapter 10 where we cover a lot of the hypothesis testing, not all of it, but a lot of it. And here we're looking at categorical independence, uh, section 7. Uh, categorical independence means that you're testing for independence between two categorical variables. Um, contrast this with testing independence between two numeric variables, which will be linear regression, which will be in the future. Uh, this lecture is about two categorical variables. Um, and that's really what we're doing. Still understanding the theory behind and hypotheses about determining if two categorical variables are independent. Um, and better understanding the p-value and how to test hypotheses. Um, parametric procedure is the chi-squared test of independence. Um, it's called a chi-squared test because the test statistic follows a chi-squared distribution. They're called t-tests because things in the past that we've covered are called t-tests because their test statistic follows a t-distribution. Things in the past have been called z-tests because their test statistics follow a z-distribution. Um, we saw an F test at one point because the test statistic follows an F distribution here. This is one of many chi-squared tests, and they're called chi-squared tests because the test statistic follows a chi-squared distribution. Uh, the null hypothesis is that the two categorical variables are independent. Um, the graphics a matrix plot, or a graphic is a matrix plot. Um, resign yourself to the fact that graphics for chi-squared tests of independence all look ugly and are difficult to interpret. Um, this requires the expected number of successes to be at least five in each cell, uh, or ten in each cell, or, I mean, and the reason for this is it's a normal approximation of the binomial distribution. And so larger sample sizes means that that normal approximation improves. Um, Central Limit Theorem, um, Section 5, 6, no, 6, 5, um, this function is indeed what Hawks covers, so you won't have to change anything to do your Hawks homework with this. However, for R to give you Hawks results, you'll need to use correct equals false in the function, and I'll show you where to do that. So let's go ahead and look at a framing example. I would like to test if there's a relationship between whether a person has blue eyes and whether that person is a math natural science major. To do this, I asked 100 people at Knox College, so I'm dealing with one large sample of 100 people, and I'm measuring two things on each person. One, 
if that person has blue eyes or not blue eyes, and two, if their major is in MNS or not in MNS. So here's the contingency table. Notice that each of these is a count. So in my sample, seven people had blue eyes and were MNS majors. 20 people, 7 plus 13, 20 people in my sample had blue eyes. The 52 people did not have blue eyes and were not math natural science majors. 80 people, 28 plus 52, did not have blue eyes. 35 people were math natural science majors. And whatever 13 plus 52 is, I think that's 65, were not math natural science majors. And adding them all together gives you 100, the number of people that I asked. So a contingency table is a table of counts. So let's, us, let's ask ourselves this question. What does it mean for two categorical variables to be independent? Recall back to chapter 4 that really fun chapter where it covered independence at one point. That is exactly what we're going to be using f to create our expected counts. So we'll have observed counts, expected counts, and when you've got those two, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump to your chi-squared test. Um, so what does it mean? It means that the value of one does not affect the pr uh, value of the other. Particularly for this, it means that the probability of a math natural science major does not depend on whether you are blue-eyed. We can also frame this as the distribution of MNS majors is the same for blue-eyed people as it is for non-blue-eyed people. We could also frame this as the distribution of blue-eyedness is the same for math natural science majors as it is for non-MNS majors. Let's check with the data for this interpretation. Here's the counts. So what's the proportion of blue-eyed people in this sample? 7 plus 13 over 100, so 20%. What's the proportion of blue-eyed people who are math natural science majors? It's 7 divided by 35. This is the number of blue-eyed people who are math natural science majors, and this is the number of math natural science majors. 20%. It's a match. So if I tell you I'm blue-eyed, that does not affect my knowledge about you being a math natural science major. Notice we could do the same thing. Proportion of blue eyes in the sample versus proportion of blue-eyed people who are not math natural science majors. Again, it's 20%. So if I tell you I'm blue-eyed, that should give you no information, or that does give you no information about whether I am a math natural science major, because the probabilities are the same, or whether I'm not a math natural science major. Probabilities are the same. We can do this with non-blue-eyed people. Proportion of non-blue-eyed people in the sample is... 20 plus, 28 plus 52, which is 80, divided by our sample size of 100, 80%. Proportion of non blue people who are MNS majors is also 80%. 28 divided by 35. So if I tell you I'm not blue-eyed, I'm not giving you any information about whether I'm a math natural science major, next page, or not, because the proportions or the percents are the same. So me giving you information about my eye, eye color doesn't give you any information about my major. In other words, my eye color is independent of major. Now that we've seen a small example, let's go ahead and generalize this. Here's our data. Variable 1 is A. Variable 2 is B. Variable 1 has two levels, A1 and A2. The B variable has two levels, B1 and B2. X11 is the number of people, the actual counts, who were A1 and B1. X12 is the actual counts of people who were B1 and A2. 
x21 were the actual counts of people who were b2 and a1, and x22 is b2 and a2 count. I'm going to scroll back to our data. I only have to go back to here. This would be a uh, this would be x11, x12, x13, x1. No, I got that wrong. x11, x12, x21, x22. There we go. The variable a is eye color. The level a1 is blue. Level a2 is not blue. The variable b is major. Level B1 is math and natural science major. Level B2 is not math and natural science major. Now we're going to create column and row sums. We'll number the row sums R1 and R2. R1 will be the number of people who are B1. R2 will be the number of people who are B2. Column sums will be the number of people who are A1, and C2 is the number of people who are A2. Going back a slide, so R1 will be 7 plus 28. There are 35 B1s. R2 will be 13 plus 52. There's 65 B2s. Um, C1 is 7 plus 13, so there's 20 A1s, and there's 80 A2s. The total sample size will be the sum of everything here, or it'll be the sum of the row sums, or it'll be the sum of the column sums. And it's 100. So here's the data that we were working with. Here's abstraction of it. In other words, we've got our counts. This is observed. Now we've got to figure out how to get expected. If the two variables are perfectly independent, and again refer back to section 4.3, the expected values would be, well, their expected values would be n times p. So we got the n's common for all of these. p is the probability of being in this cell. If the two variables are independent, that would be the probability of being in row 1 times the probability of being in column 1 if they're independent. Here, this would be the probability of being in row 2 times the probability of being in column 1. Row 2, column 2. Row 1, column 2. Those would be the probabilities multiplied by n to get np, which is the expected counts. So this will be the table of expected counts. We've got the table of observed counts, table of expected counts, and we know what to do with that for a chi-squared goodness uh, for a chi-squared distribution. Observed minus expected squared over expected. We're going to call this x2 instead of ts. Um, chi-squared distribution has one parameter called the degrees of freedom. For the goodness of fit test, it was groups minus one. For the uh, test of independence, it's going to be rows minus 1 times columns minus 1. Rows minus 1 times columns minus 1. In this example we've been working with, there are two rows, two columns. The degrees of freedom will be 1. 2 minus 1 times 2 minus 1. example, one of the actual examples, we'd like to determine the proportion of males who wear hats is the same as the proportion of females who wear hats. To test this, I sample 100 males, 100 females. You know, this is sounding familiar. Uh, 10 males, 16 females were wearing hats. Oh yeah, we have seen this, comparing two proportions. Um, let's also look at this in terms of a test of independence. Independence between gender and hat wearingness. So, Doing it the long way, here's the table of observed values. 16 females had a hat, 84 did not. 10 males had a hat, 90 did not. Row sums are 100 and 100. Column sums are 26 and 174. If the two are independent, 
then we would expect the proportions of females with hats and the proportion of males with hats to be close to each other and close to 26 over 200. Here's the table of expected values, again, in all the painful glory. N times R1 over N times C1 over N. N times R1 over N times C2 over N. R times, etc. So these are observed counts, and these would be expected counts. Doing the math, it actually comes out kind of nice. It took a lot of effort to get it to come out so nice. Um, so here's the test statistic value. Um, observed minus expected squared over expected. We observed 16. We expected 13. We observed 84. We expected 87. Observed 10. Observed 90. We had a chi-squared test statistic of 1.5915. Um, we need to compare this test statistic to the chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom. R is 2. C is 2. Here's how we'd actually calculate that. So the p-value is 1 minus, because it's greater than or equal to. 1.5915 degrees of freedom is 1. Gives us a p-value of 0.2071. After all this fun calculation, because remember, we also had to determine the expected values here. Or we can use R. If we add correct equals false, then we'll get the Hawks result. If we leave the correct equals false out, we'll get a better result. Um, the first step is to create the matrix of observed values. The matrix of observed values. Here's how we do that. We use the function matrix. The first thing we give the matrix function is the counts, and then we specify how many columns. Here, notice that the counts are going in by row. Let me go back. 16, 10, 84, 90. 16, 10, 84, 90. So this line will actually give you the observed matrix. Going back, this thing right here as a matrix. And then all we have to do is a chi-sc.test of that observed matrix. If we're doing it for Hawks, we do comma correct equals false. It's this first line that is the most difficult but it's just the matrix function, this, the, the values by row, and then you specify the number of columns. If we do the R, we leave off the correct equals false. Here's the output for R. Got a p-value of 0.2931, degrees of freedom of 1, the observed value of 1.1052. Because the p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We do not have evidence that the hat-wearing rate for males differs from the hat-wearing rate for females. Similarly, we could say we have no evidence that the gender ratio for hat-wearers differs from that for non-hat-wearers. Both are actually equivalent interpretations. Equ equivalent interpretations. If one is true, the other is true. Notice the difference between the two tests is minor when the sample size is large. What do we have? 100 or so, sample size pretty large. Um, so this is with the continuity correction. If we did it with correct equals false, we have it without. Example 3. I'd like to determine if females have a different grade distribution in my stat tuna courses than males. This is data from, I forget what, uh, I think my first three years here. Um, so gender, this is A's, B's, C's, D's, and F in the, in the class. Yes, 
it is fake data. Don't worry. Um, so of all my past students, 57 were females who got A's, 68 were males who got B's, 40 were females who got D's, and 22 were females who got F's. So I would like to determine if the grade distribution for females is, this, is different than that for males. In other words, what I want to determine is, is the grade distribution dependent on gender? Is the grade dis grades a categorical variable independent of gender? Categorical variable. There are a lot of ways of interpreting this, and they're all logically equivalent. So to do this, we just got to put get these numbers into a matrix, 57, 49, 78, 68, etc., and do a chi t test on it. It will automatically tell us that there are four degrees of freedom. How did I get four degrees of freedom? Two rows, five columns, r minus 1 times c minus 1 gives us 4. Putting the matrix in, specify the number of columns as 5. We did it by column. This is the Hox result because I specified correct equals false. p-value is 0.9851. Because the p-value is greater than our usual alpha of 0.05, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. There is no evidence that the grade distribution differs between females and males. Similarly, I could say, hey, I have this student. This student got a C. Well, guess what? I didn't give you any information about the student's gender. Because information about the grade is independent of information about the gender. So let's go to the intro lecture questions. This looks familiar. When is the research hypothesis the same as the alternative hypothesis? should have this by now. Question two, I want you to give an example where you would need to test independence of two categorical variables in your area of interest. Two categorical variables. And this is for our lecture today. You would be able to use a chi-squared test of independence for this example. Question three is, give an example where would you need to use tests for independence of two numeric variables in your area of interest. You do not know how to do this test yet. This is not from today. Today was just two categorical independence. In the future, we'll learn how to do two numeric independence. But I want you to start thinking about, OK, where would I need to test for independence of two numeric variables? So we learned how to test if two categorical variables are independent today. Future, we got ANOVA and linear regression. Um, KISC test uh, performs a chi-squared test of independence. M is a matrix. The SCA is number 41. There are no readings in R for starters. Hawks has section 10.7. And the usual, don't forget the all procedures, make sure you have a page for each of these, and that's it. Hello, and welcome to the analysis of variance. This is the most important part of chapter 11. Analysis of variance is used to test for independence of a categorical and a numeric variable. Um, that's one use of ANOVA. The usual use of ANOVA is testing for equality of population means amongst more than two groups. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to understand the theory behind testing the means of more than two populations and the independence between a numeric and a categorical variable. And again, better understand p-values and how to test hypotheses. So let's do a framing example here. I'd like to test if the average GPA of a student is the same for the four types of majors at Knox. MNS is Math and Natural Science, HSS is Humanities and Social Sciences, HUM is Humanities, 
because it's history and social sciences, and art is all the art stuff. So to do this, I asked 200 students at Knox College, 50 of each major type, and asked two questions. One, what is your major type? Two, what is your GPA? So note that we have one population, students at Knox College, and on every member of that population, I asked two questions. One, what is your major type? And two, what is your GPA? If we're looking at a relationship between the two, we're actually testing for independence between those two variables. The major type is categorical, and the GPA is numeric. So here's a box plot, side-by-side -side box plot of the data I collected. Each dot represents a student that I talked to. Green dots are MNS majors. Horizontally corresponds to the reported GPA. Uh, the dots are included as is or as are the box plots for each of the four major types. So there's actually a few equivalent ways of looking at this question. And as you've learned from your math courses throughout the years, the ability to look at a single question from multiple standpoints is always a strength. And that strength leads uh, leads us to be able to, in this case, uh, determine what the actual test should be. So one way is, do the means in each group significantly differ? In other words, um, is the mean for math and natural science, which is probably located somewhere around here, is that significantly different than the mean for history and social sciences, which is probably down here somewhere, and for humanities, which looks like it's here somewhere, and art, which looks like it's here somewhere. So the first way of looking at this is comparing the means of the individual groups. Second way of looking at this is, are the group and the GPA independent? These two questions are logically identical. Are the group and GPA independent? And the third way is, does including the group identifier improve our ability to estimate a person's GPA? And since we're looking at the mean, the expected value, what we're looking at is actually testing, okay, does the information of group improve our understanding of GPA? Thinking back to chapter four, that's equivalent to saying are group and GPA dependent or independent? Um, think back to the, uh, the uh, conditional probability definition of independence. And it's this last one that gives us some insight into the test statistic. Um, what improving predictions implies is that we reduce the uncertainty in those predictions. And reducing uncertainty means we reduce the variance in those predictions. And this is the idea be behind the analysis of variance procedure. First thing you do is measure the variance of the original data. To measure the variance that is left over after you include the model. And by model, I mean the group identifier. And then you look at the ratio between the two, from the explained to the unexplained. And it's this last ratio that's actually the test statistic. Now let's think about that for a second. If the explained variance the variance that's explained by the model or contained in the model or taken care of by the model is large compared to what's left over the unexplained variance, then the model is good because the remaining variance is small compared to what you started with. The model is explaining a lot of the uncertainty in the dependent variable. If, on the other hand, the explained variance is small, in other words, if the model doesn't explain much of that dependent variable, then the model is, is virtually worthless. And it's that ratio, which is an F ratio. Um, it's called an F ratio because the test statistic follows an F distribution. It's this F ratio that leads us to a p-value, which leads us to an interpretation of those results. So that was the theory. Let's go through the calculations by hand. Um, probably the only time. I think we got one more time when we do it by hand. But um, So with that background, let's calculate the test statistic and the p-value using the ANOVA table. And here's the blank ANOVA table. 
This is a this is what an ANOVA table looks like. There's three sources, the model, what's remaining after you apply the model, and then what's originally there. So model is the model that you apply, which is the uh, independent variable, the grouping variable. Error is what remains after applying the model, and then total is what you start with. SS is sum of squares. So this box will contain the sum of squares for the model. This box will be the sum of squares that remains. And this box will be the total sum of squares, or the original sum of squares. Note that this box plus this box will give you this box. This will be the degrees of freedom for the model, degrees of freedom for the error, and then the total degrees of freedom. And the total degrees of freedom will be just the usual, the total sample size minus 1. And again, know that this box and this box will add to this box. MS stands for mean squared. So this will be the mean squared error for the model. Sorry, this will be the mean squared for the model. This will be mean squared for the error. The mean squared is just the ratio of the sum of squares to the degrees of freedom. I mean, we saw that back in chapter 2 or chapter 3 when we were looking at the variance calculations. It was the sum of the squares divided by the degrees of freedom. We just didn't use term degrees of freedom back then. It was n minus 1. This f ratio is going to be this box divided by this box. And this p value will be a function of this f ratio according to the f distribution. So let's fill it in and you get to see all the calculations. The column marked SS contains the sum of squares for those three sources. The sum of squares is just the sum of the deviation between the observation and the mean. Notice the structure of all of these is the same. You're adding up over all the data values. That's what the double summation is. You're adding up within the group to the grand mean. So this is what's explained by the model. The, uh, the, the mean within the group uh, differenced with the grand mean, or the mean of all the data values. What's remaining is the variation within the group, the data value to the group mean. And this is the original. This is the data values to the group mean. Back in the day, this was x minus x bar squared. Add it up. Here we're just renaming x and x bar. So again, this is what's explained by the model. This is the group mean minus the grand mean. This is the what's left unexplained, the variance within each of the groups, the data value to that group mean. And this is what you started with. Because each of these calculations require 50 sums, differences, and squares, calculating by hand is not real realistic. So I'm just going to give you the answers for this data. Notice I didn't actually give you the data itself. Here's the sum of squares. Here's, what's, here's the error that's remaining. Here's the total. Notice the sum of squares for the model plus the sum of squares error is going to add up to the total. Um, the important th reason for that is that means that the SS model uh, or the, the sum of squares for the model and the sum of squares for the error are independent of each other. doesn't mean much for us in STAT 200, but it will be important in later SAT courses. The column mark DF contains the degrees of freedom for the three sources. They're the parameters that reflect the amount of information contributed by each source. It's probably the best definition of degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom total is just the total sample size minus 1. So it would be 200 minus 1 because I asked 200 people. DF model is the number of groups minus 1. There's four groups, four different major types, so DF model will be three. And then the way I calculate it is just DF total minus DF model. That'll give you DF error. Three and 199, and the DF error will be 196. The mean squared will be the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. 
Now this should look, should refresh our, or should look very similar to what we got back in chapter two with the variance, sample variance. It was one over n minus one times the sum of x minus x bar squared. Calculating the same thing here. This is an estimator of a variance, just like s squared was an estimator of a variance. So mean squared model is 2.6104, mean squared error is 0.4718. And this f statistic is going to be the mean squared model divided by the mean squared error. As you can, as you should guess by now, the distribution of the f statistic is f. That's the name of a distribution. Do you know what the name that distribution is named after? Fisher. John Fisher, one of the luminaries of early statistics in the 20th century. There's f. It's 5.533. Last box. We'll calculate the p-value. P-value is calculated in exactly the same way. It's the probability of, be, of the test statistic being this extreme or more so given the null hypothesis is true. If the null hypothesis is true, f will be zero. I mean, if the null hypothesis is perfectly true, this f ratio will be zero because there will be no, uh, this number will be zero. Um, this number will be zero. Remember the null hypothesis is there is no difference in the means or the null hypothesis is that the two variables are independent. Or the null hypothesis is the model explains none of the variation. If the model explains none of the variation, this is going to be zero, which means the mean squared is going to be zero, which means the F ratio will be zero over something, which is zero. So this is the probability of the distribution being greater than or equal to 5.53, which looks like this. Here's the F distribution for this particular problem. P-value is way out here. It's this area that's hard to see. It's 0 0.00115. How do we interpret the P-value? Absolutely correct, same as always, compare it to alpha. If the p-value is less than alpha, as in this case, we reject the null hypothesis. That means all of the following three things. The two variables are not independent. That is, GP, uh, that is GPA, and, um, GPA and major type. Those are not independent because p is too small. It means the average GPA in the four groups is not the same. And it means if you want to model the GPA, if you want to explain the GPA, then including the major type will help with that. Okay, let's look at the rice yields. I'll give you the data. So we can see how all the calculations are done. Uh, does rice variety influence the average yield amongst these four varieties? Here's the yield in each of the four plots for each of the four varieties. So we got 16 plots. Um, in each plot, we pr planted one of the four varieties of rice. So there's the raw data. Here's a graph. Sure seems like variety D is much higher than the rest. I don't know about variety A. But it certainly seems as though at least one of the four varieties has a different average. Here's the blank ANOVA table. Let's calculate this all together just so we can see, oh wow, we really don't want to do this by hand. So here are the formulas for SS model, SS error, and SS total from here. So here's SS model. We're adding up over all the data values. 
the average in the group minus the grand mean squared. What this actually translates to is this, because there's 12 data points, so we've got 12 terms. From the data, this is what we get. The grand mean is 991.9375, and the individual group means or variety means are those. Now we just plug and chug. This term becomes 984.50 minus 991.9375 squared plus etc. Substitution. Do a lot of calculations and we get 89,931. So the sum of squared for the model is 89,931. We can do the same thing with the error and total. We could just calculate the total, which is the variance of the data, and subtract off the model to get the error. Degrees of freedom. We've got 16 data points, so DF total will be 16 minus 1. We've got four groups, so DF model will be 4 minus 1. And then DF error will be 15 minus 3. Mean squared is just the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. That 2 should not be there. The F ratio is just the ratio of the mean squared of the model to the mean squared of the error. So this would be about 30 divided by 4 should be about 7.5. This is the F ratio, and it follows the F distribution. That's why it's called an F statistic. It follows the F distribution. And now this p-value is a probability of this distribution being greater than or equal to 7.212. There's 7.212. This shaded area is the p-value. 0 0.00503. Interpret the p-value in the usual way. Compare it to alpha. If the p-value is less than alpha, reject the null hypothesis. In this case, the null hypothesis is that the four means are equal, or that the yield variable and the variety variable are independent, or if we're trying to model the yield of wheat, was it wheat or corn? If we're trying to model the yield of whatever grain this is, including the, uh, including the variety will help. Those three are equivalent. The one you use depends on what you're trying to understand about rice. I guess it's rice instead of corn or wheat. Now we'll do it in R. Three lines to get the data in. It's the rice data set. Summary just to make sure that you loaded it in correctly and attach it. That's what the box plot looks like after putting it up a little. Here's the code for the fancy box plot. The box plot line is actually way down here. This will just get you a nice plain box plot. Here's the two lines of code to do all of the ANOVA calculations that you need to do. We'll call it rice mod. It's the model about rice. The function is AOV, analysis of variance. In parentheses, this is the dependent variable. That's the tilde to the left of the 1. And this is the independent variable. The dependent variable here is the numeric variable. And the independent variable is the grouping variable, or the categorical variable. This rice mod line doesn't do much of anything except everything inside. It's the summary that takes it from what's inside R to actually put it in a, a form that is meaningful for you. Notice it doesn't give the total stuff, but we can figure out degrees of freedom total is 
15. The sum of squares total is just the sum of those two. There are four varieties, so the degrees of freedom for variety is 4. There's the sum of squares. The mean squared is the sum of squares over the degrees of freedom. The f value is the ratio of the mean squared variety to the mean squared residuals, which is often called error instead of residuals. Here's our p-value. Notice we got two stars on it. Two stars is down here, so that p-value is between 0 0.001 and 0 0.01 which we knew because we got the p-value there. And that's it, just those two lines. Once you get the data in, just those two lines, interpret. Same conclusion. Um, Ronald Fisher introduced the ANOVA procedure in his 1925 book. And to illustrate ANOVA, he came up with this experiment. Um, collect a sample of pond water. Okay, so you take your five gallon bucket and dip it in the pond and you've got a sample of pond water. Now divide that water in that same bucket amongst four different beakers. Now separate the beakers to ensure that there's no cross-contamination and from each beaker take four samples and count and record the number of amoeba present. So you got this sample of pond water, dip four beakers in that same sample. So you would expect the amoeba concentration to be the same in those four beakers. And now from each beaker, take four small samples and count and record the number of amoeba. So you'd expect the averages in each of those four samples from each of the four beakers to be about the same. So we would expect the p-value of this experiment to be rather large. The data is available in the Fisher 38 data file. This loads it, attaches it. This does the analysis of variance, and the summary gives us these results. And we got a p-value that's rather large. Notice that when the f-value is small, the p-value is large. And when the f-value is large, the p-value is small. It's because the larger the f value, the more extreme your observations are if the null hypothesis is true. And the null hypothesis is either all the means are equal or the, the two variables, the numeric variable and the grouping variable, are independent or that grouping variable gives us no information about the numeric variable. There's that F distribution, there's the p-value in darker blue. It's not small. We didn't expect it to be small. There's the conclusion. And at this point we should be asking, do these results make sense for every single analysis? The results either make sense or we are learning something new or we did something wrong. So here's the summary slides, but I'm going to throw in the intro lecture questions here. So the first intro lecture question, does a large value of f correspond to a large p-value or to a small p-value? Does a large value of f correspond to a large p-value or a small p-value? And again, I would write the question in your notes on the left, answer below. Question two, what is the null hypothesis in ANOVA? Notice I've given you three options for this. Give me any of those three. And three, here's a given example where you would need to test for the independence of one numeric variable and one categorical variable. Any example will work. Any good example will work. So here's what we did in today's slide deck. We covered ANOVA. This procedure helps us determine three things. Um, if the mean of several groups are the same. 
if a numeric and a categorical variable are independent, and if knowing a group membership helps with estimation of the dependent variable. All three of those are logically and statistically equivalent. The way that you frame your results will depend on what the original research hypothesis and or research question are. If the researcher is asking about the means of several groups, then that's the one you're going to use to interpret your ANOVA. In the future, we're going to do linear regression. Um, same reminders as always, create that section of the notebook dedicated to the tests and the assumptions of that test. Take advantage of the SCAs and use the all procedures handout. Um, there are some functions that we are hinting at. The AOV function we did and the summary function we did. You've already seen the Shapiro test function. The Fligner test function is what we're going to use in the next set of slides. Notice that all we were able to conclude was the means are all the same or at least one mean is different. We weren't able to determine which mean was different. Next set of, uh, the next set of slides will cover that. We looked at, uh, we could also conclude that the two variables are independent or they are dependent. We weren't able to classify what type of dependence. Um, the next set of slides will help with that. Um, however, the Fligner test will need to be used to test one of the assumptions of ANOVA. But that will be for next time. And there are the, the readings, and that's the end, and I hope this was fun, or at least helpful.